Part 1. The Shadow Before They begin. The perfections are sharpened. The flower spreads its colored petals wide in the sun. But the tongue of the bee misses them. They sink back into the loam, crying out. You may call it a cry that creeps over them, a shiver as they wilt and disappear. William Carlos Williams, Patterson Born down in a dead man's town, Bruce Springsteen Chapter 1 After the Flood, 1957 1. The terror, which would not end for another 28 years, if it ever did end, began, so far as I know or can tell, with a boat made from a sheet of newspaper floating down a gutter swollen with rain. The boat barbed, listed, righted itself again, dived bravely through treacherous whirlpools and continued on its way down Witcham Street toward the traffic light, which marked the intersection of Witcham and Jackson. The three vertical lenses on all sides of the traffic light were dark this afternoon in the fall of 1957, and the houses were all dark, too. There'd been steady rain for a week now, and two days ago the winds had come as well. Most sections of Derry had lost their power then, and it was not back on yet. A small boy in a yellow slicker and red galoshes ran cheerfully along beside the newspaper boat. The rain had not stopped, but it was finally slackening. It tacked on the yellow hood of the boy's slicker, sounding to his ears like rain on a shed roof, a comfortable, almost cozy sound. The boy in the yellow slicker was George Denbro. He was six. His brother William, known to most of the kids at Derry Elementary School and even to the teachers who would never have used the nickname to his face, as Stuttering Bill, was at home hacking out the last of a nasty case of influenza in that autumn of 1957, eight months before the real horrors began and 28 years before the final showdown. Stuttering Bill was ten years old. Bill had made the boat beside which George ran now. He'd made it sitting up in bed, his back propped against a pile of pillows, while their mother played Fur Elisa on the piano in the parlor and rain swept restlessly against his bedroom window. About three quarters of the way down the block, as one headed toward the intersection and the dead traffic light, Witcham Street was blocked to motor traffic by smudge pots and four orange sawhorses. Stencils across each of the horses was Derry Department of Public Works. Beyond them, the rain had spilled out of gutters clawed with branches and rocks and big sticky piles of autumn leaves. The water had first pried finger holes in the paving and then snatched whole greedy handfuls, all of this by the third day of the rains. By noon of the fourth day, big chunks of the street's surface were boating through the intersection of Jackson and Witcham like miniature white water rafts. By that time, many people in Derry had begun to make nervous jokes about orcs. The Public Works Department had managed to keep Jackson Street open, but Witcham was impassable from the sawhorses all the way to the center of town. But everyone agreed the worst was over. The Kanduskeeg stream had crested just below its banks in the barrens, and bare inches below the concrete sides of the canal which channeled it tightly as it passed through downtown. Right now a gang of men, Zach Dambro, George's and Bill's father among them, were removing the sandbags they had thrown up the day before with such panicky haste. Yesterday overflow and expensive flood damage had seemed almost inevitable. God knew it had happened before. The flooding in 1931 had been a disaster, which had cost millions of dollars and almost two dozen lives. That was a long time ago, but there were still enough people around who remembered it to scare the rest. One of the flood victims had been found 25 miles east, in Bucksport. The fish had eaten this unfortunate gentleman's eyes, three of his fingers, his penis, and most of his left foot. Clutched in what remained of his hands had been a Ford steering wheel. Now, though, the river was receding, and when the new Bangor Hydro Dam went in upstream, the river would cease to be a threat. Or so said Zach Dembro, who worked for Bangor Hydroelectric. 
As for the rest, well, future floods could take care of themselves. The thing was to get through this one, to get the power back on, and then to forget it. In Derry, such forgetting of tragedy and disaster was almost an art, as Bill Denbro would come to discover in the course of time. George paused, just beyond the sawhorses at the edge of a deep ravine that had been cut through the tar surface of Witchen Street. This ravine ran on an almost exact diagonal. It ended on the far side of the street roughly forty feet farther down the hill from where he now stood, on the right. He laughed aloud, the sound of solitary, childish glee, a bright runner in that grey afternoon, as a vagary of the flowing water took his paper boat into a scale model rapids, which had been formed by the break in the tar. The urgent water had cut a channel which ran along the diagonal, and so his boat travelled from one side of Witcham Street to the other, the current carrying it so fast that George had to sprint to keep up with it. Water sprayed out from beneath his galoshes in muddy sheets. Their buckles made a jolly jingling as George Dambro ran toward his strange death. And the feeling which filled him at that moment was clear and simple love for his brother Bill. Love and a touch of regret that Bill couldn't be here to see this and be a part of it. Of course he would try to describe it to Bill when he got home. But he knew he wouldn't be able to make Bill see it, the way Bill would have been able to make him see it if their positions had been reversed. Bill was good at reading and writing, but even at his age, George was wise enough to know that wasn't the only reason why Bill got all A's on his report cards or why his teachers liked his compositions so well. Telling was only part of it. Bill was good at seeing. The boat nearly whistled along the diagonal channel, just a page torn from the classified section of the Derry News, but now George imagined it as a P.T. boat in a war movie, like the ones he sometimes saw down at the Derry Theater with Bill at Saturday matinees. A war picture with John Wayne fighting the Japs. The prow of the newspaper boat threw sprays of water to either side as it rushed along, and then it reached the gutter on the left side of Witcham Street. A fresh stream that rushed over the break in the tar at this point, creating a fairly large whirlpool, and it seemed to him that the boat must be swamped in cat size. It leaned alarmingly, and then George cheered as it righted itself, turned, and went racing on down toward the intersection. George sprinted to catch up. Over his head, a grim gust of October wind rattled the trees, now almost completely unburdened of their freight of colored leaves by the storm, which had been this year a reaper of the most ruthless sort. 2. Sitting up in bed, his cheeks still flushed with heat, but his fever, like the Kandusky, finally receding, Bill had finished the boat, but when George reached for it, Bill held it out of reach. Now get me the paraffin. What's that? Where is it? It's on the cellar sh sh shelf as you go downstairs, Bill said, in a box that says golf. Bring that to me, and a knife, and a bowl, and a pack of matches. George had gone obediently to get these things. He could hear his mother playing the piano, not Fur Elisa now, but something else he didn't like so well, something that sounded dry and fussy. He could hear rain flicking steadily against the kitchen windows. These were comfortable sounds, but the thought of the cellar was not a bit comfortable. He did not like the cellar, and he did not like going down the cellar stairs because he always imagined there was something down there in the dark. It was silly, of course, his father said so, and his mother said so, and, even more important, Bill said so. But, still, he did not even like opening the door to flick on the light, because he always had the idea, this is so exquisitely stupid he didn't dare tell anyone, that while he was feeling for the light switch, some horrible clawed paw would settle lightly over his wrist and then chuck him down into the darkness that smelled of dirt and wet and dim, rotted vegetables. Ah, oh, stupid. There were no things with claws, all hairy and full of killing spite. Every now and then someone went crazy and killed a lot of people, 
Sometimes Chet Huntley told about such things on the evening news, and of course, there were commies, but there was no weirdo monster living down in their cellar. Still, this idea lingered. In those interminable moments, while he was groping for the switch with his right hand, his left arm curled around the door jamb in a death grip. That cellar smell seemed to intensify until it filled the world. Smells of dirt and wet and long-gone vegetables would merge into one unmistakable, ineluctable smell, the smell of the monster, the apotheosis of all monsters. It was the smell of something for which he had no name, the smell of it, crouched and lurking and ready to spring, a creature which would eat anything, but which was especially hungry for boy meat. He had opened the door that morning and had groped interminably for the switch, holding the jam in his usual death grip, his eyes squinched shut, the tip of his tongue poked from the corner of his mouth like an agonized rootlet searching for water in a place of drought. Funny? Sure, you betcha. Look at you, Georgie. Georgie's scared of the dark. What a baby. The sound of the piano came from what his father called the living room and what his mother called the parlor. It sounded like music from another world, far away, the way talk and laughter on a summer-crowded beach must sound to an exhausted swimmer who struggles with the undertow. His fingers found the switch. Ha! Ah, they snapped it. And nothing. No light. Oh, cripes. The power. George snatched his arm back as if from a basket filled with snakes. He stepped back from the open cellar door, his heart hurrying in his chest. The power was out, of course. He'd forgotten the power was out. Cheesely crow. What now? Go back and tell Bill he couldn't get the box of paraffin because the power was out and he was afraid that something might get him as he stood on the cellar stairs, something that wasn't a kami or a mass murderer but a creature, much worse than either? That it would simply slither part of its rotted self up between the stair risers and grab his ankle? Oh, that would go over big, wouldn't it? Others might laugh at such a fancy, but Bill wouldn't laugh. Bill would be mad. Bill would say, Grow up, Georgie. Do you want this boat or not? As if this thought were his cue, Bill called from his bedroom. Did you die out there, Georgie? No, I'm getting it, Bill. George called back at once. He rubbed at his arms, trying to make the guilty goose flesh disappear and be smooth skin again. Did I just stopped to get a drink of water. Well, h- hurry up. So he walked down the four steps to the cellar shelf, his heart a warm, beating hammer in his throat, the hair on the nape of his neck standing at attention, his eyes hot, his hands cold, sure that at any moment the cellar door would swing shut on its own, closing off the white light falling through the kitchen windows, and then he would hear it. Something worse than all the commies and murderers in the world, worse than the Japs, worse than Attila the Hun, worse than the somethings in a hundred horror movies. It, growling deeply. He would hear the growl in those lunatic seconds before it pounced on him and unzipped his guts. The cellar smell was worse than ever today, because of the flood. Their house was high on Witcham Street near the crest of the hill, and they had escaped the worst of it, but there was still standing water down there that had seeped in through the old rock foundations. The smell was low and unpleasant, making you want to take only the shallowest breaths. George sifted through the junk on the shelf as fast as he could. Old cans of kiwi shoe polish and shoe polish rags, a broken kerosene lamp, two mostly empty bottles of Windex, an old flat can of turtle wax, For some reason this can struck him, and he spent nearly thirty seconds looking at the turtle on the lid with a kind of hypnotic wonder. Then he tossed it back, and here it was at last, a square box with the word golf on it. George snatched it and ran up the stairs as fast as he could, suddenly aware that his shirt tail was out and suddenly sure that his shirt tail would be his undoing. The thing in the cellar would allow him to get almost all the way out, and then it would grab the tail of his shirt and snatch him back, and he reached the kitchen and swept the door shut behind him. It banged 
gustily. He leaned back against it with his eyes closed. Sweat popped out on his arms and forehead. The box of paraffin gripped tightly in one hand. The piano had come to a stop, and his mom's voice floated to him. Georgie, can't you slam that door a little harder next time? And maybe you could break some of the plates in the Welsh dresser if you really tried. Sorry, Mom, he called back. Georgie, you waste, Bill said from his bedroom. He pitched his voice low so their mother would not hear. George snickered a little. His fear was already gone. It had slipped away from him as easily as a nightmare slips away from a man who awakes cold-skinned and gasping from its grip, who feels his body and stares at his surroundings to make sure that none of it ever happened, and who then begins at once to forget it. Half is gone by the time his feet hit the floor, three-quarters of it by the time he emerges from the shower and begins to towel off, all of it by the time he finishes his breakfast, all gone, until the next time when, in the grip of the nightmare, all fears will be remembered. That turtle, George thought, going to the counter drawer where the matches were kept. Where did I see a turtle like that before? But no answer came, and he dismissed the question. He had a pack of matches from the drawer, a knife from the rack, holding the sharp edge studiously away from his body as his dad had taught him, and a small bowl from the Welsh dresser in the dining room. And then he went back into Bill's room. Uff, well, what an a-hole you are, Georgie. Bill said amiably enough, and pushed back some of the sick stuff on his night table. An empty glass, a pitcher of water, Kleenex, books, a bottle of Vicks vapor rub, the smell of which Bill would associate all his life with thick, phlegmy chests and snotty noses. The old Philco radio was there, too, playing not Chopin or Bach, but a Little Richard tune, very softly, however, so softly that Little Richard was robbed of all his raw and elemental power. Their mother, who had studied classical piano at Juilliard, hated rock and roll. She did not merely dislike it, she abominated it. On the way, Hall, George said, sitting on the edge of Bill's bed and putting the things he had gathered on the night table. He, yes, you are, Bill said, nothing but a great big brown a-hole, that's you. George tried to imagine a kid who was nothing but a great big a-hole on legs and began to giggle. Your a-hole is bigger than Augusta, Bill said, beginning to giggle too. The your a-hole is bigger than the whole state, George replied. This broke both boys up for nearly two minutes. There followed a whispered conversation of the sort which means very little to anyone save small boys. Accusations of who was the biggest a-hole, who had the biggest a-hole, which a-hole was the brownest, and so on. Finally, Bill said one of the forbidden words. He accused George of being a big, brown, shitty a-hole. And they both got laughing hard. Bill's laughter turned into a coughing fit. As it finally began to taper off, by then Bill's face had gone a plummy shade which George regarded with some alarm. The piano stopped again. They both looked in the direction of the parlor, listening for the piano bench to scrape back, listening for their mother's impatient footsteps. Bill buried his mouth in the crook of his elbow, stifling the last of the coughs, pointing at the pitcher at the same time. George poured him a glass of water, which he drank off. The piano began once more, Fur Elisa again. Stuttering Bill never forgot that piece, and even many years later it never failed to bring goose flesh to his arms and back. His heart would drop and he would remember. My mother was playing that the day Georgie died, you gonna cough any more, Bill? Uh, no. Bill pulled a Kleenex from the box, made a rumbling sound in his chest, spat phlegm into the tissue, screwed it up and tossed it into the waste basket by his bed, which was filled with similar twists of tissue. Then he opened the box of paraffin and dropped a waxy cube of the stuff into his palm. George watched him closely, but without speaking or questioning. Bill didn't like George talking to him while he did stuff, but George had learned that if he just kept his mouth shut, Bill would usually explain what he was doing. Bill used the knife to cut off a small piece of the paraffin cube. 
He put the piece in the bowl, then struck a match and put it on top of the paraffin. The two boys watched the small yellow flame as the dying wind drove rain against the window in occasional spatters. Got to waterproof the boat or it'll just get wet and sink, Bill said. When he was with George, his stutter was light. Sometimes he didn't stutter at all. In school, however, it could become so bad that talking became impossible for him. Communication would cease, and Bill's schoolmates would look somewhere else while Bill clutched to the sides of his desk, his face growing almost as red as his hair, his eyes squeezed into slits as he tried to winch some word out of his stubborn throat. Sometimes, most times, the word would come. Other times it simply refused. He'd been hit by a car when he was three and knocked into the side of a building. He'd remained unconscious for seven hours. Mom said it was that accident which had caused the stutter. George sometimes got the feeling that his dad, and Bill himself, was not so sure. The piece of paraffin in the bowl was almost entirely melted. The match flame guttered lower, growing blue as it hugged the cardboard stick, and then it went out. Bill dipped his finger into the liquid, chucked it out with a faint hiss. He smiled apologetically at George. Hot, he said. After a few seconds he dipped his finger in again and began to smear the wax along the sides of the boat, where it quickly dried to a milky haze. Can I do some? George asked. Okay, just don't get any on the blankets or mom will kill you. George dipped his finger into the paraffin, which was now very warm but no longer hot, and began to spread it along the other side of the boat. They'll put on so much, you a-hole, Bill said. You want to sink it on its maiden cruise? I'm sorry. It's all right, just go easy. George finished the other side, then held the boat in his hands. It felt a little heavier, but not much. Too cool, he said. I'm going to go out and sail it. Yeah, you do that, Bill said. He suddenly looked tired, tired and still not very well. I wish you could come, George said. He really did. Bill sometimes got bossy after a while, but he always had the coolest ideas, and he hardly ever hit. It's your boat, really. She, Bill said. He called boats. She, she, she then. I wish I could c come too, Bill said glumly. Well, George shifted from one foot to the other, the boat in his hands. You put on your rain stuff, Bill said, or you'll wind up with the f f flu like me, probably catch it anyway from my germs. Thanks, Bill. It's a neat boat. And he did something he hadn't done for a long time, something Bill never forgot. He leaned over and kissed his brother's cheek. Hi, you'll catch it for sure now, you a-hole, Bill said. But he seemed cheered up all the same. He smiled at George. Put all the stuff back too, or Mum will have a bird. Sure. He gathered up the waterproofing equipment and crossed the room. The boat perched precariously on top of the paraffin box, which was sitting askew in the little bowl. G Georgie. George turned back to look at his brother. Be c c careful. Sure. His brow creased a little. That was something your mom said, not your big brother. It was as strange as him giving Bill a kiss. Sure I will. He went out. Bill never saw him again. Three. Now here he was, chasing his boat down the left side of Witcham Street. He was running fast, but the water was running faster and his boat was pulling ahead. He heard a deepening roar and saw that fifty yards farther down the hill the water in the gutter was cascading into a storm drain that was still open. It was a long, dark semicircle, cut into the curbing, and as George watched, a stripped branch, its bark as dark and glistening as seal skin, shot into the storm drain's moor. It hung up there for a moment and then slipped down inside. That was where his boat was headed. No oh, shit and shine, Olaf, he yelled, dismayed. He put on speed and for a moment he thought he would catch the boat. Then one of his feet slipped and he went sprawling, skinning one knee and crying out in pain. 
From his new pavement level perspective, he watched his boat swing around twice, momentarily caught in another whirlpool, and then disappear. Shit and shinola, he yelled again and slammed his fist down on the pavement. That hurt too, and he began to cry a little. What a stupid way to lose the boat. He got up and walked over to the storm drain. He dropped to his knees and peered in. The water made a dank, hollow sound as it fell into the darkness. It was a spooky sound. It reminded him of... Oh! Huh. The sound was jerked out of him as if on a string, and he recoiled. There were yellow eyes in there. The sort of eyes he'd always imagined but never actually seen down in the basement. Hey, it's an animal, he thought incoherently. That's all it is. Some animal, maybe a house cat that got stuck down in there. Still, he was ready to run, would run in a second or two, when his metal switchboard had dealt with the shock those two shiny yellow eyes had given him. He felt the rough surface of the macadam under his fingers, and the thin sheet of cold water flowing around them. He saw himself getting up and backing away, and that was when a voice, a perfectly reasonable and rather pleasant voice, spoke to him from inside the storm drain. Hi, Georgie, it said. George blinked and looked again. He could barely credit what he saw. It was like something from a made-up story or a movie, where you know the animals will talk and dance. If he had been ten years older, he would not have believed what he was seeing, but he was not sixteen. He was six. There was a clown in the storm drain. The light in there was far from good, but it was good enough so that George Dembro was sure of what he was seeing. It was a clown, like in the circus or on TV. In fact, he looked like a cross between Bozo and Clarabelle, who talked by honking his, or was it her, George was never really sure of the gender, horn on Howdy Doody Saturday mornings. Buffalo Bob was just about the only one who could understand Clarabelle, and that always cracked George up. The face of the clown in the storm drain was white. There were funny tufts of red hair on either side of his bald head, and there was a big clown smile painted over his mouth. If George had been inhabiting a later year, he would have surely thought of Ronald McDonald before Bozo or Clarabelle. The clown held a bunch of balloons, all colors, like gorgeous ripe fruit in one hand. In the other, he held George's newspaper boat. Want your boat, Georgie? The clown smiled. George smiled back. He couldn't help it. It was the kind of smile you just had to answer. I sure do, he said. The clown laughed. Ha <laughs> ha, he sure do. That's good. That's very good. Ah, and how about a balloon? Well, sure. He reached forward and then drew his hand reluctantly back. I'm not supposed to take stuff from strangers, my dad said so. Very wise of you, dad, the clown in the storm drain said, smiling. How, George wondered, could I have thought his eyes were yellow? If they were a bright dancing blue, the color of his mom's eyes and Bill's. Very wise indeed. Therefore, I will introduce myself. I, Georgie, am Mr. Bob Gray, also known as... Pennywise, the dancing clown. Pennywise, meet George Denbro. George, meet Pennywise. And now we know each other. I'm not a stranger to you, and you're not a stranger to me. Key, you wrecked. <laughs> George giggled. Ha, I guess so. He reached forward again and drew his hand back again. How did you get down there? Storm just blew me away, Pennywise, the dancing clown said. It blew the whole circus away. Can you smell the circus, Georgie? George leaned forward. Suddenly, he could smell peanuts. Hot roasted peanuts. And vinegar. The white kind you put on your french fries through a hole in the cap. He could smell cotton candy and frying doughboys and the faint but thunderous odor of wild animal shit. He could smell the cheery aroma of midway sawdust. And yet... And yet, under it all, was the smell of flood and decomposing leaves and dark storm-drained shadows. That smell was wet and rotten. 
the cellar smell. But the other smells were stronger. You bet I can smell it, he said. A watch your boat, Georgie? Pennywise asked. I only repeat myself because you really do not seem that eager. He held it up, smiling. He was wearing a baggy silk suit with great big orange buttons, a bright tie, electric blue, flopped down his front, and on his hands were big white gloves like the kind Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck always wore. He, yes, sure, George said, looking into the storm drain. And a balloon? I've got red and green and yellow and blue. Do they float? Float? The clown's grin widened. Oh, yes, indeed they do. They float. And there's cotton candy. George reached. The clown seized his arm, and George saw the clown's face change. What he saw then was terrible enough to make his worst imaginings of the thing in the cellar look like sweet dreams. What he saw destroyed his sanity in one clawing stroke. They... Flow the thing in the drain crooned in a clotted, chuckling voice. It held George's arm in its thick and wormy grip. It pulled George toward that terrible darkness, where the water rushed and roared and bellowed as it bore its cargo of storm debris toward the sea. George craned his neck away from that final blackness and began to scream into the rain to scream mindlessly into the white autumn sky which curved above Derry on that day in the fall of 1957. His screams were shrill and piercing, and all up and down Witcham Street people came to their windows or bolted out onto their porches. They float, it growled. They float, Georgie, and when you are down here with me, you'll float, true or... George's shoulder socked against the cement of the curb, and Dave Gardner, who had stayed home from his job at the shoeboat that day because of the flood, saw only a small boy in a yellow rain slicker, a small boy who was screaming and writhing in the gutter with muddy water surfing over his face and making his screams sound bodily. Everything down here <laughs> floats. <laughs> the chuckling rotten voice whispered, and suddenly there was a ripping noise and a flaring sheet of agony, and George Denbro knew no more. Dave Gardner was the first to get there, and although he arrived only forty-five seconds after the first scream, George Denbro was already dead. Gardner grabbed him by the back of the slicker, pulled him into the street, and began to scream himself as George's body turned over in his hands. The left side of George's slicker was now bright red. Blood flowed into the storm drain from the tattered hole where the left arm had been. A knob of bone, horribly bright, peeked through the torn cloth. The boy's eyes stared up into the white sky, and as Dave staggered away toward the others already running pell-mell down the street, they began to fill up with rain, Four. Somewhere below, in the storm drain that was already filled nearly to capacity with runoff, there could have been no one down there, the county sheriff would later exclaim to a Derry news reporter, with a frustrated fury so great it was almost agony. Hercules himself would have been swept away in that driving current. George's newspaper boat shot onward through nighted chambers and long concrete hallways, that roared and chimed with water. For a while it ran neck and neck with a dead chicken that floated with its yellowy reptilian toes pointed at the dripping ceiling. Then at some junction east of town the chicken was swept off to the left, while George's boat went straight. An hour later, while George's mother was being sedated in the emergency room at Derry Home Hospital, and while stuttering Bill sat stunned and white and silent in his bed, listening to his father sob hoarsely in the parlor, where his mother had been playing Fur Elisa when George went out. The boat shot out through a concrete loophole, like a bullet exiting the muzzle of a gun, and ran its speed down a sluiceway and into an unnamed stream. 
when it joined the boiling, swollen Penobscot River twenty minutes later. The first rifts of blue had begun to show in the sky overhead. The storm was over. The boat dipped and swayed and sometimes took on water, but it did not sink. The two brothers had waterproofed it well. I do not know where it finally fetched up, if ever it did. Perhaps it reached the sea and sails there forever, like a magic boat in a fairy tale. All I know is that it was still afloat and still running on the breast of the flood when it passed the incorporated town limits of Derry, Maine, and there it passes out of this tale forever. Chapter 2 After the Festival 1984 1. The reason Adrian was wearing the hat his sobbing boyfriend would later tell the police was because he had won it at the Pitch Till You Win stall on the Bassey Park fairgrounds just six days before his death. He was proud of it. He was wearing it because he loved this shitty little town, the boyfriend Don Haggerty screamed at the cops. Now, now. There's no need for that sort of language, Officer Harold Gardner told Haggerty. Harold Gardner was one of Dave Gardner's four sons. On the day his father had discovered the lifeless, one-armed body of George Dembro, Harold Gardner had been five. On this day, almost twenty-seven years later, he was thirty-two and balding. Harold Gardner recognized the reality of Don Haggerty's grief and pain, and at the same time found it impossible to take seriously this man, if you want to call him a man was wearing lipstick and satin pants so tight you could almost read the wrinkles in his cock. Grief or no grief, pain or no pain, he was, after all, just a queer. Like his friend, the late Adrian Mellon. Let's go through it again, Harold's partner Jeffrey Reeves said. The two of you came out of the falcon and turned toward the canal. Then what? How many times do I have to tell you idiots? Haggerty was still screaming. They killed him! They'd pushed him over the side. Just another day in Macho City for them. Don Haggerty began to cry. One more time, Reeves repeated patiently. You came out of the falcon, then what? Two. In an interrogation room just down the hall, two Derry Cuffs were speaking with Steve Dubay, 17. In the clerk of probate's office upstairs, two more were questioning John Webby Garden, 18. And in the chief of police's office on the fifth floor, Chief Andrew Rodemacher and Assistant District Attorney Tom Butilia were questioning 15-year-old Christopher Unwin. Unwin, who wore faded jeans, a grease-smeared T-shirt and blocky engineer boots, was weeping. Rodemacher and Batillier had taken him because they had quite accurately assessed him as the weak link in the chain. Let's go through it again, Butillier said in this office just as Geoffrey Reeves was saying the same thing two floors down. We didn't mean to kill him, Unwin blubbered. It was the hat. We couldn't believe he was still wearing the hat after, you know, after what Webby said the first time. And I guess we wanted to scare him. For what he said, Chief Rodemacher interjected, yes. To John Garton on the afternoon of the 17th, yes. To Webby. Unwin burst into fresh tears. But we tried to save him when he saw he was in trouble. At least me and Steve Dubay did. We, we didn't mean to kill him. Come on, Chris, don't shit us, Butilia said. You threw the little queer into the canal. Yes, but... And the three of you came in to make a clean breast of things. Chief Rodemacher and I appreciate that, don't we, Andy? Well, you bet. Takes a man to own up to what he did, Chris. So don't fuck yourself up by lying now. You meant to throw him over the minute you saw him and his fag body coming out of the falcon, didn't you? No! Chris Unwin protested vehemently. Batillier took a pack of Marlboros from his shirt pocket and stuck one in his mouth. He offered the pack to Unwin. Cigarette? Unwin took one. Batillier had to chase the tit with a match in order to give him a light because of the way Unwin's mouth was trembling. But when you saw he was wearing the hat, Rademacher asked. Unwin dragged deep, 
lowered his head so that his greasy hair fell in his eyes and jetted smoke from his nose, which was littered with blackheads. Yeah, he said, almost too softly to be heard. Butilier leaned forward, brown eyes gleaming. His face was predatory, but his voice was gentle. What, Chris? Ah, I said yes. I guess so, to throw him in, but not to kill him. He looked up at them, face frantic and miserable and still unable to comprehend the stupendous changes which had taken place in his life since he left the house to take in the last night of Derry's Canal Days Festival with two of his buddies at 7.30 the previous evening. Not to kill him, he repeated. And that guy under the bridge, I, I still don't know who he was. What guy was that? Rademacher asked, but without much interest. They had heard this part before as well, and neither of them believed it. Sooner or later men accused of murder almost always drag out that mysterious other guy. But Tillier even had a name for it. He called it the one-armed man syndrome after that old TV series The Fugitive. The guy in the clown suit, Chris Unwin said, and shivered. The guy with the balloons. 3. The Canal Days Festival, which ran from July 15th to July 21st, had been a rousing success, most Derry residents agreed, a great thing for the city's morale, image, and pocketbook. The week-long festival was pegged to mark the centenary of the opening of the canal, which ran through the middle of downtown. It had been the canal which had fully opened Derry to the lumber trade in the years 1884 to 1910. It had been the canal which had birthed Derry's boom years. The town was spruced up from east to west and north to south. Potholes which some residents swore hadn't been patched for ten years or more were neatly filled with hot top and rolled smooth. The town buildings were refurbished on the inside, repainted on the outside. The worst of the graffiti in Bassey Park, much of it coolly logical anti-gay statements such as kill all queers and aids from guard you hell-bound homos, was sanded off the benches and wooden walls of the little covered walkway over the canal known as the Kissing Bridge. A Canal Days museum was installed in three empty storefronts downtown and filled with exhibits by Michael Hanlon a local librarian and amateur historian. The town's oldest families loaned freely of their almost priceless treasures, and during the week of the festival nearly 40,000 visitors paid a quarter each to look at eating house menus from the 1890s, lagers bits, axes, and peavies from the 1880s, children's toys from the 1920s, and over 2,000 photographs and nine reels of movie film of life as it had been in Derry over the last hundred years. The museum was sponsored by the Derry Ladies Society, which vetoed some of Hamlin's proposed exhibits, such as the notorious tramp chair from the 1930s, and photographs, such as those of the Bradley gang after the notorious shootout. But all agreed it was a great success, and no one really wanted to see those gory old things anyway. It was so much better to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative, as the old song said. There was a huge striped refreshment tent in Derry Park and band concerts there every night. In Bassey Park, there was a carnival with rides by Smokey's Greater Shows and games run by local town folk. A special tram car circled the historic sections of the town every hour on the hour and ended up at this gaudy and amiable money machine. It was here that Adrian Mellon won the hat, which would get him killed the paper top hat with the flower in the band which said, I heart Derry. 4. I'm tired, John Webby Cotton said. Like his two friends, he was dressed in unconscious imitation of Bruce Springsteen, although if asked, he would probably call Springsteen a wimp or a fagola. Then would instead profess admiration for such bitchin' heavy metal boots as Def Leppard, Twisted Sister or Judas Priest. The sleeves of his plain blue T-shirt were torn off, showing his heavily muscled arms. His thick brown hair fell over one eye. This touch was more John Cougar Mellencamp than Springsteen. There were blue tattoos on his arms, arcane symbols which looked as if they had been drawn by a child. Gonna want to talk no more. Just tell us about Tuesday afternoon at the fair, Paul Hughes said. 
Hughes was tired and shocked and dismayed by this whole sordid business. He thought again and again that it was as if Derry Canal days ended with one final event which everyone had somehow known about but which no one had quite dared to put down on the daily program of events. If they had, it would have looked like this. Saturday, 9 o'clock p.m., final band concert featuring the Derry High School Band and the Barbershop Mellow Men. Saturday, 10 o'clock p.m., Giant fireworks show. Saturday, 10.35 p.m. Ritual sacrifice of Adrian Mellon officially ends canal days. Oh, fuck the fair, Webby replied. Uh, just what you said to Mellon and what he said to you. Ah, oh, Christ. Webby rolled his eyes. Come on, Webby, Hughes's partner said. Webby Garton rolled his eyes and began again. Five. Garton saw the two of them, Mellon and Haggerty, mincing along with their arms about each other's waists and giggling like a couple of girls. At first he actually thought they were a couple of girls. Then he recognized Mellon, who had been pointed out to him before. As he looked, he saw Mellon turn to Haggerty, and they kissed briefly. Oh, man, I'm gonna borf, Webby cried, disgusted. Chris Unwin and Steve Dubay were with him. When Webby pointed out Mellon, Steve DeBay said he thought the other fag was named Don somebody, and that he'd picked up a kid from Derry High hitching, and then tried to put a few moves on him. Mellon and Haggerty began to move toward the three boys again, walking away from the pitch till you win and toward the Carney's exit. Webby Garton would later tell officers Hughes and Conley that his civic pride had been wounded by seeing a fucking faggot wearing a hat which said, I heart Derry. It was a silly thing that had a paper imitation of a top hat, with a great big flower sticking up from the top and nodding about in every direction. The silliness of the hat apparently wounded Webby's civic pride even more. As Mellon and Haggerty passed, each with his arm linked about the other's waist, Webby got and yelled out, I had to make you eat that hat, you fucking ass bandit. Mellon turned toward Garton, fluttering his eyes flirtatiously and said, if you want something to eat, hun, I could find something much tastier than my hat. At this point, Webby Garton decided he was going to rearrange the faggot's face. In the geography of Mellon's face, mountains would rise and continents would drift. Nobody suggested he sucked the root. Nobody. He started toward Mellon. Mellon's friend Haggerty, alarmed, attempted to pull Mellon away, but Mellon stood his ground, smiling. Cotton would later tell officers Hughes and Conley that he was pretty sure Mellon was high on something. So he was, Haggerty would agree, when this idea was passed on to him by officers Gardner and Reeves. He was high on two fried doughboys smeared with honey, on the carnival, on the whole day. He had been consequently unable to recognize the real menace which Webby Garton represented. But that was Adrian, Don said, using a tissue to wipe his eyes and smearing the spangled eye shadow he was wearing. He didn't have much in the way of protective coloration. He was one of those fools who think things really are going to turn out all right. He might have been badly hurt there and then if Garton hadn't felt something tack his elbow. It was a nightstick. He turned his head to see Officer Frank Machen, another member of Derry's Finest. Never mind, little buddy. Machen told Garton, mind your business and leave those little gay boyos alone. Have some fun. Did you hear what he called me? Garton asked hotly. He was now joined by Unwin and DeBay. The two of them, smelling trouble, tried to urge Garton on up the midway, but Garton shrugged them away, would have turned on them with his fists if they had persisted. His masculinity had borne an insult which he felt must be avenged. Nobody suggested he sucked the root. Nobody. I don't believe he called you anything, Machen replied. And you spoke to him first, I believe. Now move on, Sonny. And I want to have to tell you again. He called me a queer. Nor you word you might be, then? Machen asked, seeming to be honestly interested, and Garton flushed a deep, ugly red. During this exchange, Haggerty was trying with increasing desperation to pull Adrian Mellon away from the scene. Now at last, Mellon was going. Ta-ta, love, Adrian called cheekily over his shoulder. 
Shut up, candy ass, Machen said. Get out of here. Cotton made a lunge at Melon, and Machen grabbed him. I could run you in, my friend, Machen said. And the way you're acting, it might not be such a bad idea. Next time I see you, I'm gonna hurt chill. Cotton bellowed after the departing pair, and heads turned to stare at him. And if you wear a night hat, I'm gonna kill you. This town don't need no faggots like you. Without turning, Melon waggled the fingers of his left hand. The nails were painted cerise, and put an extra little wiggle in his walk. Garten lunged again. One more word, or one more move, and in you go. Machen said mildly, trust me, my boy, for I mean exactly what I say. Come on, Webby, Chris Unwin said uneasily. Mel out. You like guys like that? Webby asked Machen, ignoring Chris and Steve completely. Huh? About the bum punches on neutral, Machen said. What I'm really in favor of is peace and quiet, and you are upsetting what I like, pizza face. Now do you want to go around with me or what? Come on, Webby, Steve DeBay said quietly. Let's go get some hot dogs. Webby went, straightening his shirt with exaggerated moves and brushing the hair out of his eyes. Machen, who also gave a statement on the morning following Adrian Mellon's death, said, The last thing I heard him say as him and his buddies walked off was, Next time I see him, he's gonna be in serious hurt. 6. Please, I gotta talk to my mother, Steve DeBay said for the third time. I gotta get her to mellow out my stepfather or there's gonna be one hell of a punching match when I get home. In a little while, Officer Charles Averino told him. Both Averino and his partner Bonnie Morrison knew that Steve DeBay would not be going home tonight, maybe not for many nights to come. The boy did not seem to realize just how heavy this particular bust was, and Averino would not be surprised when he learned later on that DeBay had left school at age 16. At that time, he'd still been in Water Street Junior High. His IQ was 68, according to the Wexler he had taken during one of his three trips through the seventh grade. Tell us what happened when you saw Mellon coming out of the Falcon, Morrison invited. No, Matt, I better not. Well, why not, Averino asked. I already talked too much, maybe. He came in to talk, Averino said. Isn't that right? Well, yeah, but listen, Morrison said warmly, sitting down next to DeBay and shooting him a cigarette. You think me and Chick here like fags? I don't know. Do we look like we like fags? No, but we're your friends, Steve-o, Morrison said solemnly. And believe me, you and Chris and Webby need all the friends you can get just about now because tomorrow every bleeding heart in this town is going to be screaming for you guys' blood. Steve DeBay looked dimly alarmed. Averino, who could almost read this hairbag's pussy little mind, suspected he was thinking about his stepfather again. And although Averino had no liking for Derry's small gay community, like every other cop on the force he would enjoy seeing the Falcons shut up forever, he would have been delighted to drive DeBay home himself. He would, in fact, have been delighted to hold DeBay's arms while DeBay's stepfather beat the creep to oatmeal. Averino did not like gays, but this did not mean he believed they should be tortured and murdered. Mellon had been savaged. When they brought him up from under the canal bridge, his eyes had been open, bulging with terror. And this guy here had absolutely no idea what he had helped do. We didn't mean to hurt him, Steve repeated. This was his fallback position when he became even slightly confused. That's why you want to get out front with us, Averino said earnestly. Get the true facts of the matter out in front, and this may be one amount to a piss hole in the snow, isn't that right, Barney? As rain, Morrison agreed. One more time, what do you say? Averino coaxed. Well, Steve said and then slowly began to talk. 7. When the Falcon was opened in 1973, Elmer Curti thought his clientele would consist mostly of bus riders. The terminal next door serviced three different lines, Trailways, Greyhound, and Aristook County. What he failed to realize was how many of the passengers who ride buses are women or families with small children in tow. 
Many of the others kept their bottles in brown bags and never got off the bus at all. Those who did were usually soldiers or sailors who wanted no more than a quick beer or two. You couldn't very well go on a bender during a ten-minute rest stop. Cody had begun to realize some of these home truths by 1977, but by then it was too late. He was up to his tits and bells, and there was no way that he could see out of the red ink. The idea of burning the place down for the insurance occurred to him, but unless he hired a professional to torch it, he supposed he would be caught, and he had no idea where professional arsonists hung out anywhere. He decided in February of that year that he would give it until July 4th. If things did look as if they were turning round by then, he would simply walk next door, get on a hound, and see how things looked down in Florida. But in the next five months, an amazing, quiet sort of prosperity came to the boy, which was painted black and gold inside, and decorated with stuffed birds. Elmer Curdy's brother had been an amateur taxidermist, who specialized in birds, and Elmer had inherited the stuff when he died. Suddenly... Instead of drawing sixty beers and pouring maybe twenty-eight drinks a night, Elmer was drawing eighty beers and pouring a hundred drinks, a hundred and twenty, sometimes a hundred and sixty. His clientele was young, polite, almost exclusively male. Many of them dressed outrageously. But those were years when outrageous dress was still almost the norm. And Elmer Curdy did not realize that his patrons were just about almost exclusively gay until 1981 or so. If Derry residents had heard him say this, he would have laughed and said that Elmer Curdy must think they had all been born yesterday. But his claim was perfectly true. Like the man with the cheating wife, he was practically the last to know. And by the time he did, he didn't care. The bar was making money. And while there were four other bars in Derry which turned to profit, the Falcon was the only one where rambunctious patrons did not regularly demolish the whole place. There were no women to fight over, for one thing, and these men, fags or not, seemed to have learned a secret of getting along with each other which their heterosexual counterparts did not know. Once he became aware of the sexual preference of his regulars, he seemed to hear lurid stories about the falcon everywhere. These stories had been circulating for years, but until 81, Curdy simply hadn't heard them. The most enthusiastic tellers of these tales, he came to realize, were men who wouldn't be dragged into the falcon with a chain fall for fear all the muscles would go out of their wrists or something. Yet they seemed privy to all sorts of information. According to the stories, you can go in there any night and see men close dancing, rubbing their cocks together right out on the dance floor, men French kissing at the boar, men getting blowjobs in the bathrooms, there was supposedly a room out back where you went if you wanted to spend a little time on the Tower of Power. There was a big old fellow in a Nazi uniform back there who kept his arm greased most of the way to the shoulder and who would be happy to take care of you. In fact, none of these things were true. When folks with a thirst did come in from the bus station for a beer or a highball, they sensed nothing out of the ordinary in the Falcon at all. There were a lot of guys, sure, but that was no different than thousands of working men's bars all across the country. The clientele was gay, but gay was not a synonym for stupid. If they wanted a little outrageousness, they went to Portland. If they wanted a lot of outrageousness, Ramrod-style outrageousness, or Peck's Big Boy-style outrageousness. They went down to New York or Boston. Derry was small, Derry was provincial, and Derry's small gay community understood the shadow under which it existed quite well. Don Haggerty had been coming into the Falcon for two or three years on the night in March of 1984, when he first showed up with Adrian Mellon. Before then, Haggerty had been the sort who plays the field, rarely showing up with the same escort half a dozen times. But by late April, it had become obvious even to Elmer Curty, who cared very little about such things, that Haggerty and Mellon had a steady thing going. Haggerty was a draftsman with an engineering firm in Bangor, Adrian Mellon was a freelance writer who published anywhere and everywhere he could. Airline magazines, confession magazines, regional magazines, Sunday supplements, sex letter magazines. He'd been working on a novel, but maybe that wasn't serious. He'd been working on it since his third year of college, and that had been twelve years ago. He'd come to Derry to write a piece about the canal. He was on assignment from New England Byways, a glossy bi-monthly that was published in Concord. 
Adrian Mellon had taken the assignment because he could squeeze byways for three weeks' worth of expense money, including a nice room at the Derry Town House, and gather all the material he needed for the piece in maybe five days. During the other two weeks, he could gather enough material for maybe four other regional pieces. But during that three-week period, he met Don Haggerty, and instead of going back to Portland, when his three weeks on the cuff were over, he found himself a small apartment on Carseth Lane. He lived there for only six weeks. Then he moved in with Don Haggerty. 8. That summer, Haggerty told Harold Gardner and Jeff Reeves, was the happiest summer of his life. He should have been on the lookout, he said. He should have known that God only puts a rug under guys like him in order to jerk it out from under their feet. The only shadow, he said, was Adrian's extravagantly partisan reaction to Derry. He had a T-shirt which said, Maine ain't bad, but Derry's great. He had a Derry Tigers high school jacket, and of course there was the hat. He claimed to find the atmosphere of vital and creatively invigorating. Perhaps there was something to this. He'd taken his languishing novel out of the trunk for the first time in nearly a year. Was he really working on it then? Gardner asked Haggerty, not really caring but wanting to keep Haggerty primed. She asked he was busting pages. He said it might be a terrible novel, but it was no longer going to be a terrible unfinished novel. He expected to finish it by his birthday in October. Of course, he didn't know what Derry was really like. He thought he did, but he hadn't been here long enough to get a whiff of the real Derry. I kept trying to tell him, but he wouldn't listen. Uh, what's Derry really like, Don? Reeves asked. It's a lot like a dead strumpet with maggots squirming out of her coos, Don Haggerty said. The two cops stared in silent amazement. It's a bad place, Haggerty said. It's a sewer. You mean you two guys don't know that? You two guys have lived here all of your lives, and you don't know that? Neither of them answered. After a little while, Haggerty went on. Nine. Until Adrian Mellon entered his life, Don had been planning to leave Derry. He'd been there for three years, mostly because he had agreed to a long-term lease on an apartment with the world's most fantastic river view. But now the lease was almost up and Don was glad. No more long commute back and forth to Bangor. No more weird vibes. In Derry, he once told Adrian, and always felt like thirteen o'clock. Adrian might think Derry was a great place, but it scared Don. It was not just the town's tightly homophobic attitude, an attitude as clearly expressed by the town's preachers as by the graffiti in Bassey Park. But that was one thing he had been able to put his finger on. Adrian had laughed. Tahan, every town in America has a contingent that hates the gay folk, he said. Don't tell me you don't know that. This is, after all, the era of Ronnie Moron and Phyllis Housefly. Come down to Bassey Park with me, Don had replied, after seeing that Adrian really meant what he was saying. And what he was really saying was that Derry was no worse than any other fair-sized town in the hinterlands. I want to show you something, my love. They drove to Bassey Park. This had been in mid-June, about a month before Adrian's murder, Haggerty told the cops. He took Adrian into the dark, vaguely unpleasant-smelling shadows of the kissing bridge. He pointed out one of the graffiti. Adrian had to strike a match and hold it below the writing in order to read it. Show me your cock queer and I'll cut it off you. I know how people feel about gays, Don said quietly. I got beaten up at a truck stop in Dayton when I was a teenager. Some fellas in Portland set my shoes on fire outside of a sandwich shop, while this fat-assed old cop sat inside his cruiser and laughed. I've seen a lot, but I've never seen anything quite like this. Look over here. Check it out. Another match revealed. Stick nails in eyes of all faggots. For God. Whoever writes these little homilies has got a case of the deep-down crazies, 
I'd feel better if I thought it was just one person, one isolated sickie, but... Don swept his arm vaguely down the length of the kissing bridge. There's a lot of this stuff. And I just don't think one person did it all. That's why I want to leave Derry 8. Too many places and too many people seem to have the deep down crazies. Well, wait until I finish my novel, okay? Please, October. I promise, no later. The air's better here. He didn't know it was the water he was going to have to watch out for. Don Howdy said bitterly. 10. Tom Batillier and Chief Rademacher leaned forward, neither of them speaking. Chris Unwin sat with his head down, talking monotonously to the floor. This was the part they wanted to hear. This was the part that was going to send at least two of these assholes to Thomaston. The fair wasn't no good, Unwin said. They was already taken down all the bitchin' rides, you know, like the devil dish in the parachute shop. They already had a sign and the bumper cars that said closed wasn't nothing open but baby rides. So we went down by the games and Webby saw the pitch till you win and he paid 50 cents and he seen that hat the queer was wearing and he pitched it that, but he kept missing it. Every time he missed, he got more in a bad boot, you know, and Steve, he's the guy who usually goes around saying mellow out, like mellow out this and mellow out that and why don't you fucking mellow out, you know? Only he was in a real piss-up-a-rope mood because he te took this pill, you know? I don't know what kind of a pill, a red pill, maybe it was even legal. But he keeps after Webby until I thought Webby was going to hit him, you know? He goes, you can't even win that queer's hat. You must be really wasted if you can't even win that queer's hat. So finally the lady gives him a prize, even though the ring wasn't over it. So I think she wanted to get rid of us, I don't know. Maybe she didn't, but I, I think she did. It was this noisemaker thing, you know? You blow it and it puffs up and unrolls and makes a noise like a fart, you know? I used to have one of those. I got for Halloween and New Year's or some fucking holiday. and uh, That was pretty good, only I lost it. Or maybe somebody hawked it out of my pocket in the fucking play yard at school, you know? So then the fair's closing and we're walking out and Steve's still on Webby about not being able to win that queer's hat, you know? And... Webby ain't saying much, and I know that's a bad sign, but I was pretty faced, you know. So, I knew I ought to, like, change the subject, only I couldn't think enough subject, you know. So, when we get into the park a lot, Steve says, we want to go home, and Woodby goes, let's cruise by the Falcon first, see if that queer's around. But Tillier and Rodemacher exchanged a glance. But Tillier raised a single finger and tapped it against his cheek. Although this doofus in the engineer boots didn't know it, he was not talking about first-degree murder. So I goes, no, I gotta get home, and Webby goes, you scared to go by that queer bar? I go, fuck no, and Steve's still high or something. He says, let's go grease some queer meat. Let's go grease some queer meat. Let's go grease. 11. The timing was just right enough so that things worked out wrong for everyone. Adrian Mellon and Don Haggerty came out of the Falcon after two beers, walked up past the bus station and then linked hands. Neither of them thought about it, it's just something they did. It was 10.20. They reached the corner and turned left. The kissing bridge was almost half a mile upriver from here. They meant to cross Main Street Bridge, which was much less picturesque. The Kanduski was summer low no more than four feet of water sliding listlessly around the concrete pilings. When the duster drew abreast of them, Steve DeBay had spotted the two of them coming out of the falcon and gleefully pointed them out. They were on the edge of the span. Cut in! Cut in! Webby Garton screamed. The two men had just passed under a street light, and he had spotted the fact that they were holding hands. This infuriated him, but not as much as the hat infuriated him. The big paper flower was nodding crazily this way and that. Cut in, goddammit! And Steve did. Chris Unwin would deny active participation in what followed, but Don Haggerty told a different story. He said that Garton was out of the car almost before it stopped, and that the other two quickly followed. There was talk, not good talk. 
There was no attempted flippancy or false coquetry on Adrian's part this night. He recognized that they were in a lot of trouble. Give me that hat, Garton said. Give it to me, queer. <laughs> if I do, will you leave us alone? Adrian was wheezing with fright, almost crying, looking from Unwin to Debay to Garton with terrified eyes. Just give me the fucker. Adrian handed it over. Garton produced a switch knife from the left front pocket of his jeans and cut it into two pieces. He rubbed the pieces against the seat of his jeans. Then he dropped them to his feet and stopped them. Don Haggerty backed away a little while their attention was divided between Adrian and the hat. He was looking, he said, for a cop. Now, will you let us a look? Adrian Mellon began, and that was when Garden punched him in the face, driving him back against the waist-high pedestrian railing of the bridge. Adrian screamed, clapping his hands to his mouth. Blood poured through his fingers. Aid! Haggerty cried, and ran forward again. Debay tripped him. Garton booted him in the stomach, knocking him off the sidewalk and into the roadway. A car passed. Haggerty rose to his knees and screamed at it. It didn't slow. The driver, he told Gardner and Reeves, never even looked around. Shut up, queer, Debay said and kicked him in the side of the face. Haggerty fell on his side in the gutter, semi-conscious. A few moments later he heard a voice, Chris Unwin's, telling him to get away before he got what his friend was getting. In his own statement, Unwin verified giving this warning. Haggerty could hear thudding blows and the sound of his lover screaming. Adrian sounded like a rabbit in a snare, he told the police. Haggerty crawled back toward the intersection and the bright lights of the bus station, and when he was a distance away he turned back to look. Adrian Mellon, who stood about 5'5 five five and might have weighed 135 pounds soaking wet, was being pushed from Garton to Debay to Unwin in a kind of triple play. His body jittered and flopped like the body of a rag doll. They were punching him, pummeling him, and ripping at his clothes. As he watched, he said Garton punched Adrian in the crotch. Adrian's hair hung in his face. Blood poured out of his mouth and soaked his shirt. Webby Garton wore two heavy rings on his right hand. One was a Derry High School ring. The other one, he had made in shop class, an intertwined brass DB stood out three inches from in this ladder. The letter stood for the Dead Bugs, a metal band he particularly admired. The rings had torn Adrian's upper lip open and shattered three of his upper teeth at the gum line. Help! Haggerty shrieked. Help! Help! They're killing him! Help! The buildings of Main Street loomed dark and secret. No one came to help, not even from the one white island of light which marked the bus station, and Haggerty did not see how that could be. There were people in there. He'd seen them when he and Aid walked past. Would none of them come to help? None at all. Help! Help! There I am! Help, please! For God's sake! Help. A very small voice whispered from Don Hackett's left. And then there was a giggle. Bombs rush, Garton was yelling now, yelling and laughing, all three of them. Haggerty told Gardner and Reeves had been laughing while they beat Adrian up. Bombs rush, over the side. Bombs rush, bombs rush, bombs rush, Dubay chanted, laughing. Hell. The small voice said again, and although the voice was grave, that little giggle followed again. It was like the voice of a child who cannot help itself. Haggerty looked down and saw the clown. And it was at this point that Gardner and Reeves began to discount everything that Haggerty said, because the rest was the raving of a lunatic. Later, however, Harold Gardner found himself wondering. Later, when he found that the Unwin boy had also seen a clown, or said he had, he began to have second thoughts. His partner either never had them or would never admit to them. 
The clown, Haggerty said. The pecker cross between Ronald McDonald and that old TV clown Bozo, or so he thought at first. It was the wild tufts of orange hair that brought such comparisons to mind. But later consideration had caused him to think, the clown really looked like neither. The smile painted over the white pancake was red, not orange, and the eyes were a weird, shiny silver. Contact lenses, perhaps, but a part of him thought then, and continued to think that maybe that silver had been the real color of those eyes. He wore a baggy suit with big orange pom-pom buttons, and his hands were cartoon gloves. If you need help, Don, the clown said, help yourself to a balloon and it offered the bunch it held in one hand. They float, the clown said. Down here we all float. Pretty soon, your friend will float too. Twelve. This clown called you by name, Jeff Reeves said in a totally expressionless voice. He looked over Haggerty's bent head at Harold Gardner, and one eye drew down in a wink. Yes, Haggerty said, not looking up. I know how it sounds. Thirteen. So then you threw him over, Butillier said. Bums rush. Not me, Unwin said, looking up. He flicked the hair out of his eyes with one hand and stared at them urgently. When I saw they really meant to do it, I tried to pull Steve away because... I knew the guy might get banged up. It was like ten feet to the water. It was twenty-three. One of Chief Rademacher's patrolmen had already measured. But a who's like who's crazy, the two of them kept yelling, Bombs rush, bombs rush, so they picked him up. Webby had him under the arms and Steve had him by the seat of the pants and... And... Fourteen. When Haggerty saw what they were doing, he rushed back toward them, screaming, No, 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 at the top of his voice. Chris Unwin pushed him backward, and Haggerty landed in a teeth-rattling heap on the sidewalk. You want to go over too, he whispered. You run, baby. They threw Adrian Mellon over the bridge and into the water then. Haggerty heard the splash. Let's get out of here, Steve DeBay said. He and Webby were backing toward the car. Chris Unwin went to the railing and looked over. He saw Haggerty first sliding and clawing his way down the weedy, trash-littered embankment to the water. Then he saw the clown. The clown was dragging Adrian out on the far side with one arm. Its balloons were in its other hand. Adrian was dripping wet, choking, moaning. The clown twisted its head and grinned up at Chris. Chris said he saw its shining silver eyes and its bared teeth. Great, big teeth, he said. Like the lion in the circus, man, he said. I mean, they were that big. Then, he said, he saw the clown shove one of Adrian Mellon's arms back, so it lay over his head. Then what, Chris? Batillier said. He was bored with this part. Fairy tales had bored him since the age of eight on. Ah, I don't know, Chris said. That was when Steve grabbed me and hauled me into the car, but... I think it bit into his armpit. He looked up at them again, uncertain now. I think that's what it did. Bit into his armpit like it wanted to eat a man, like it wanted to eat his heart. Fifteen. No, Haggerty said when he was presented with Chris Unwin's story in the form of questions, the clown did not drag aid up on the far bank, at least not that he saw, and he would grant that he had been something less than a disinterested observer by that point. By that point he had been out of his fucking mind. The clown, he said, was standing near the far bank with Adrian's dripping body clutched in its arms. Aid's right arm was stuck stiffly out behind the clown's head, and the clown's face was indeed in Aid's right armpit, but it was not biting. It was smiling. Haggerty could see it looking out from beneath Aid's arm and smiling. 
The clown's arms tightened, and Haggerty heard ribs splinter. Aide shrieked. Float with us, Stan, the clown said out of its grinning red mouth, and then pointed with one of its white-gloved hands under the bridge. Balloons floated against the underside of the bridge, not a dozen or a dozen dozens, but thousands, red and blue and green and yellow, and printed on the side of each was, I heart Derry. Sixteen. Well, now, that surely does sound like a lot of balloons, Reeves said and tipped Harold Gardner another wink. I know how it sounds, Haggerty reiterated in the same dreary voice. You saw those balloons, Gardner said. Don Haggerty slowly held his hands up in front of his face. I saw them as clearly as I can see my own fingers at this moment, thousands of them. You couldn't even see the underside of the bridge. There were too many of them. They were rippling a little and sort of bouncing up and down. It was a sound, a funny low squealing noise. It was their sides rubbing together. Then strings. There was a forest of white strings hanging down. They looked like white strands of spider web. The clown took aid under there. I could see its suit brushing through those strings. Aid was making awful choking sounds. I started after him, and the clown looked back. I saw its eyes, and the, all at once I understood who it was. Who was it, Don? Harold Gardner asked softly. It was Derry, Don Haggerty said. It was this town. And what did you do then? It was Reeves. I ran. He dumped shit, Haggerty said, and burst into tears. Seventeen. Harold Gardner kept his peace until November 13th, the day before John Garden and Stephen DeBay were to go on trial in Derry District Court for the murder of Adrian Mellon. Then he went to see Tom Butillia, he wanted to talk about the clown, but Tillier didn't. But when he saw Gardner might do something stupid without a little guidance, he did. There was no clown, Harold. The only clowns out that night were those three kids. You know that as well as I do. We have two witnesses. Ah, that's crap. Unwin decided to bring on the one-armed man, as in we didn't kill the poor little faggot, it was the one-armed man. As soon as he understood he'd really gotten his buns into some hot water this time. Haggerty was hysterical. He stood by and watched those kids murder his best friend. Wouldn't have surprised me if he'd seen flying saucers. But Batillier knew better. Garner could see it in his eyes, and the assistant DA's ducking and dodging irritated him. Come on, he said. But talk about independent witnesses here. Don't bullshit me. Or oh, you want to talk bullshit? They tell me you believe there was a vampire clown under the Main Street Bridge because that's my idea of bullshit. No, not exactly, but or that Haggerty saw a billion balloons under there, each imprinted with exactly the same thing as what was written on his lover's hat, because that is also my idea of bullshit. No, but then why are you bothering with this? Stop cross-examining me, Gardner roared. They both described it the same, and neither knew what the other one was saying. But Tillier had been sitting at his desk playing with a pencil. Now he put the pencil down, got up, and walked over to Harold Gardner. Batillier was five inches shorter, but Gardner retreated a step before the man's anger. Do you want us to lose this case, Harold? No. Of course not. Do you want those running sores to walk free? No. Okay. Good. Since we both agree on the basics, I'll tell you exactly what I think. Yes, there was probably a man under the bridge that night. Maybe he was even wearing a clown suit, although I've dealt with enough witnesses to guess he was just a stew bomb or a transient wearing a bunch of cast-off clothes. I think he was probably down there scrounging for drop change or road meat, half a burger someone chucked over the side, or maybe the crumbs from the bottom of a Friedel bag. Their eyes did the rest, Harold. Now is that possible? 
I don't know, Harold said. He wanted to be convinced, but given the exact tally of the two descriptions, no, he didn't think it was possible. Here's the bottom line. I don't care if it was Kinko the Clown or a guy in an Uncle Sam suit on stilts or Schubert the Happy Homo. If we introduce this fellow into the case, their lawyer is going to be on it before you can say Jack Robinson. He's going to say those two little innocent lambs out there with their fresh haircuts and new suits didn't do anything but toss that gay fellow Melon over the side of the bridge for a joke. He'll point out that Melon was still alive after he took the fall. They have Haggerty's testimony as well as Unwin's for that. His clients didn't commit murder, oh no. It was a psycho in a clown suit. If we introduce this, that's going to happen. And you know it. Unwin's going to tell that story anyhow. But Haggerty isn't, Batilia said, because he understands. Without Haggerty, who's going to believe Unwin? Well, there's us, Harold Gardner said with a bitterness that surprised even himself. But I guess we're not telling. Oh, give me a break, Butilia roared, throwing up his hands. They killed him. They didn't just throw him over the side. Garden had a switchblade. Mellon was stabbed seven times, including once in the left lung and twice in the testicles. The wounds matched the blade. Four of his ribs were broken. Dubé did that, bear-hucking him. He was bitten all right. There were bites on his arms, his left cheek, his neck. I think that was Unwin and Garten, although we've only got one clear match, and I was probably not clear enough to stand up in court. And so all right, there was a big chunk of meat gone from his right armpit, so what? One of them really liked to bite. Probably even got himself a pretty good bone on while he was doing it. I'm betting Garten, although we'll never prove it, and Mellon's earlobe was gone. Batillier stopped, glaring at Harold. If we let in this clown story, we'll never bring it home to them. Do you want that? No, I told you. The guy was a fruit, but he wasn't hurting anyone, Batillier said. So, hi o the Dario, along come these three puss holes in their engineer boots, and they steal his life. And you'll put them in the slam, my friend. And if I hear they got their puckery little assholes cord down there at Thomaston, I'm just send them cards, saying I hope whoever did it had AIDS. Very fiery, Gardner thought. And the convictions will also look very good on your record when you run for the top spot in two years. But he left without saying more, because he also wanted to see them put away. 18. John Weber Garten was convicted of first-degree manslaughter and sentenced to 10 to 20 years in Thomaston State Prison. Stephen Bischoff Dubay was convicted of first-degree manslaughter and sentenced to 15 years in Shawshank State Prison. Christopher Philip Unwin was tried separately as a juvenile and convicted of second-degree manslaughter. He was sentenced to six months at the South Wyndham Boys Training Facility, sentence suspended. At the time of this writing, all three sentences are under appeal. Garten and DeBay may be seen on any given day girl watching or playing penny pitch in Bassey Park not far from where Mellon's torn body was found floating against one of the pilings of the Main Street Bridge. Don Haggerty and Chris Unwin have left town. At the major trial, that of Garten and DeBay, no one mentioned a clown. Chapter 3 Six Phone Calls, 1985 1. Stanley Uris Takes a Bath Patricia Uris later told her mother she should have known something was wrong. She should have known it, she said, because Stanley never took baths in the early evening. He showered early each morning and sometimes soaked late at night, with a magazine in one hand and a cold beer in the other, but bads at 7 p.m. were not his style. And then there was the thing about the books. It should have delighted him. Instead, in some obscure way, she did not understand it. It seemed to have upset and depressed him. About three months before that terrible night, Stanley discovered that a childhood friend of his had turned out to be a writer, not a real writer, Patricia told her mother, but a novelist. 
The name on the books was William Denbro, but Stanley had sometimes called him Stuttering Bill. He'd worked his way through almost all of the man's books, had, in fact, been reading the last on the night of the bath, the night of May 28, 1985. Patty herself had picked up one of the earlier ones out of curiosity. She'd put it down after just three chapters. It had not just been a novel, she told her mother later. It had been a horror book. She said it just that way, all one word, the way she would have said, sex book. Patty was a sweet, kind woman, but not terribly articulate. She'd wanted to tell her mother how much that book had frightened her and why it had upset her, but had not been able. It was full of monsters, she said, full of monsters chasing after little children. There were killings and, I don't know, bad feelings and hurt, stuff like that. It had, in fact, struck her as almost pornographic. That was the word which kept eluding her, probably because she'd never in her life spoken it, although she knew what it meant. But Stan felt as if he'd rediscovered one of his childhood chums. He talked about writing to him, but I knew he wouldn't. I knew those stories made him feel bad, too, and... Gant. And then Pediris began to cry. That night, lacking roughly six months of being twenty-eight years from the day in 1957, when George Denbro had met Pennywise the Clown, Stanley and Paddy had been sitting in the den of their home in a suburb of Atlanta. The TV was on. Paddy was sitting in the love seat in front of it, dividing her attention between a pile of sewing and her favorite game show, Family Feud. She simply adored Richard Dawson and thought the watch chain he always wore was terribly sexy although wild horses would not have drawn this admission out of her. She also liked the show because she almost always got the most popular answers. There were no right answers on Family Feud exactly, only the most popular ones. She'd once asked Stan why the questions that seemed so easy to her usually seemed so horrid to the families on the show. It's probably a lot tougher when you're up there under those lights, Stanley had replied, and it seemed to her that a shadow had drifted over his face. Everything's a lot tougher when it's for real. That's when you choke. When it's for real. That was probably very true, she decided. Stanley had really fine insights into human nature sometimes, much finer, she considered, than his old friend, William Denbro, who had gotten rich writing a bunch of horror books which appealed to people's baser natures. Not that the Eurises were doing so badly themselves. The suburb where they lived was a fine one, and the home which they had purchased for $87,000 in 1979 would probably now sell quickly and painlessly for 165000 Not that she wanted to sell, but such things were good to know. She sometimes drove back from the Fox Run Mall in her Volvo. Stanley drove a Mercedes diesel, teasing him, she called it Sedanly, and saw her house set tastefully back behind low yew hedges and thought, who lives there? Why, I do. Mrs. Stanley Uris does. This was not an entirely happy thought. Mixed with it was a pride so fierce that it sometimes made her feel a bit ill. Once upon a time, you see, there'd been a lonely 18-year-old girl named Patricia Blum, who'd been refused entry to the after-prom party that was held at the country club in the upstate town of Gloyton, New York. She'd been refused admission, of course, because her last name rhymed with Plum. That was her, just a skinny little kike plum, 1967 that had been, and such discrimination was against the law, of course, hardy har har har, and besides, it was all over now. Except that for part of her, it was never going to be over. Part of her would always be walking back to the car with Michael Rosenblatt, listening to the crushed gravel under her pumps and his ratted formal shoes, back to his father's car, which Michael had borrowed for the evening, and which she had spent the afternoon waxing. Part of her would always be walking next to Michael in his rented white dinner jacket, how it had glimmered in the soft spring night. She'd been in a pale green evening gown which her mother declared made her look like a mermaid, and the idea of a kike mermaid was pretty funny, hardy har har har. They had walked with their heads up, and she had not wept, not then, but she had understood they weren't walking back. No, not really. 
What they had been doing was slinking back, slinking, rhymes with stinking, both of them feeling more Jewish than they had ever felt in their lives, feeling like pawnbrokers, feeling like cattle car riders, feeling oily, long-nosed, sallow-skinned, feeling like Maki's, Shimi's, Kikes, wanting to feel angry and not being able to feel angry. The anger came only later when it didn't matter. At that moment, she'd only been able to feel ashamed, had only been able to ache. And then someone had laughed. A high, shrill, tittering laugh like a fast run of notes on a piano. And in the car, she'd been able to weep. Oh, you bet, here is the kike mermaid whose name rhymes with plum, just weeping away like crazy. Mike Rosenblatt had put a clumsy, comforting hand on the back of her neck, and she had twisted away from it, feeling ashamed, feeling dirty, feeling... Jewish. The house set, so tastefully back, beyond the yew hedges, made that better, but not all better. The hurt and shame were still there, and not even being accepted in this quiet, sleekly well-to-do neighborhood could quite make that endless walk with the sound of grating stones beneath their shoes stop happening. Not even being members of this country club, where the maitre d' always greeted them with a quietly respectful, Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Uris. She would come home cradled in her 1984 Volvo, and she would look at her house sitting on its expanse of green lawn, and she would often, all too often, she supposed, think of that shrill titter. And she would hope that the girl who had tittered was living in a shitty tract house with a gory husband who beat her, that she had been pregnant three times and had miscarried each time, that her husband cheated on her with diseased women, that she had slipped discs and fallen arches and cysts on her dirty, tittering tongue. She would hit herself for these thoughts, these uncharitable thoughts, and promise to do better, to stop drinking these bitter gall and wormwood cocktails. Months would go by when she did not think such thoughts. She would think, maybe all of that is finally past me. I am not that girl of eighteen anymore. I am a woman of thirty-six, the girl who heard the endless click and grate of those driveway stones, the girl who twisted away from Mike Rosenblatt's hand when he tried to comfort her because it was a Jewish hand, was half a life ago. That silly little mermaid is dead. I can forget her now and just be myself. Okay, good, great. But then she would be somewhere, at the supermarket maybe, and she would hear a sudden tittering laughter from the next aisle and her back would prickle, her nipples would go hard and hurtful, her hands would tighten on the bore of the shopping cart or just on each other and she would think, someone just told someone else that I'm Jewish, that I'm nothing but a big-nosed marky kike, that Stanley's nothing but a big-nosed marky kike, he's an accountant, sure, Jews are good with numbers. We let them into the country club, we had to back in 1981 when that big-nosed marky gynecologist won his suit, but we laugh at them. We laugh and laugh and laugh. Where she would simply hear the phantom click and grate of stones and think, Mermaid. Mermaid. Then the hate and shame would come flooding back like a migraine headache, and she would despair not only for herself, but for the whole human race. Werewolves. The book by Denbro, the one she had tried to read and then put aside, was about werewolves, werewolves, shit. But did a man like that know about werewolves? Most of the time, however, she felt better than that, felt she was better than that. She loved her man, she loved her house, and she was usually able to love her life and herself. Things were good. They'd not always been that way, of course, were things ever. When she accepted Stanley's engagement ring, her parents had been both angry and unhappy. She'd met him at a sorority party. He'd come over to her school from New York State University, where he was a scholarship student. They'd been introduced by a mutual friend, and by the time the evening was over, she suspected that she loved him. By the midterm break, she was sure. When spring came around and Stanley offered her a small diamond ring with a daisy pushed through it, she had accepted it. 
In the end, in spite of their qualms, her parents had accepted it as well. There was little else they could do, although Stanley Yours would soon be sallying forth into a job market glutted with young accountants, and when he went into that jungle he would do so with no family finances to backstop him, and with their only daughter as his hostage to fortune. But Patty was twenty-two, a woman now, and would herself soon graduate with a B.A. I'll be supporting that four-eyed son of a bitch for the rest of my life, Patty had heard her father say one night. Her mother and father had gone out for dinner and her father had drunk a little too much. Shh, she'll hear you, Ruth Blum said. Patty had lain awake that night until long after midnight, dry-eyed, alternately hot and cold, hating them both. She'd spent the next two years trying to get rid of that hate. There was too much hate inside her already. Sometimes when she looked into the mirror, she could see the things it was doing to her face, the fine lines it was drawing there. That was a battle she won. Stanley had helped her. His own parents had been equally concerned about the marriage. They did not, of course, believe their Stanley was destined for a life of squalor and poverty, but they thought the kids were being hasty. Donald Uris and Andrea Bertoli had themselves married in their early twenties, but they seemed to have forgotten the fact. Only Stanley had seemed sure of himself, confident of the future, unconcerned with the pitfalls their parents saw strewn all about the kids. And in the end, it was his confidence rather than their fears which had been justified. In July of 1972, with the ink barely dry on her diploma, Patty had landed a job teaching shorthand in business English in Trainer, a small town forty miles south of Atlanta. When she thought of how she had come by that job, it always struck her as a little, well, eerie. She'd made a list of forty possibles from the ads in the teacher's journals, then had written forty letters over five nights, eight each evening, requesting further information on the job and an application for each. Twenty-two replies indicated that the positions had been filled. In other cases, a more detailed explanation of the skills needed made it clear she wasn't in the running. Applying would only be a waste of her time and theirs. She'd finished with a dozen possibles. Each looked as likely as any other. Stanley had come in while she was puzzling over them and wondering if she could possibly manage to fill out a dozen teaching applications without going totally barkers. He looked at the strew of papers on the table and then tapped the letter from the trainer superintendent of schools, a letter which, to her, looked no more or less encouraging than any of the others. There, he said. She looked up at him, startled by the simple certainty in his voice. Do you know something about Georgia that I don't? Nope. The only time I was over there was at the movies. She looked at him, an eyebrow cocked. Gone with the wind. Vivian Lee, Clark Gable. I will think about it tomorrow, for tomorrow is another day. Do I sound like I come from the South, Paddy? Yes, South Bronx. If you don't know anything about Georgia, and you've never been there, then why? Because it's right. You can't know that, Stanley. Sure you can, he said simply. I do. Looking at him, she had seen he wasn't choking. He really meant it. She'd felt a ripple of unease go up her back. How do you know? He'd been smiling a little. Now the smile faltered, and for a moment... He had seemed puzzled. His eyes had darkened as if he looked inward, consulting some interior device which ticked and whirred correctly, but which, ultimately, he understood no more than the average man understands the workings of the watch on his wrist. The turtle couldn't help us, he said suddenly. He said that quite clearly. She heard it. That inward look, that look of surprised musing, was still on his face, and it was starting to scare her. Stanley? We talking about? Stanley? He jerked. She'd been eating peaches as she went over the applications, and his hand struck the dish. It fell on the floor and broke. His eyes seemed to clear. Oh, shit. Uh, sorry. It's all right, Stanley. W what were you talking about? I forget, he said. But I think we ought to think Georgia, baby love. But trust me, he said. So she did. Her interview had gone smashingly. 
She had known she had the job when she got on the train back to New York. The head of the business department had taken an instant liking to Paddy, and she to him. She had almost heard the click. The confirming letter had come a week later. The trainer consolidated school department could offer her $9,200 and a probationary contract. You are going to starve, Herbert Blum said when his daughter told him she intended to take the job. And you will be hot while you starve. Fiddle dee dee, Scarlet, Stanley said, when she told him what her father had said. She'd been furious, near tears, but now she began to giggle, and Stanley swept her into his arms. Hot they had been, starved they had not. They were married on August 19, 1972. Paddy Uris had gone to her marriage bed a virgin. She'd slipped naked between cool sheets at a resort hotel in the Poconos, the mood turbulent and stormy. Lightning flares of wanting and delicious lust, dark clouds of fright. When Stanley slid into bed beside her, ropey with muscle, his penis an exclamation point rising from gingery pubic hair, she'd whispered, Don't hurt me, dear. I will never hurt you, he said, as he took her in his arms, and it was a promise he had kept faithfully until May 28, 1985, the night of the bath. Her teaching had gone well. Stanley got a job driving a bakery truck for $100 a week. In November of that year, when the Trainer Flats shopping center opened, he got a job with the H&R Block office out there for $150. Their combined income was then $17,000 a year. This seemed a king's ransom to them. In those days when gas sold for 35 cents a gallon and a loaf of white bread could be had for a nickel less than that. In March of 1973, with no fuss and no fanfare, Paddy Uris had thrown away her birth control pills. In 1975, Stanley quit H&R Block and opened his own business. All four in-laws agreed that this was a foolhardy move. Not that Stanley should not have his own business, God forbid he should not have his own business. But it was too early, all of them agreed, and it put too much of the financial burden on Paddy. At least until the pisher knocks her up, Herbert Blum told his brother morosely after a night of drinking in the kitchen, and then I'll be expected to carry them. The consensus of in-law opinion on the matter was that a man should not even think about going into business for himself, until he had reached a more serene and mature age, 78, say. Again, Stanley seemed almost preternaturally confident. He was young, personable, bright, apt. He'd made contacts working for Block. All of these things were given. But he could not have known that Corridor of Video, a pioneer in the nascent videotape business, was about to settle on a huge patch of farmed-out land less than ten miles from the suburb to which the Eurasis had eventually moved in 1979, nor could he have known that Corridor would be in the market for an independent marketing survey less than a year after its move to Trainer. Even if Stan had been privy to some of this information, he surely could not have believed they would give the job to a young, bespectacled Jew who also happened to be a damn Yankee, a Jew with an easy grin, a hip-shot way of walking, a taste for bell-bottom jeans on his days off, and the last ghosts of his adolescent acne still on his face. Yet they had. They had. And it seemed that Stan had known it all along. His work for CV led to an offer of a full-time position with the company, starting salary $30,000 a year. And that really is only the start, Stanley told Paddy in bed that night. They're going to grow like corn in August, my dear. If no one blows up the world in the next ten years or so, they're going to be right up there in the big board along with Kodak and Sony and RCA. So what are you going to do? she asked, already knowing. I'm going to tell them what a pleasure it was to do business with them, he said, and laughed, and drew her close, and kissed her. Moments later he mounted her, and there were climaxes, one, two, and three, like bright rockets going off in a night sky. But there was no baby. His work with Corridor Video had brought him into contact with some of Atlanta's richest and most powerful men, and they were both astonished to find that these men were mostly okay. In them, 
they found a degree of acceptance and broad-minded kindliness that was almost unknown in the North. Paddy remembered Stanley once writing home to his mother and father, the best rich men in America live in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm going to help make some of them richer, and they're going to make me richer, and no one is going to own me except my wife, Patricia, and since I already own her, I guess that is safe enough. By the time they moved from trainer, Stanley was incorporated and employed six people. In 1983, their income had entered unknown territory, territory of which Paddy had heard only the dimmest rumors. This was the fabled land of six figures. And it had all happened with the casual ease of slipping into a pair of sneakers on Saturday morning. This sometimes frightened her. Once, she had made an uneasy joke about deals with the devil. Stanley had laughed until he almost choked. But to her it hadn't seemed that funny, and she supposed it never would. The turtle couldn't help us. Sometimes for no reason at all she would wake up with this thought in her mind like the last fragment of an otherwise forgotten dream, and she would turn to Stanley, needing to touch him, needing to make sure he was still there. It was a good life. There was no wild drinking, no outside sex, no drugs, no boredom, no bitter arguments about what to do next. There was only a single cloud. It was her mother who first mentioned the presence of this cloud. That her mother would be the one to finally do so seemed in retrospect preordained. It finally came out as a question in one of Ruth Blum's letters. She wrote Paddy once a week, and that particular letter had arrived in the early fall of 1979. It came forwarded from the old trainer address, and Paddy read it in a living room filled with cardboard liquor store cartons, from which spilled their possessions, looking forlorn and uprooted and dispossessed. In most ways it was the usual Ruth Blum letter from home, four closely written blue pages, each one headed, just a note from Ruth. Her scroll was nearly illegible, and Stanley had once complained he could not read a single word his mother-in-law wrote. Why would you want to? Paddy had responded. This one was full of Mom's usual brand of news, for Ruth Blum, recollection was a broad delta, spreading out from the moving point of the now in an ever-widening fan of interlocking relationships. Many of the people of whom her mother wrote were beginning to fade in Paddy's memory, like photographs in an old album, but to Ruth all of them remained fresh. Her concerns for their health and her curiosity about their various doings never seemed to wane, and her prognoses were unfailingly dire. Her father was still having too many stomach aches. He was sure it was just dyspepsia. The idea that he might have an ulcer, she wrote, would not cross his mind until he actually began coughing up blood and probably not even then. You know your father, dear, he works like a mule and he also thinks like one sometimes. God should forgive me for saying so. Randy Harlingen had gotten her tubes tied. They took cysts as big as golf balls out of her ovaries. No malignancy, thank God, but... Twenty-seven ovarian cysts, could you die? It was the water in New York City, she was quite sure of that. The city air was dirty too, but she was convinced it was the water that really got to you after a while. It built up deposits inside a person. She doubted if Paddy knew how often she'd thank God that you kids were out in the country, where both air and water, but particularly the water, were healthier. But to Ruth, all of the South, including Atlanta in Birmingham, was the country. Aunt Margaret was feuding with the power company again. Stella Flanagan had gotten married again, some people never learned. Richie Huber had been fired again. And in the middle of this chatty and often catty outpouring, in the middle of a paragraph apropos of nothing which had gone before or which came after, Ruth Blum had casually asked the dreaded question. So, when are you and Stan going to make us grandparents? We're all ready to start spoiling him or her rotten, and in case you hadn't noticed, Patsy, we're not getting any younger. And then on to the Bruckner girl from down the block, who had been sent home from school because she was wearing no bra and a blouse that she could see right through. Feeling low and homesick for their old place and trainer, feeling unsure and more than a little afraid of what might be ahead, Paddy had gone into what was to become their bedroom and had lain down upon the mattress. The box spring was still out in the garage and the mattress, lying all by itself on the big carpetless floor, 
looked like an artifact cast up on a strange yellow beach. She put her head in her arms and lay there weeping for nearly twenty minutes. She supposed that cry had been coming anyway. Her mother's letter had just brought it on sooner the way dust hurries the tickle in your nose into a sneeze. Stanley wanted kids. She wanted kids. They were as compatible on that subject as they were on their enjoyment of Woody Allen's films, their more or less regular attendance at synagogue, their political leanings, their dislike of marijuana, a hundred other things, both great and small. There had been an extra room in the trainer house, which they had split evenly down the middle. On the left she had a desk for working and a chair for reading. On the right she had a sewing machine and a card table where she did jigsaw puzzles. There had been an agreement between them about that room so strong they rarely spoke of it. It was simply there, like their noses or the wedding rings on their left hands. Some day that room would belong to Andy or to Jenny. But where was that child? The sewing machine and the baskets of fabric and the card table and the desk and the lazy boy all kept their places, seeming each month to solidify their holds on their respective positions in the room and to further establish their legitimacy. So she thought, although she never could quite crystallize the thought, like the word pornographic, it was a concept that danced just beyond her ability to quantify. But she did remember one time when she got her period, sliding open the cupboard under the bathroom sink to get a sanitary napkin. She remembered looking at the box of stay-free pads and thinking that the box looked almost smug, seemed almost to be saying, Hello, Paddy. We are you children. We are the only children you will ever have, and we are hungry. Nurse us. Nurse us on blood. In 1976, three years after she had thrown away the last cycle of overall tablets, they saw a doctor named Harkovay in Atlanta. We want to know if there is something wrong, Stanley said, and we want to know if we can do anything about it if there is. They took the tests. They showed that Stanley's sperm was perky, that Paddy's eggs were fertile, that all the channels that were supposed to be open were open. Harkovay, who wore no wedding ring and who had the open, pleasant, ruddy face of a college grad student just back from a midterm skiing vacation in Colorado, told them that maybe it was just nerves. He told them that such a problem was by no means uncommon. He told them that there seemed to be a psychological correlative in such cases that was in some ways similar to sexual impotency. The more you wanted to, the less you could. They would have to relax. They ought, if they could, to forget all about procreation when they had sex. Stan was grumpy on the way home. Paddy asked him why. I never do, he said. Do what? Think of procreation during. She began to giggle, even though she was by then feeling a bit lonesome and frightened. And that night, lying in bed, long after she believed that Stanley must be asleep, he had frightened her by speaking out of the dark. His voice was flat, but nevertheless choked with tears. It's me, he said. It's my fault. She rolled toward him, groped for him, held him. Don't be a stupid, she said. But her heart was beating fast, much too fast. It wasn't just that he had startled her. It was as if he had looked into her mind and read a secret conviction she held there, but of which she had not known until this minute. With no rhyme, no reason, she felt, knew, that he was right. There was something wrong, and it wasn't her. It was him. Something in him. Had to be such a klutz, she whispered fiercely against this shoulder. He was sweating lightly and she became suddenly aware that he was afraid. The fear was coming off him in cold waves. Lying naked with him was suddenly like lying naked in front of an open refrigerator. I'm not a klutz and I'm not being stupid, he said in that same voice, which was simultaneously flat and choked with emotion. And you know it. It's me. But I don't know why. Why, you can't know any such thing. Her voice was harsh, scolding, her mother's voice when her mother was afraid. And even as she scolded him, a shudder ran through her body, twisting it like a whip. Stanley felt it and his arms tightened around her. Sometimes, he said, sometimes I think I know why. Sometimes I have a dream. 
a bad dream, and I wake up and I think, I know now, I know what's wrong. Not just you not catching pregnant, everything. Everything that's wrong with my wife. Stanley, nothing's wrong with your life. I don't mean from inside, he said. From inside is fine. I'm talking about outside. Something that should be over and isn't. I wake up from these dreams and think my whole pleasant life has been nothing but the eye of some storm I don't understand. I'm afraid, but then it just fades the way dreams do. She knew that he sometimes dreamed uneasily. On half a dozen occasions he had awakened her, thrashing and moaning. Probably there had been other times when she had slept through his dark interludes. Whenever she reached for him, asked him, he said the same thing, I can't remember. Then he would reach for his cigarettes and smoke, sitting up in bed, waiting for the residue of the dream to pass through his pores like bad sweat. No kids. On the night of May 28, 1985, the night of the bath, their assorted in-laws were still waiting to be grandparents. The extra room was still an extra room. The stay-free maxis and stay-free minis still occupied their accustomed places in the cupboard under the bathroom sink. The cardinal still paid its monthly visit. Her mother, who was much occupied with her own affairs but not entirely oblivious to her daughter's pain, had stopped asking in her letters, and when Stanley and Paddy made their twice-yearly trips back to New York, there were no more humorous remarks about whether or not they were taking their vitamin E. Stanley had also stopped mentioning babies, but sometimes, when she didn't know he was looking, she saw a shadow on his face. Some shadow, as if he were trying desperately to remember something. Other than that one cloud, their lives were pleasant enough until the phone rang during the middle of family feud on the night of May 28th. Paddy had six of Stan's shirts, two of her blouses, her sewing kit, and her odd button box. Stan had the new William Denbro novel, not even out in paperback yet, in his hands. There was a snarling beast on the front of this book. On the back was a bald man wearing glasses. Stan was sitting nearer the phone. He picked it up and said, Hello, you're as residence. He listened, and a frown line delved between his eyebrows. Who, did you say? Patty felt an instant of fright. Later, shame would cause her to lie and tell her parents that she had known something was wrong from the instant the telephone had rung. But in reality, there had only been that one instant, that one quick look up from her sewing. But maybe that was all right. Maybe they had both suspected that something was coming long before that phone call, something that didn't fit with the nice house set tastefully back behind the low yew hedges. Something so much a given that it really didn't need much of an acknowledgement. That one sharp instant of fright, like the stab of a quickly withdrawn ice pick, was enough. Is it mom? She mouthed at him in that instant thinking that perhaps her father, twenty pounds overweight and prone to what he called the belly ache since his early forties, had had a heart attack. Stan shook his editor and then smiled a bit at something the voice on the phone was saying. You. You. Oh, well, I'll be goddamned, Mike. How did you... He fell silent again, listening. As a smile faded, she recognized, or thought she did, his analytic expression, the one which said someone was unfolding a problem or explaining a sudden change in an ongoing situation or telling him something strange and interesting. This last was probably the case, she gathered. A new client, an old friend, perhaps. She turned her attention back to the TV, where a woman was flinging her arms round Richard Dawson and kissing him madly. She thought that Richard Dawson must get kissed even more than the Blorney Stone. She also thought she wouldn't mind kissing him herself. As she began searching for a black button to match the ones on Stanley's blue denim shirt, Paddy was vaguely aware that the conversation was settling into a smoother groove. Stanley grunted occasionally, and once he asked, Are you sure, Mike? Finally, after a very long pause, he said, All right, 
I understand. Yes, I... Yes. Yes, everything. I have the picture. I... What? No, I, I can't absolutely promise that, but I'll consider it carefully. You know that. I... Oh? Th he did? Well, you bet. Of course I do. Yes, sure. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. He hung up. Patty glanced at him and saw him staring blankly into space over the TV set. On her show, the audience was applauding the Ryan family, which had just scored 280 points, most of them by guessing that the audience survey would answer math in response to the question, what class will people say Junior hates most in school? The Ryans were jumping up and down and screaming joyfully. Stanley, however, was frowning. She would later tell her parents she thought Stanley's face had looked a little off-color, and so she did, but she neglected to tell them she had dismissed it at the time as only a trick of the table lamp with its green glass shade. Who was that, Stan? Hmm? He looked around at her. She thought the look on his face was one of gentle abstraction, perhaps mixed with minor annoyance. It was only later, replaying the scene in her mind again and again, that she began to believe it was the expression of a man who was methodically unplucking himself from reality one chord at a time, the face of a man who was heading out of the blue and into the black. Who is that on the phone? No one, he said, no one, really. I think I'll take a bath. He stood up. W what, at seven o'clock? He didn't answer, only left the room. She might have asked him if something was wrong, might even have gone after him and asked him if he was sick to his stomach. He was sexually uninhibited, but he could be oddly prim about other things, and it wouldn't be at all unlike him to say he was going to take a bath, but what he really had to do was whoops something which hadn't agreed with him. But now a new family, the Piscopos, were being introduced, and Patty just knew Richard Dawson would find something funny to say about that name, and besides, she was having the devil's own time finding a black button, although she knew there were loads of them in the button box. They hid, of course. That was the only explanation. So she let him go and did not think of him again until the credit crawl, when she looked up and saw his empty chair. She had heard the water running into the tub upstairs and had heard it stop five or ten minutes later. But now she realized she had never heard the fridge door open and close and that meant he was up there without a can of beer. Someone had called him up and dropped a big fat problem in his lap. And had she offered him a single word of commiseration? No. Tried to draw him out a little about it? No. Even notice that something was wrong? For the third time, no. All because of that stupid TV show. She couldn't even really blame the buttons. They were only an excuse. Okay. She'd take him up a can of Dixie and sit beside him on the edge of the tub, scrub his back, clay, geisha, and wash his hair if he wanted her to, and find out just what the problem was, or who it was. She got a can of beer out of the fridge and went upstairs with it. The first real disquiet stirred in her, when she saw that the bathroom door was shut, not just part way closed, but shut tight. Stanley never closed the door when he was taking a bath. It was something of a joke between them. The closed door meant he was doing something his mother had taught him. The open door meant he would not be averse to doing something the teaching of which his mother had quite properly left to others. Patty tapped on the door with her nails, suddenly aware, too aware, of the reptilian clicking sound they made on the wood and surely tapping on the bathroom door and knocking like a guest was something she had never done before in her married life, not here, not on any other door in the house. The disquiet suddenly grew strong in her, and she thought of Carson Lake, where she had gone swimming often as a girl. By the first of August the lake was as warm as a tub, but then you'd hit a cold pocket that would shiver you with surprise and delight. One minute you were warm, the next moment it felt as if the temperature had plummeted twenty degrees below your hips. Minus the delight, that was how she felt now, as if she'd just struck a cold pocket. Only this cold pocket was not below her hips, chilling her long teenager's legs in the black depths of Carson Lake. This one was around her heart. 
Stanley? Stan? This time she did more than tap with her nails. She rapped on the door. When there was still no answer, she hammered on it. Stanley? Her heart. Her heart wasn't in her chest anymore. It was beating in her throat, making it hard to breathe. Stanley! And the silence following her shout, and just the sound of herself shouting up there, less than thirty feet from the place where she laid her head down and went to sleep each night, frightened her even more. She heard a sound which brought panic up from the below-stairs part of her mind, like an unwelcome guest. Such a small sound, really. It was only the sound of dripping water. Clink. Pause. Clink. Pause. Clink. Pause. Clink. She could see the drops forming on the snout of the faucet, growing heavy and fat there, growing pregnant there, and then falling off. Clink. Just that sound. No other. And she was suddenly terribly sure that it had been Stanley, not her father, who had been stricken with a heart attack tonight. With a moan, she gripped the cut glass doorknob and turned it, yet still the door would not move. It was locked. And suddenly three nevers occurred to Paddy Uris in rapid succession. Stanley never took a bath in the early evening. Stanley never closed the door unless he was using the toilet. And Stanley had never locked the door against her at all. Was it possible, she wondered crazily, to prepare for a heart attack? Paddy ran her tongue over her lips. It produced a sound in her head like fine sandpaper sliding along a board and called his name again. There was still no answer except the steady, deliberate drip of the faucet. She looked down and saw she still held the can of Dixie beer in one hand. She gazed at it stupidly, her heart running like a rabbit in her throat. She gazed at it, as if she had never seen a can of beer in her whole life before this minute. And indeed it seemed she never had, or at least never one like this, because when she blinked her eyes it turned into a telephone handset, as black and as threatening as a snake. May I help you, ma'am? Do you have a problem? The snake spat at her. Patty slammed it down in its cradle and stepped away, rubbing the hand which had held it. She looked around and saw she was back in the TV room and understood that the panic which had come into the front of her mind like a prowler walking quietly up a flight of stairs had had its way with her. Now she could remember dropping the beer can outside the bathroom door and pelting headlong back down the stairs, thinking vaguely, this is all a mistake of some kind and we'll laugh about it later. He filled up the tub and then remembered he didn't have cigarettes and went out to get them before he took his clothes off. Yes. Only he had already locked the bathroom door from the inside and because it was too much of a bother to unlock it again, he, he had simply opened the window over the tub and gone down the side of the house like a fly crawling down a wall. Sure. Of course. Sure. Panic was rising in her mind again. It was like bitter black coffee threatening to overflow the rim of a cup. She closed her eyes and fought against it. She stood there, perfectly still, a pale statue with a pulse beating in its throat. Now she could remember running back down here, feet stuttering on the stair levels, running for the phone. Oh yes, so sure, but who had she meant to call? Crazily, she thought, I would call the turtle, but the turtle couldn't help us. It didn't matter anyway. She'd gotten as far as zero and she must have said something not quite standard, because the operator had asked if she had a problem. She had one all right. But how did you tell that faceless voice that Stanley had locked himself in the bathroom and didn't answer her that the steady sound of the water dripping into the tub was killing her heart? Somewhat. Had to help her. Someone. She put the back of her hand into her mouth and deliberately bit down on it. She tried to think, tried to force herself to think. The spare keys. The spare keys in the kitchen cupboard. She got going, and one slippered foot kicked the bag of buttons resting beside her chair. Some of the buttons spilled out glittering like glazed eyes in lamplight. She saw at least the half a dozen black ones. Mounted inside the door of the cupboard over the double basin sink was a large varnished board in the shape of a key, one of Stan's clients had made it in his workshop and given it to him two Christmases ago. The keyboard was studded with small hooks and swinging on these were all the keys the house took, two duplicates of each to a hook. Beneath each hook was a strip of mystic tape, each strip lettered in Stan's small neat printing, garage, attic, D-stairs bath, upstairs bath, 
front door, back door. Off to one side were ignition key dupes labeled MB and Volvo. Patty snatched the key marked upstairs bath, began to run for the stairs and then made herself walk. Running made the panic want to come back, and the panic was too close to the surface as it was. Also, if she just walked, maybe nothing would be wrong. Or if there was something wrong, God could look down, see she was just walking and think, oh good, I pulled a hell of a boner, but I've got time to take it all back. Walking as sedately as a woman on her way to a ladies' book circle meeting, she went up the stairs and down to the closed bathroom door. Stanley, she called, trying the door again at the same time, suddenly more afraid than ever, not wanting to use the key because having to use the key was somehow too final. If God hadn't taken it back by the time she used the key, then he never would. The age of miracles, after all, was past. But the door was still locked. The deliberate clink, pause of dripping water was her only answer. Her hand was shaking, and the key chattered all the way around the plate before finding its way into the keyhole and socking itself home. She turned it and heard the lock snap back. She fumbled for the cut glass knob. It tried to slide through her hand again, not because the door was locked this time, but because her palm was wet with sweat. She firmed her grip and made it turn. She pushed the door open. Stanley? Stanley? Stit! She looked at the tub with its blue shower curtain bunched at the far end of the stainless steel rod and forgot how to finish her husband's name. She simply stared at the tub, her face as solemn as the face of a child on her first day at school. In a moment she would begin to scream, and Anita McKenzie next door would hear her, and it would be Anita McKenzie who would call the police convinced that someone had broken into the Eurus house and that people were being killed over there. But for now, this one moment, Patty Eurus simply stood silent with her hands clasped in front of her, against her dark cotton skirt, her face solemn, her eyes huge, and now the look of almost holy solemnity began to transform itself into something else. The huge eyes began to bulge. Her mouth pulled back into a dreadful grin of horror. She wanted to scream and couldn't. The screams were too big to come out. The bathroom was lit by fluorescent tubes. It was very bright. There were no shadows. You could see everything whether you wanted to or not. The water in the tub was bright pink. Stanley lay with his back propped against the rear of the tub. His head had rolled so far back on his neck that strands of his short black hair brushed the skin between his shoulder blades. If his staring eyes had still been capable of seeing, she would have looked upside down to him. His mouth hung open like a sprung door. His expression was one of abysmal frozen horror. A package of Gillette Platinum Plus razor blades lay on the rim of the tub. He had slit his inner forearms open from wrist to the crook of the elbow and then had crossed each of these cuts just below the bracelets of fortune, making a pair of bloody capital T's. The gashes glared red-purple in the harsh white light. She thought the exposed tendons and ligaments looked like cuts of cheap beef. A drop of water gathered at the lip of the shiny chromium faucet. It grew fat. Grew pregnant, you might say. It sparkled. It dropped. Clink. He had dipped his right forefinger in his own blood and had written a single word on the blue tiles above the tub, written it in two huge, staggering letters. A zigzagging, bloody finger mark fell away from the second letter of this word. His finger had made that mark, she saw, as his hand fell into the tub where it now floated. She thought Stanley must have made that mark his final impression on the world as he lost consciousness. It seemed to cry out at her. It. Another drop fell into the tub. Clink. That did it. Patty Uris at last found her voice, staring into her husband's dead and sparkling eyes. She began to scream. Two. Richard Tozier takes a powder. Rich felt like he was doing pretty good, until the vomiting started. 
He'd listened to everything Mike Hanlon told him, said all the right things, answered Mike's questions, even asked a few of his own. He was vaguely aware that he was doing one of his voices, not a strange and outrageous one, like those he sometimes did on the radio. Kinky briefcase, sexual accountant was his own personal favorite, at least for the time being. And positive listener response on Kinky was almost as high as for his listener's all-time favorite Colonel Buford Kiss Drivel. But a warm, rich, confident voice. An I'm all right voice. It sounded great, but it was a lie. Just like all the other voices were lies. How much do you remember, Rich? Mike asked him. Very little, Rich said, and then paused. Enough, I suppose. Will you come? I'll come, Rich said, and hung up. He sat in his study for a moment, leaning back in the chair behind his desk, looking out at the Pacific Ocean. A couple of kids were down on the left, horsing around on their surfboards, not really riding them. There wasn't much surf to ride. The clock on the desk, an expensive LED quartz that had been a gift from a record company rep, said that it was 5.09 p.m. on May 28, 1985. It would, of course, be three hours later where Mike was calling from. Dark already. He felt a prickle of goose flesh at that, and he began to move to do things. First, of course, he put on a record, not hunting, just grabbing blindly among the thousands racked on the shelves. Rock and roll was almost as much a part of his life as the voices, and it was hard for him to do anything without music playing, and the louder the better. The record he grabbed turned out to be a Motown retrospective. Marvin Gaye, one of the newer members of what Rich sometimes called the All Dead Band, came on singing, I heard it through the grapevine. Woo-hoo, I bet you're wondering how I knew. Eh, not bad, Rich said. He even smiled a little. This was bad, and it had admittedly knocked him for a loop, but he felt that he was going to be able to handle it. No sweat. He began getting ready to go back home, and at some point during the next hour it occurred to him that it was as if he had died and had yet been allowed to make all of his own final business dispositions, not to mention his own funeral arrangements. And he felt as if he was doing pretty good. He tried the travel agent he used, thinking she would probably be on the freeway and headed home by now, but taking a shot on the off chance. For a wonder, he called her in. He told her what he needed, and she asked him for a fifteen minutes. I owe you one, Carol, he said. They had progressed from Mr. Tozier and Ms. Feeney to Rich and Carol over the last three years, pretty chummy, considering they had never met face to face. All right, pay off, she said. Can you do kinky briefcase for me? Without even pausing, if you had to pause to find her voice, there was usually no voice there to be found. Rich said, Kinky briefcase, sexual accountant here. I had a fellow come in the other day who wanted to know what the worst thing was about getting eames. His voice had dropped slightly. At the same time, its rhythm had speeded up and become jaunty. It was clearly an American voice, and yet it somehow conjured up images of a wealthy British colonial chappy who was as charming in his muddled way as he was addled. Rich hadn't the slightest idea who Kinky Briefcase really was, but he was sure he always wore white suits, red esquire, and drank things which came in tall glasses and smelled like coconut-scented shampoo. But I told him right away, trying to explain to your mother how you picked it up from a Haitian girl. Until next time, this is Kinky Briefcase sexual accountant saying, you need my card if you can't get hired. Carol Feeney screamed with laughter. Ah, uh, that's perfect, perfect. Uh, my boyfriend says, you didn't believe you could just do those voices. He says, it's got to be a voice filter gadget or something. Uh, just chow in my dear, Rich said. Kinky briefcase was none. Debbie C. Fields, top hat, red nose, golf bags and all was here. I'm so stuffed with talent. I have to plug up all my bodily orifices to keep it from just running out like, well, just running out. She went off into another screamy gale of laughter, and Rich closed his eyes. He could feel the beginnings of a headache. Be a dear and see what you can do, would you? He asked, still being Debussy Fields, and hung up on her laughter. 
Now he had to go back to being himself, and that was hard. Got harder to do that every year. It was easier to be brave when you were someone else. He was trying to pick out a pair of good loafers and had about decided to stick with sneakers when the phone rang again. It was Carol Feeney back in record time. He felt an instant urge to fall into the Buford kiss drivel voice and fought it off. She'd been able to get him a first-class seat on the American Airlines Red Eye non-stop from LAX to Boston. He would leave LA at 9.03 p.m. and arrive at Logan about 5 o'clock tomorrow morning. Delta would fly him out of Boston at 7.30 a.m. and into Bangor, Maine, at 8.20. She'd gotten him a full-size sedan from Avis and it was only 26 miles from the Avis counter at Bangor International Airport to the Derry Town Line. Only 26 miles, Rich thought. Is that all, Carol? Oh, maybe it is, in miles anyway. But you don't have the slightest idea how far it really is to Derry. And I know neither. But oh God, oh dear God, I am go and find out. I didn't try for a room because you didn't tell me how long you'd be there, she said. Do you? No, no. Let me take care of that, Rich said. And then Buford Kistrivel took over. But you've made a peach, my dear. A Georgia peach, of course. He hung up gently on her. Always leave him laughing. And then dialed 207 555 1212 for a State of Maine directory assistance. He wanted a number for the Derry Town House. God, there was a name from the past. He hadn't thought of the Derry Town House in, what, ten years? Twenty? Twenty five years, even. Crazy as it seemed, he guessed it had been at least twenty-five years, and if Mike hadn't called, he supposed he might never have thought of it again in his life. And yet, there had been a time in his life when he had walked past that great red brick pile every day, and on more than one occasion he had run past it, with Henry Bowers and Belch Huggins and that other big boy, Victor somebody or other, in hot pursuit, all of them yelling little pleasantries like, we're going to get you, fuck face. Going to get you, you little smart ass. Going to get you, you four-eyed faggot. Had they ever gotten him? Before Rich could remember, an operator was asking him what city, please. In Derry, operator. Derry. Ah, oh, God. Even the word felt strange and forgotten in his mouth. Saying it was like kissing an antique. Do you have a number for the Derry townhouse? One moment, sir. No way. It'll be gone. Raised in an urban renewal program. Changed into an Elks Hall or a Bolodrome or an electric dreamscape video arcade. Or maybe burned down one night when the odds finally ran out on some drunk shoe salesman smoking in bed. All gone, Richie. Just like the glasses Henry Bowers always used to rag you about. Ah, uh, what's that Springsteen song say? Glory days. Gone in the wink of a young girl's eye. What young girl? Why, Bev, of course. Bev. Changed the townhouse might be, but gone it apparently was not because a blank robotic voice now came on the line and said, The number is 9418282. Repeat. The number is. But Rich had gotten it the first time. It was a pleasure to hang up on that droning voice. It was too easy to imagine some great globular directory assistance monster buried somewhere in the earth, sweating rivets and holding thousands of telephones and thousands of jointed chromium tentacles, the Ma Bell version of Spidey's nemesis, Dr. Octopus. Each year the world Rich lived in felt more and more like a huge electronic haunted house in which digital ghosts and frightened human beings lived in uneasy coexistence. Still standing, the paraphrase Paul Simon, still standing after all these years. He dialed the hotel he had last seen through the horn-rimmed spectacles of his childhood. Dialing that number, 1207-941-8282, was fatally easy. He held the telephone to his ear, looking out his study's wide picture window. The surface were gone. A couple was walking slowly up the beach, hand in hand, where they had been. The couple could have been a poster on the wall of the travel agency where Carol Feeney worked. That was how perfect they were. Except that was for the fact 
They were both wearing glasses. Can I get your fuck face? Can I break your glasses? Chris, his mind sent up abruptly. His last name was Chris. Victor Chris. Oh, Christ. There was nothing he wanted to know, not at this late date. But it didn't seem to matter in the slightest. Something was happening down there in the vaults. Down there where Rich Tozier kept his own personal collection of golden oldies. Doors were opening. Only they're not records down there, are they? Down there? You're not rich. Records, Tozier. Hotshot KLAD DJ and the man of a thousand voices, are you? And those things that are opening, they aren't exactly doors, are they? He tried to shake these thoughts off. Thing to remember is that I'm okay, I'm okay. You're okay, Rich Tozier's okay. Could use a cigarette, is all. He'd quit four years ago, but he could use one now, all right. They're not records, but dead bodies. You buried them deep. Now there's some kind of crazy earthquake going on, and the ground is spitting them up to the surface. You're not rich records, Tozier, down there. Down there you're just richy four-eyes, Tozier. And you're with your buddies. And you're so scared it feels like your balls are turning into Welch's grape jelly. Those aren't doors. And they're not opening. Those are crypts, Richie. They're cracking open. And the vampires you thought were dead are all flying out again. A cigarette, just one. Even a Carlton would do, for Christ's sweet sake. Then it gets your four eyes, gonna make you eat that fucking book bad. Townhouse, a male voice with a Yankee tang said. It had traveled all the way across to England, the Midwest, and under the casinos of Las Vegas to reach his ear. Rich asked the voice if he could reserve a suite of rooms at the townhouse beginning tomorrow. The voice told him he could, and then asked him for how long. I can't say I've got... Uh, he paused briefly, minutely. What did he have, exactly? In his mind's eye, he saw a boy with a tartan book bag running from the tough guys. He saw a boy who wore glasses, a thin boy with a pale face that had somehow seemed to scream, Hit me! Go on and hit me! In some mysterious way to every passing bully. Here's my lips. Mash them back against my teeth. Here's my nose. Bloody it for sure and break it if it can. Box an ear so it swells up like a cauliflower. Split an eyebrow. Here's my chin. Go for the knockout button. Here are my eyes so blue. And so magnified behind these hateful, hateful glasses, these horn-rimmed specks, one bow of which is held on with adhesive tape. Break the specks, drive a shard of glass into one of these eyes and close it forever. What the hell? He closed his eyes and said, I've got business in Derry. You see, I don't know how long the transaction will take. Uh, how about three days with an option to renew? An option to renew? The desk clerk asked doubtfully. And Rich waited patiently for the fellow to work it over in his mind. Oh, oh, oh I get you. That's very good. Uh, thank you, and I um, uh, hope you can vote for us in November, John F. Kennedy said. Hey, Jackie wants to uh, do over the uh, Oval Office, and uh, I've got a job all lined up for my uh, brother Bobby. Mm, Mr. Tosher? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody else got on the line there for a few seconds. Just an old poll from the D.O.P., Rich thought. That's dead old party, in case you should wonder. Don't worry about it. A shudder worked through him, and he told himself again almost desperately. You're okay, Rich. Yeah, I heard it too, Rich said. Must have been a line crossover. How are we looking on that room? Ah, oh, there's no problem with that, the clerk said. We do business here in Derry, but uh, it merely never blooms. Is that so? Aye, aye, aye. The clerk agreed, and Rich shuddered again. He'd forgotten that, too, that simple northern New Englandism for yes, oh, aye, aye. Can it get you, Creek? The ghostly voice of Henry Bowers screamed, and he felt more crypts cracking open inside of him. The stench he smelled was not decayed bodies but decayed memories, and that was somehow worse.
He gave the townhouse clerk his American Express number and hung up. Then he called Steve Koval, the KLAD program director. What's up, wretch? Steve asked. The last Arbitron ratings had shown KLAD at the top of the cannibalistic Los Angeles FM rock market, and ever since then Steve had been in an excellent mood, thank God for small favors. Well, you might be sorry you asked, he told Steve. Um, taken a powder. Taken? He could hear the frown in Steve's voice. I don't think I get you, Rich. I have to put on my boogie shoes. I'm going away. What do you mean, going away? According to the log I have right here in front of me, you're on the air tomorrow from 2 in the afternoon until 6 p.m., just like always. In fact, you're interviewing Clarence Clemens in the studio at 4. You know Clarence Clemens, Rich. As in, come on and blow, big man. Clemens can talk to Mike O'Hara as well as he can to me. Clarence doesn't want to talk to Mike Rich. Clarence doesn't want to talk to Bobby Russell. He doesn't want to talk to me. Clarence is a big fan of Buford Kistrevel and Wyatt the Homicidal Bag Boy. He wants to talk to you, my friend. And I've no interest in having a pissed-off 250-pound saxophone player who was once almost drafted by a pro football team running amok in my studio. I don't think he has a history of running amok, Rich said. I mean, we're talking Clarence Clements here, not Keith Moon. There was silence on the line. Rich waited patiently. You're not serious, are you? Steve finally asked. He sounded plaintive. I mean, unless your mother just died or you've got a brain tumor out or something, this is called crapping out. I have to go, Steve. Is your mother sick? Did she, God forbid, die? She died ten years ago. Have you got a brain tumor? Not even a rectal polyp. This is not funny, wretch. No. D You've been a fucking busher, and I don't like it. Not to like it either, but I have to go. Where? Why? W what is this? Talk to me, wretch. Someone called me. Someone I used to know a long time ago in another place. Back then, something happened. I made a promise. We all promised that. We would go back if the something started happening again, and I guess it has. But something are we talking about, Rich? I just as soon not say. Also, you think I'm crazy if I tell you the truth. I don't remember. When did you make this famous promise? A long time ago in the summer of 1958. There was another long pause. And he knew Steve Cavall was trying to decide if Rich Records Tozier, a.k.a. Buford Kistrivel, a.k.a. Wyatt the Homicidal Bag Boy, etc., etc., was having him on, or was having some kind of mental breakdown. You would have been just a kid, Steve said flatly. Eleven. Going on twelve. Another long pause. Rich waited patiently. All right, Steve said. I'll shift the rotation, put Mike in for you. I can call Chuck Foster to pull a few shifts, I guess. If I can find what Chinese restaurant he's currently holed up in. I'll do it because we go back a long way together, but I'm never going to forget you bushed out on me, Rich. Oh, get down off it, Rich said, but the headache was getting worse. He knew what he was doing. Did Steve really think he didn't? I need a few days off is all. You're acting like I took a shit on our FCC charter. A few days off? For what? The reunion of your Cub Scout pack in Shithouse Falls, North Dakota, or Pussy Hump City, West Virginia? Or actually, I think Shithouse Falls is an Arkansas bowl, Buford Kistrevel said in his big, hollow-barrel voice, but Steve was not to be diverted. Because you made a promise when you were eleven? Kids don't make serious promises when they're eleven, for Christ's sake. It's, it's not even that rich, and you know it. This is not an insurance company. This is not a law office. This is show business. Be it ever so humble, and you fucking well know it. If you had given me a week's notice, I wouldn't be holding this phone in one hand and a bottle of my lad in the other. You would put my balls to the wall, and you know it, so don't you insult my intelligence. Steve was nearly screaming now, and Rich closed his eyes. I'm never going to forget it, Steve had said, and Rich supposed he never would. But Steve had also said kids didn't make serious promises when they were eleven, and that wasn't true at all. Rich couldn't remember what the promise had been, wasn't sure he wanted to remember. But it had been plenty serious. 
Steve. I have to. Yeah, and I told you I could handle it. So go ahead. Go ahead, you busher. Steve, this is rid... But Steve had already hung up. Rich put the phone down. It barely started away from it when it began to ring again. And he knew without picking it up that it was Steve again, madder than ever. Talking to him at this point would do no good, things would just get uglier. He slid the switch on the side of the phone to the right, cutting it off in mid-ring. He went upstairs, pulled two suitcases out of the closet and filled them with a barely glanced at conglomeration of clothes, jeans, shirts, underwear, socks. It would not occur to him until later that he had taken nothing but kid clothes. He carried the suitcases back downstairs. On the den wall was a black-and-white Ansel Adams photograph of Big Sir. Rich swung it back on hidden hinges, exposing a barrel safe. He opened it, poured his way past the paperwork, the house here, poised cozily between the fault line and the brush fire zone, twenty acres of timberland in Idaho, a bunch of stocks. He'd bought the stocks seemingly at random. When his broker saw Rich coming, he immediately clutched his head, but the stocks had all risen steadily over the years, he was sometimes surprised by the thought that he was almost, not quite, but almost, a rich man. All courtesy of rock and roll music. And the voices, of course. House, acres, stocks, insurance policy, even a copy of his last will and testament. The strings that bind you tight to the map of your life, he thought. There was a sudden wild impulse to whip out his Zippo and light it up. The whole whore's combine of wherefores and know ye all men by these presents and the bearer of this certificate is entitled, and he could do it too. The papers in his safe had suddenly ceased to signify anything. The first real terror struck him then, and there was nothing at all supernatural about it. It was only a realization of how easy it was to trash your life. That was what was so scary. He just dragged the fan up to everything you had spent the years raking together and Turn the motherfucker on, easy. Burn it up or blow it away. Then just take a powder. Behind the papers, which were only currencies, second cousins, was the real stuff, the cash. Four thousand dollars in tens, twenties, and fifties. Taking it now, stuffing it into the pocket of his jeans, he wondered if he hadn't somehow known what he was doing when he put the money in here. Fifty bucks one month, a hundred and twenty the next, Maybe only ten the month after that, rat hole money, taking a powder money. Man, that's scary, he said, barely aware he had spoken. He was looking blankly out the big window at the beach. It was deserted now, the surfers gone, the honeymooners, if that was what they had been, gone too. Hi, ah, yes, Doc, it all comes back to me now. Remember Stanley Uris, for instance? <laughs> Bet your fur I do. Remember how he used to say that and think it was so cool? Stanley Urin, the big kids called him. Hey, Urin, hey, you fucking Christ killer, where you going? One of your fag friends gonna give you a BJ? He slammed the safe door shut and swung the picture back into place. When had he last thought of Stan Uris? Five years ago? Ten? Twenty? Rich and his family had moved away from Derry in the spring of 1960, and how fast all of their faces faded, his gang that pitiful bunch of losers with their little clubhouse in what had been known then as the Barrens, funny name for an area as lush with growth as that place had been, killing themselves, that they were jungle explorers or sea bees carving out a landing strip on a Pacific atoll while they held off the Japs, killing themselves that they were dam builders, cowboys, spacemen on a jungle world, you name it, but whatever you name it, though let's forget what it really was. It was hiding. Hiding from the big kids, hiding from Henry Bowers and Victor Chris and Belch Huggins and the rest of them. What a bunch of losers they had been. Stan Uris with his big Jew boy nose, Bill Denbro who could say nothing but hi -oh silver without stuttering so badly that it drove you almost dog shit. Beverly Marsh with her bruises and her cigarettes rolled into the sleeve of her blouse. Ben Hanscom, who'd been so big he looked like a human version of Moby Dick, and Richie Tozier, with his thick glasses and his A averages and his wise mouth and his face which just begged to be pounded into new and exciting shapes.
Was there a word for what they had been? Oh, yes, there always was. L'émol juste. In this case, l'émol juste was wimps. How it came back. How all of it came back. And now he stood here in his den, shivering as helplessly as a homeless mutt caught in a thunderstorm. Shivering because the guys he had run with were at all he remembered. There were other things. Things he hadn't thought of in years, trembling, just below the surface. Bloody things. A darkness. Some darkness. The house on Niebold Street and built screaming, You c c killed my brother, you f f f fucker. Did he remember? Just enough not to want to remember any more, and you could bet your fur on that. A smell of garbage, a smell of shit, and a smell of something else, something worse than either. It was the stink of the beast, the stink of it. Down there in the darkness under Derry, where the machines thundered on and on, he remembered George. But that was too much, and he ran for the bathroom, blundering into his Eames chair on his way and almost falling. He made it, barely. He slid across the slick tiles to the toilet on his knees like some weird breakdancer, gripped the edges and vomited everything in his guts. Even then it wouldn't stop. Suddenly he could see Georgie Denbro as if he had last seen him yesterday. Georgie, who had been the start of it all, Georgie who had been murdered in the fall of 1957. Georgie had died right after the flood. One of his arms had been ripped from its socket and Rich had blocked all of that out of his memory. But sometimes those things come back, oh yes indeedy, they come back. Sometimes they come back. A spasm passed and Rich groped blindly for the flush. Water roared. His early supper, regurgitated in hot chunks, vanished tastefully down the drain. Into the sewers. Into the pound and stink. And darkness of the sewers. He closed the lid, laid his forehead against it, and began to cry. He was the first time he had cried since his mother died in 1975. Without even thinking of what he was doing, he cupped his hands under his eyes and the contact lenses he wore slipped out and lay glistening in his palms. Forty minutes later, feeling husked out and somehow cleansed, he threw his suitcases into the trunk of his MG and backed it out of the garage. The light was fading. He looked at his house with the new plantings. He looked at the beach, at the water, which had taken on the cast of pale emeralds broken by a narrow track of beaten gold. And a conviction stole over him that he would never see any of this again, that he was a dead man walking. Go on home now, Rich Tozier whispered to himself. Go on home. God help me. Go on home. He put the car in gear and went, feeling again how easy it had been to slip through an unsuspected fissure in what he had considered a solid life, how easy it was to get over onto the dark side to sail out of the blue and into the black. Out of the blue and into the black. Yes, that was it, where anything might be waiting. Three. Ben Hanscom takes a drink. If, on that night of May 28, 1985, you had wanted to find the man Time magazine had called perhaps the most promising young architect in America, Urban Energy Conservation and the Young Turks Time, October 15, 1984, you would have had to drive west out of Omaha on Interstate 80 to do it. You'd have taken the Swedholm exit and then Highway 81 to downtown Swedholm, of which there isn't much. There you turn off on Highway 92 at Bucky's Hi-Hat Eat'em-Up, chicken fried steak our specialty, 
And once out in the country again, you'd hang a right on Highway 63, which runs straight as a string through the deserted little town of Gatlin, and finally into Hemingford Home. Downtown Hemingford Home made downtown Sweet Home look like New York City. The business district consisted of eight buildings, five on one side and three on the other. There was the clean-cut barber shop, propped in the window a yellowing hand-lettered sign fully 15 years old, read, if you're a hippie, get your hair cut somewhere else. The second-run movie house, the Five and Dime. There was a branch of the Nebraska Homeowners Bank, a 76 gas station, a Rexall drug, and the National Farmstead and Hardware Supply, which was the only business in town which looked halfway prosperous. And, near the end of the main drag, set off a little way from the other buildings like a pariah and resting on the edge of the big empty, you had your basic roadhouse, the Red Wheel. If you had gotten that far, you would have seen in the pothole dirt parking lot an aging 1968 Cadillac convertible with double CB antennas on the back. The vanity plate on the front read simply Ben's Caddy, and inside, walking toward the bar, you would have found your man, lanky, sunburned, dressed in a chambray shirt, faded jeans and a pair of scuffed engineer boots. There were faint squint lines around the corners of his eyes, but nowhere else. He looked perhaps ten years younger than his actual age, which was thirty-eight. "'Hello, Mr. Hanscom,' Ricky Lee said, putting a paper napkin on the bar as Ben sat down. Ricky Lee sounded a trifle surprised, and he was. He'd never seen Hanscom in the wheel on a weeknight before. He came in regularly every Friday night for two beers and every Saturday night for four or five. He always asked after Ricky Lee's three boys. He always left the same five-dollar tip under his beer stein when he took off. In terms of both professional conversation and personal regard, he was far away Ricky Lee's favorite customer. The ten dollars a week and the fifty left under the stein at each Christmas time over the last five years was fine enough, but the man's company was worth far more. Worthwhile company was always a rarity, but in a hockey talk like this, where talk always came cheap, it was scarcer than hands' teeth. Although Hanscom's roots were in New England and he had gone to college in California, there was more than a touch of the extravagant Texan about him. Ricky Lee counted on Ben Hanscom's Friday-Saturday night stops because he'd learned over the years that he could count on them. Mr. Hanscom might be building a skyscraper in New York where he already had three of the most talked-about buildings in the city, a new art gallery in Redondo Beach or a business building in Salt Lake City, but come Friday night the door leading to the parking lot would open sometime between 8 o'clock and 9.30, and in he would stroll, as if he lived no farther than the other side of town and had decided to drop in because there was nothing good on TV. He had his own Learjet and a private landing strip on his farm in Junkins. Two years ago he had been in London, first designing and then overseeing the construction of the new BBC communication centre, a building that was still hotly debated pro and con in the British press, The Guardian, perhaps the most beautiful building to be constructed in London over the last twenty years, The Mirror, other than the face of my mother-in-law after a pub crawl, the ugliest thing I've ever seen. When Mr. Hanscom took that job, Ricky Lee had thought, well... I'll see him again sometime, or maybe he'll just forget all about us. Then, indeed, the Friday night after Ben Hanscom left for England had come and gone with no sign of him. Although Ricky Lee found himself looking up quickly every time the door opened between 8 and 9.30. Well, I'll see him again sometime, maybe. Sometime turned out to be the next night. The door had opened at quarter past nine, and in he had ambled, wearing jeans and a gold Bama T-shirt, and his old engineer boots, looking like he'd come from no farther away than cross town. And when Ricky Lee cried almost joyfully, Hey, Mr. Hanscom, Christ, what are you doing here? Mr. Hanscom had looked mildly surprised, as if there was nothing in the least unusual about his being here. Nor had that been a one-shot. He'd showed up every Saturday during the two-year course of his active involvement in the BBC job. He left London each Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on the Concord, he told a fascinated Ricky Lee, had arrived at Kennedy in New York at 10.15 a.m., 45 minutes before he left London, at least by the clock. God, it's like time travel, ain't it? An impressed Ricky Lee had said. 
A limousine was standing by to take him over to Teterboro Airport in New Jersey, a trip which usually took no more than an hour on Saturday morning. He could be in the cockpit of his Lear before noon with no trouble at all and touching down in Junkins by 2.30. If you head west fast enough, he told Ricky, the day just seems to go on forever. He would take a two-hour nap, spend an hour with his foreman and half an hour with his secretary. He would eat supper and then come on over to the Red Wheel for an hour and a half or so. He always came in alone, he always sat at the bar, and he always left the way he'd come in, although God knew there were plenty of women in this part of Nebraska, would have been happy to screw the socks off him. Back at the farm he would catch six hours sleep and then the whole process would reverse itself. Ricky had never had a customer who failed to be impressed with this story. Maybe he's gay, a woman had told him once. Ricky Lee glanced at her briefly, taking in the carefully styled hair, the carefully tailored clothes, which undoubtedly had designer labels, the diamond chips at her ears, the look in her eyes, and knew she was from somewhere back east, probably New York, out here on a brief duty visit to a relative or maybe an old school chum, and couldn't wait to get out again. Now, he had replied, Mr. Hanscom ain't no sissy. She had taken a pack of Doral cigarettes from her purse and held one between her red, glistening lips until he lit it for her. How do you know? she had asked, smiling little. I just do, he said. And he did. He thought of saying to her, I think he's the most god-awful lonely man I ever met in my life, but he wasn't going to say any such thing to this New York woman who was looking at him like he was some new and amusing type of life. Tonight Mr. Hanscom looked a little pale, a little distracted. Hello, Ricky Lee, he said, sitting down, and then fell to studying his hands. Ricky Lee knew he was slated to spend the next six or eight months in Colorado Springs, overseeing the start of the Mountain States Cultural Center, a sprawling six-building complex which would be cut into the side of a mountain. When it's done, people are going to say it looks like a giant kid left his toy blocks all over a flight of stairs, Ben had told Ricky Lee. Some will, anyway, and they'll be at least half right. But I think it's going to work. It's the biggest thing I've ever tried, and putting it up is going to be scary as hell, but I think it's going to work. Ricky Lee supposed it was possible that Mr. Hanscom had a little touch of stage fright. Nothing surprising about that, and nothing wrong about it, either. When you got big enough to be noticed, you got big enough to come gunning for. Or maybe just that a touch of the bug. It was a hell of a lively one going around. Ricky Lee got a beer stein from the back bar and reached for the Olympia tap. Uh, don't do that, Ricky Lee. Ricky Lee turned back, surprised. And when Ben Hanscom looked up from his hands, he was suddenly frightened. Because Mr. Hanscom didn't look like he had stage fright, with a virus that was going around or anything like that. He looked like he'd just taken a terrible blow and was still trying to understand whatever it was that had hit him. Someone died. He ain't married, but every man's got a family, and someone in his just bit the dust. That's what happened. Just as sure as shit rolls downhill from a privy. Someone dropped a quarter into the jukebox, and Barbara Mandrell started to sing about a drunk man and a lonely woman. Ye, you okay, Mr. Hanscom? Ben Hanscom looked at Ricky Lee out of eyes that suddenly looked tan, no, twenty years older than the rest of his face. And Ricky Lee was astonished to observe that Mr. Hanscom's hair was graying. He'd never noticed any gray in his hair before. Hanscom smiled. The smile was ghastly, horrible. It was like watching a corpse smile. Uh, I don't think I am, Ricky Lee. No, sir, not tonight. Not at all. Ricky Lee set the stein down and walked back over to where Hanscom sat. The bar was as empty as a Monday night bar far outside of football season can get. There were fewer than twenty paying customers in the place. Annie was sitting by the door into the kitchen, playing cribbage with the short order cook. Bad news, Mr. Hanscom? Bad news, that's right. Bad news from home. He looked at Ricky Lee. He looked through Ricky Lee. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Hanscom. Thank you, Ricky Lee. He fell silent, and Ricky Lee was about to ask him if there was anything he could do when Hanscom said, What's your bore whiskey, Ricky Lee? Huh, for everyone else in this dump, it's four roses, Ricky Lee said. But for you, I think it's wild turkey. 
Hanscom smiled a little at that. That's good of you, Ricky Lee. I think you better grab that stein after all. What you do is fill it up with wild turkey. F fill it? Ricky Lee asked, frankly astonished. Christ, ah, have to roll you out of here. Or call an ambulance, he thought. Not tonight, Hanscom said. I don't think so. Ricky Lee looked carefully into Mr. Hanscom's eyes to see if he could possibly be joking, and it took less than a second to see that he wasn't. So he got the stein from the back bar and the bottle of wild turkey from one of the shelves below. The neck of the bottle chattered against the rim of the stein as he began to pour. He watched the whiskey gurgle out fascinated in spite of himself. Ricky Lee decided it was more than just a touch of the Texan that Mr. Hanscom had in him, said to be the biggest goddamn shot of whiskey he had ever poured or ever would pour in his life. Call an ambulance, my ass, he drinks this baby and I'll be calling Parker and Waters and Sweet Home for their funeral hack. Nevertheless, he brought it back and set it down in front of Hanscom. Ricky Lee's father had once told him that if a man was in his right mind, you brought him what he paid for, be it piss or poison. Ricky Lee didn't know if that was good advice or bad, but he knew that if you tended bar for a living, it went a fair piece toward saving you from being chomped into gator bait by your own conscience. Hanscom looked at the monster drink thoughtfully for a moment and then asked, What do I owe you for a shot like that, Ricky Lee? Ricky Lee shook his head slowly, eyes still on the stein full of whiskey, not wanting to look up and meet those socketed, staring eyes. No, he said, this one is on the house. Hanscom smiled again, this time more naturally. Why, I thank you, Ricky Lee. Now I'm going to show you something. I learned about in Peru in 1978. I was working with a guy named Frank Billings, understudying with him, I guess you'd say. Frank Billings is the best damned architect in the world, I think. He caught a fever and the doctors injected about a billion different antibiotics into him and not a single one of them touched it. He burned for two weeks and then he died. What I'm going to show you, I learned from the Indians who worked on the project. The local pop skull is pretty potent. It take a slug and you think it's going down pretty mellow, no problem, and then all at once, it's like someone lit a blowtorch in your mouth and aimed it down your throat. But the Indians drink it like Coca-Cola, and I rarely saw one drunk, and I never saw one with a hangover. Never had the sack to try it their way myself. But I think I'll give it a go tonight. Bring me some of those lemon wedges there. Ricky Lee brought him four and laid them out neatly on a fresh napkin next to the stein of whiskey. Hanscom picked one of them up, tilted his head back like a man about to administer eye drops to himself, and then began to squeeze raw lemon juice into his right nostril. Holy Jesus, Ricky Lee cried, horrified. Hanscom's throat worked. His face flushed. And then Ricky Lee saw tears running down the flat planes of his face toward his ears. Now the spinners were on the juke, singing but the rubber band man. Oh Lord, I just don't know how much of this I can stand, the spinners sang. Hanscom groped blindly on the bower, found another slice of lemon and squeezed the juice into his other nostril. You could have fucking kill yourself, Ricky Lee whispered. Hanscom tossed both of the wrung out lemon wedges onto the bore. His eyes were fiery red and he was breathing and hitching, wincing gasps. Clear lemon juice dripped from both of his nostrils and trickled down to the corners of his mouth. He groped for the stein, raised it, and drank a third of it. Frozen, Ricky Lee watched his Adam's apple go up and down. Hanscom set the stein aside, shuddered twice, then nodded. He looked at Ricky Lee and smiled a little. His eyes were no longer red. Works about like they said it did. You are so fucking concerned about your nose that you never feel what's going down your throat at all. You're crazy, Mr. Hanscom, Ricky Lee said. You bet you fur, Mr. Hanscom said. You remember that one, Ricky Lee? We used to say that when we were kids, you bet your fur. Did I ever tell you I used to be fat? No, sir, you never did, Ricky Lee whispered. He was now convinced that Mr. Hanscom had received some intelligence so dreadful that the man really had gone crazy, or at least taken temporary leave of his senses. I was a regular butter bowl. Never played baseball or basketball, always got caught first when we played tag. Couldn't keep out of my own way. I was fat, all right. 
And there were these fellas in my hometown he used to take after me pretty regularly. There was a fella named Reginald Huckins, only everyone called him Belch. The kid named Victor Chris, a few other guys. But the real brains of the combination was a fellow named Henry Bowers. If there has ever been a genuinely evil kid straining across the skin of the world, Ricky Lee, Henry Bowers was that kid. I wasn't the only kid he used to take after. My problem was I couldn't run as fast as some of the others. Hanscom unbuttoned his shirt and opened it. Leaning forward, Ricky Lee saw a funny twisted scar on Mr. Hanscom's stomach, just above his navel. Puckered, white, and old. It was a letter he saw. Someone had carved the letter H into the man's stomach, probably long before Mr. Hanscom had been a man. Henry Bowers did that to me. About a thousand years ago. I'm lucky I'm not wearing his whole damned name down there. Oh, Mr. Hanscom. Hanscom took the other two lemon slices, one in each hand, tilted his head back, and took them like nose drops. He shuddered rackingly, put them aside, and took two big swallows from the stein. He shuddered again, took another gulp, and then groped for the padded edge of the bar with his eyes closed. For a moment he held on like a man on a sailboat clinging to the rail for support in the heavy sea. Then he opened his eyes again and smiled at Ricky Lay. Ah, I could ride this bull all night, he said. Mr. Hascom, I wish you wouldn't do that any more, Ricky Lee said nervously. Annie came over to the waitress's stand with her tray and called for a couple of millers. Ricky Lee drew them and took them down to her. His legs felt rubbery. Is Mr. Hatscombe all right, Ricky Lee? Annie asked. She was looking past Ricky Lee and he turned to follow her gaze. Mr. Hanscombe was leaning over the bar, carefully picking lemon slices out of the caddy, where Ricky Lee kept the drink garnishes. Well, I don't know, he said. I don't think so. Would get your thumb out of your ass and do something about it. Annie was, like most other women, partial to Ben Hanscom. Well, I don't know. My daddy always said that if a man's in his right mind, you daddy didn't have the brains God gave a gopher, Annie said. Never mind you daddy. You had to put a stop to that, Ricky Lee's gonna kill himself. Thus, given his marching orders, Ricky Lee went back down to where Ben Hanscom sat. Mr. Hanscom, I really think you've had in... Hanscom tilted his head back squeezed, actually sniffed the lemon juice back this time as if it were cocaine. He gulped whiskies as if it were water. He looked at Ricky Lee solemnly. Bing, bang, I saw the whole gang dancing on my living room rug, he said, and laughed. There was maybe two inches of whiskey left in the stein. That is enough, Ricky Lee said and reached for the stein. Hanska moved it gently out of his reach. Damage has been done, Ricky Lee, he said. The damage has been done, boy. Mr. Hanscom, please. I've got something for your kids, Ricky Lee. Damn if I didn't almost forget. He was wearing faded denim vest, and now he reached something out of one of its pockets. Ricky Lee heard a muted clink. My dad died when I was four, Hanscom said. There was no slur at all in his voice. Left us a bunch of debts and... These. I want your kiddos to have them, Ricky Lee. He put three cartwheel silver dollars on the bore, where they gleamed under the soft lights. Ricky Lee caught his breath. Mr. Hatscombe, that's very kind, but I couldn't. There used to be four, but I gave one of them to Stuttering Bill and the others. Bill Denbro, that was his real name. Stuttering Bill's just what we used to call them. Just a thing we used to say, like... You bet your fur. He's one of the best friends I ever had. I did have a few, you know. Even a fat kid like me had a few. Stuttering Bill's a rider now. Ricky Lee barely heard him. He was looking at the cartwheels, fascinated. 1921, 1923, and 1924. God knew what they were worth now, just in terms of the pure silver they contained. Ah, 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 I couldn't, he said again. But I insist. Mr. Hanscom took hold of the stein and drained it. He should have been flat on his keister, but his eyes never left Ricky Lee's. Those eyes were watery and very bloodshot, but Ricky Lee would have sworn on a stack of Bibles that they were also the eyes of a sober man. You're scaring me a little, Mr. Hanscom, 
Ricky Lee said. Two years ago, Gresham Arnold, a rum-dum of some local repute, had come into the red wheel with a roll of quarters in his hand and a $20 bill stuck into the band of his hat. He handed the roll to Annie with instructions to feed the quarters into the jukebox by fours. He put the 20 on the bore and instructed Ricky Lee to set up drinks for the house. This rum-dum, this Gresham Arnold, had long ago been a star basketball player for the Hemingford Rams, leading them to their first and most likely last high school team championship. The 1961 that had been. An almost unlimited future seemed to lie ahead of the young man, but he'd flunked out of LSU his first semester, a victim of drink, drugs, and all-night parties. He came home, cracked up the yellow convertible his folks had given him as a graduation present, and got a job as head salesman in his daddy's John Deere dealership. Five years passed. His father could not bear to fire him, and so he finally sold the dealership and retired to Arizona, a man haunted and made old before his time, by the inexplicable and apparently irreversible degeneration of his son. While the dealership still belonged to his daddy and he was at least pretending to work, Arnold had made some effort to keep the booze at arm's length. Afterward, it got him completely. He could get mean, but he'd been just as sweet as whorehound candy the night he brought in the quarters and set up drinks for the house, and everyone had thanked him kindly, and Annie kept playing Mo Bandy songs because Gresham Arnold liked old Mo Bandy. He sat there at the bar, on the very stool where Mr. Hanscom was sitting now, Ricky Lee realized with steadily deepening unease, and drank three or four bourbon and bitters, and sang along with the juke, and caused no trouble and went home when Ricky Lee closed the wheel up and hanged himself with his belt in an upstairs closet. Gresham Arnold's eyes that night had looked a little bit like Ben Hanscom's eyes looked right now. Scaring you a bit, am I? Hanscom asked, his eyes never leaving Ricky Lee's. He pushed the stein away and then folded his hands neatly in front of those three silver cartwheels. I probably am. But you're not as scared as I am, Ricky Lee. Pray to Jesus, you never are. Well, what's the matter? Ricky Lee asked. M maybe, he wet his lips, maybe I can give you a help. The, the, Ackner. Ben Hanscom laughed. Why, uh, not too much. They had a call from an old friend tonight, guy named Mike Hanlon. I'd forgotten all about him, Ricky Lee, but that didn't scare me much. After all, I was just a kid when I knew him, and... Kids forget things, don't they? Sure they do. You bet your fur. What scared me was getting about halfway over here and realizing that it wasn't just Mike I'd forgotten about. I'd forgotten everything about being a cat. Ricky Lee only looked at him. He had no idea what Mr. Hanscom was talking about, but the man was scared all right, no question about that. It sat funny on Ben Hanscom, but it was real. I mean, I'd forgotten all about it, he said, and wrapped his knuckles lightly on the bar for emphasis. Did you ever hear, Ricky Lee, of having an amnesia so complete you didn't even know you had amnesia? Ricky Lee shook his head. Me either. Well, there I was, tooling along in the caddy tonight, and all of a sudden it hit me. I remembered Mike Hanlon, but only because he called me on the phone. I remembered Derry, but only because that was where he was calling from. Derry? But that was all. It hit me that I hadn't even thought about being a kid since... So since I don't even know when. And then, just like that, it all started to flood back in. Like what we did with the fourth silver dollar. What did you do with it, Mr. Hanscom? Hanscom looked at his watch and suddenly slipped down from his stool. He staggered a bit, the slightest bit. That was all. Can't let the time get away from me, he said. Now I'm flying tonight. Ricky Lee looked instantly alarmed and Hanscom laughed. Flying but not driving the plane, not this time. United Airlines, Ricky Lee. Oh, he supposed his relief showed on his face, but he didn't care. Where are you going? Hanscom's shirt was still open. He looked thoughtfully down at the puckered white lines of the old scar in his belly and then began to button the shirt over it. Thought I told you that, Ricky Lee. Home. I'm going home. Give those cartwheels to your kids. 
He started toward the door, and something about the way he walked, even the way he hitched at the sides of his pants, terrified Ricky Lee. The resemblance to the late and mostly unlamented Gresham Arnold was suddenly so acute it was nearly like seeing a ghost. Mr. Hanscom, he cried in alarm. Hanscom turned back, and Ricky Lee stepped quickly backward. His ass hit the back bar and glass where it gossiped briefly as the bottles knocked together. He stepped back because he was suddenly convinced that Ben Hanscom was dead. Yes, Ben Hanscom was lying dead someplace in a ditch or an attic or possibly in a closet with a belt noosed around his neck and the toes of his four-inch dollar cowboy boots dangling an inch or two above the floor. And this thing standing near the duke and staring back at him was a ghost. For a moment, just a moment, but it was plenty long enough to cover his working heart with a rhyme of ice. He was convinced he could see tables and chairs right through the man. What is it, Ricky Lee? Mm, not, no, nothing. Ben Hanscom looked out at Ricky Lee, from eyes which had dark purple crescents beneath them. His cheeks burned with liquor, his nose looked red and sore. Nothing? Ricky Lee whispered again. But he couldn't take his eyes from that face, the face of a man who has died deep in sin and now stands hard by hell's smoking side door. I was fat and we were poor, Ben Hanscom said. I remember that now. And I remember that either a girl named Beverly or Stuttering Bill saved my life with a silver dollar. I'm scared almost insane by whatever else I may remember before tonight's over, but how scared I am doesn't matter because it's going to come anywhere. It's all there like a great big bubble that's growing in my mind. But I'm going, because all I've ever gotten and all I have now is somehow due to what we did then, and you pay for what you get in this world. Maybe that's why God made us kids first and built us close to the ground, because he knows you got to fall down a lot and bleed a lot before you learn that one simple lesson. You pay for what you get. You own what you pay for. And sooner or later, whatever you own comes back home to you. You gonna be back this weekend, though, ain't you? Ricky Lee asked through numbed lips. In his increasing distress, this was all he could find to hold on to. You you're gonna be back this weekend as I go always, ain't you? I don't know, Mr. Hanscom said and smiled a terrible smile. I'm going a lot farther than London this time, Ricky Lee. <laughs> Mr. Hatscombe, you give those cartwheels to you kids, he repeated, and slipped out into the night. What the blue hell? Annie asked, but Ricky Lee ignored her. He flipped up the bar's partition and ran over to one of the windows which looked out on the parking lot. He saw the headlights of Mr. Hanscom's caddy come on, heard the engine rev. It pulled out of the dirt lot, kicking up a rooster tail of dust behind it. The tail lights dwindled away to red points down Highway 63, and then the Nebraska night wind began to pull the hanging dust apart. He took on a box car full of booze, and you let him get in that big car of his and drive away, Annie said. Way to go, Ricky Lee. Never mind. He's going to kill himself. And all this had been Ricky Lee's own thought less than five minutes ago. He turned to her when the taillights winked out of sight and shook his head. I don't think so, he said. Although the way he looked tonight, it might be better for him if he did. What did he say to you? He shook his head. It was all confused in his mind and the sum total of it seemed to mean nothing. It doesn't matter. But I don't think we're ever going to see that old boy again. 4. Eddie Kasprak Takes His Medicine If you would know all there is to know about an American man or woman, of the middle class as the millennium nears its end, you would need only to look in his or her medicine cabinet, or so it has been said. But dear Lord, get a look into this one as Eddie Kasbrack slides it open, mercifully sliding aside his white face and wide staring eyes. 
On the top shelf there's anisin, excedrin, excedrin, PM, contact, jellyacil, Tylenol, and a large blue jar of fix. Looking like a bit of brooding deep twilight under glass. There's a bottle of Fiverrin, a bottle of Seriotan, that's nature's spell backwards, the ads on Lawrence Welk used to say when Eddie Kasprak was but a wee slip of a lad, and two bottles of Phillips Milk of Magnesia, the regular which tastes like liquid chalk, and the new mint flavor which tastes like mint-flavored liquid chalk. Here is a large bottle of Rolaid standing chummily close to a large bottle of Tums. The Tums are standing next to a large bottle of orange-flavored Dijol tablets, the three of them look like a trio of strange piggy banks stuffed with pills instead of dimes. Second shelf and dig the vites. You got your E, your C, your C with rose hips. You got B simple and B complex and B12. There's L lysine which is supposed to do something about those embarrassing skin problems and lecithin which is supposed to do something about that embarrassing cholesterol buildup in and around the big pump. There's iron, calcium and cod liver oil. There's one a day multiples, Maya deck multiples, Centrum multiples, and sitting up on top of the cabinet itself is a gigantic bottle of Geritol, just for good measure. Moving right along to Eddie's third shelf, we find the utility infielders of the patent medicine world. X-Lax, Carter's little pills. Those two keep Eddie Kasprak moving the mail. Here nearby is Kaopectate, Pepto-Bismol, and Preparation H, in case the mail moves too fast or too painfully. Also some tucks in a screw top jar just to keep everything tidy after the mail has gone through, uh, be it just an advertising circular or two addressed to occupant or a big old special delivery package. Here is formula 44 for coughs, NyQuil and Dristan for colds and a big bottle of castor oil. There's a tin of sucrets in case Eddie's throat gets sore, and there's a quartet of mouthwashes, chloroseptic, sepacol, sepastat in the spray bottle, and of course good old Listerine. Often imitated but never duplicated. Visine and murine for the eyes, cord aid and neosporin ointment for the skin, the second light of defense if the L lysine doesn't live up to expectations, a tube of Oxy 5 and a plastic bottle of Oxy Wash, because Eddie would definitely rather have a few less scents than a few more zits, and some tetracycline pills. And off to one side, clustered like bitter conspirators, are three bottles of cold tar shampoo. The bottom shelf is almost deserted, but the stuff which is here means serious business. You could cruise on this stuff, okay? On this stuff you could fly higher than Ben Hanscom's jet and crash harder than Thurman Munson's. There's Valium, Precadam, Elleville, and Darvon Complex. There is also another secrets box on this low shelf, but there are no secrets in it. If you open that one you would find six quaaludes. Eddie Kasprak believed in the Boy Scout motto. He was swinging a blue tote bag as he came into the bathroom. He set it on the sink unzipped it and then, with trembling hands he began to spill bottles and jars and tubes and squeeze bottles and spray bottles into it. Under other circumstances he would have taken them out handful by careful handful. There was no time for such niceties now. The choice as Eddie saw it was as simple as it was brutal. Get moving and keep moving, or stand in one place long enough to start thinking about what all of this meant and simply die of fright. Eddie, Myra called up from downstairs. Eddie, what are you doing? Eddie dropped the secrets box containing the lewds into the bag. The medicine cabinet was now entirely empty, except for Myra's Midol and a small, almost used up tube of Blistex. He paused for a moment and then grabbed the Blistex. He started to zip the bag closed, debated, and then threw in the Midol as well. She could always buy more. Eddie, from halfway up the stairs now. Eddie zipped the bag the rest of the way closed and then left the bathroom swinging it by his side. He was a short man with a timid, rabbity sort of face. Much of his hair was gone. What was left grew in listless, piebald patches. The weight of the bag pulled him noticeably to one side. An extremely large woman was climbing slowly to the second floor. Eddie could hear the stairs creak protestingly under her, what are you doing? Eddie did not need a shrink to tell him that he had, in a sense, married his mother. Myra Kasbrack was huge. She'd only been big when Eddie married her five years ago, but he sometimes thought his subconscious had seen the potential for hugeness in her. 
God knew his own mother had been a whopper, and she looked somehow more huge than ever as she reached the second floor landing. She was wearing a white nightgown which swelled, combo-like, at bosom and hip. Her face, devoid of makeup, was white and shiny. She looked badly frightened. I have to go away for a while, Eddie said. What do you mean you have to go away? What was that telephone call? Nothing, he said, fleeing abruptly down the hallway to their walk-in closet. He put the tote bag down, opened the closet's fold-back door, and raked aside the half-dozen identical black suits which hung there, as conspicuous as a thundercloud among the other more brightly colored clothes. He always wore one of the black suits when he was working. He bent into the closet smelling mothballs and wool, and pulled out one of the suitcases from the back. He opened it and began throwing clothes in. Her shadow fell over him. What's this about, Eddie? Where are you going? You tell me. I can't tell you. She stood there watching him, trying to decide what to say next or what to do. The thought of simply bundling him into the closet and then standing with her back against the door until this madness had passed crossed her mind, but she was unable to bring herself to do it, although she certainly could have. She was three inches taller than Eddie and outweighed him by a hundred pounds. She couldn't think of what to do or say, because this was so utterly unlike him. She could not have been any more dismayed and frightened if she had walked into the television room and found their new big-screen TV floating in the air. You can't go, she heard herself saying. You promised you'd get me Al Pacino's autograph. It was an absurdity, God know it was. But at this point even an absurdity was better than nothing. You'll still get it, Eddie said. You'll have to drive him yourself. Ugh, he was a new terror to join those already circling in her poor dazzled head. She uttered a small scream. I can't, I never. You'll have to, he said. He was examining his shoes now. There's no one else. Neither of my uniforms fit me more. They're too tight, Latets. Have Dolores let one of them out, he said implacably. He threw two pairs of shoes back, found an empty shoebox, and popped the third pair into it. Good black shoes, plenty of use left in them still, but looking just a bit too worn to wear in the job. When you drove rich people around New York for a living, many of them famous rich people, everything had to look just right. These shoes no longer looked just right. But he supposed they would do for where he was going, and for whatever he might have to do when he got there. Maybe Richie Tozier would. But then the blackness threatened, and he felt his throat beginning to close up. And he realized with real panic that he had packed the whole damned drugstore and had left the most important thing of all, his aspirator, downstairs on top of the stereo cabinet. He banged the suitcase closed and latched it. He looked around at Myra, who was standing there in the hallway with her hand pressed against the short, thick column of her neck, as if she were the one with the asthma. She was staring at him, her face full of perplexity and terror. Then he might have felt sorry for her, if his heart had not already been so filled with terror for himself. What's happened, Eddie? Who was that on the telephone? Are you in trouble? You are, aren't you? What kind of trouble are you in? He walked toward her zipper bag in one hand and suitcase in the other, standing more or less straight now that he was more evenly weighted. She moved in front of him, blocking off the stairway, and at first he thought she would not give way. Then, when his face was about to crash into the soft roadblock of her breasts, she did give way, fearfully. As he walked past, never slowing, she burst into miserable tears. <sighs> I can't drive out, but see now, she bawled. I'll smash into a stop sign as softly I know I will. <laughs> Eddie, I'm scared. He looked at the Seth Thomas clock on the table by the stairs, twenty past nine. The can sounding Delta clerk had told him he'd already missed the last flight north to Maine. That one had left LaGuardia at eight twenty five. He had called Amtrak and discovered there was a late train to Boston departing Penn Station at 11.30. It would drop him off at South Station where he could take a cab to the offices of Cape Cod Limousine on Arlington Street. Cape Cod and Eddie's company, Royal Crest, had worked out a useful and friendly reciprocal arrangement over the years. A quick call to Butch Carrington in Boston had taken care of his transportation north. Butch said he would have a Cadillac limo gassed and ready for him. So he would go in style and with no pain in the S. clients sitting in the back seat, 
stick in the air up with a big cigar and asking if Eddie knew where he could score a broad or a few grams of coke or both. Go on in style, all right, he thought. Only way you could go in more style would be if you were going in a hearse. But don't worry, Eddie. That's probably how you'll come back. If there's enough of you left to pick up, that is. Eddie? 920. Plenty of time to talk to her, plenty of time to be kind. Ah, but it would have been so much better if this had been her whist tonight. If he could have just slipped out, leaving a note under one of the magnets on the refrigerator door. The refrigerator door was where he left all his notes for Myra, because there she'd never missed them. Leaving that way, like a fugitive, would not have been good. But this was even worse. This is like having to leave home all over again. And that had been so hard he'd had to do it three times. Sometimes home is where the heart is, Eddie thought randomly. I believe that. Old Bobby Frost said home's the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Unfortunately, it's also the place where, once you're in there, they don't ever want to let you out. He stood at the head of the stairs, forward motion temporarily spent, filled with fear, breath wheezing noisily in and out of the pinhole his throat had become, and regarded his weeping wife. Come on downstairs with me and I'll tell you what I can, he said. Eddie put his two bags, clothes in one, medicine in the other, by the door in the front hall. He remembered something else then, or rather the ghost of his mother, who'd been dead many years but who still spoke frequently in his mind, remembered for him. You know when your feet get wet you always get a cold, Eddie. You're not like other people. You have a very weak system. You have to be careful. That's why you must always wear your rubbers when it rains. It rained a lot in Derry. Eddie opened the front hall closet, got his rubbers off the hook where they hung neatly in a plastic bag, and put them in his clothes suitcase. That's a good boy, Eddie. He and Myra had been watching TV when the shit hit the fan. Eddie went into the television room and pushed the button which lowered the screen of the mural vision TV. Its screen was so big that it made Freeman McNeil look like a visitor from Brobdingnag on Sunday afternoons. He picked up the telephone and called a taxi. The dispatcher told him it would probably be 15 minutes. Eddie said that was no problem. He hung up and grabbed his aspirator off the top of their expensive Sony compact disc player. I spent 1500 bucks on a steady-the-art sound system so that Myra would miss a single golden note on her Barry Manilow records and her Supreme's greatest hits, he thought, and then felt a flush of guilt. That wasn't fair, and he damn well knew it. Myra would have been just as happy with her old scratchy records as she was with the new 45 RPM-sized laser discs, just as she would have been happy to keep on living in the little four-room house in Queens until they were both old and grey, and, if the truth were told, there was a little snow on Eddie Kasprak's mountain already. He had bought the luxury sound system for the same reasons that he had bought this low field stone house on Long Island, where the two of them often rattle around like the last two peas in a can, because he'd been able to, and because they were ways of appeasing the soft, frightened, often bewildered, always implacable voice of his mother. They were ways of saying, I made it, Ma. Look at all this. I made it. Now will you please, for Christ's sake, shut up a while? Eddie stuffed the aspirator into his mouth and, like a man miming suicide, pulled the trigger. A cloud of awful licorice taste roiled and boiled its way down his throat, and Eddie breathed deeply. He could feel breathing passages which had almost closed start to open up again. The tightness in his chest started to ease, and suddenly he heard voices in his mind, ghost voices. Didn't you get the note I sent you? By God it, Mrs. Kasprek, but well, in case you can't read Coach Black, let me tell you in person. Are you ready? Mrs. Kasprek, good. Here it comes, from my lips to your ears. Ready? My Eddie cannot take physical education. I repeat, he cannot take phys ed. Eddie is very delicate, and if he runs or jumps, Mrs. Kasprek, I have the results of Eddie's last physical on file in my office. That's a state requirement. It says that Eddie is a little small for his age, but otherwise, he's absolutely normal.
So I called your family physician just to be sure and he confirmed, Are you saying I'm a liar, Coach Black? Is that it? Well, here he is. Here's Eddie, standing right beside me. Can you hear the way he's breathing? Can you? Ma, please. I'm all right, Eddie. You know better than that. I taught you better than that. Don't interrupt your elders. I hear him, Mrs. Casbrack, but do you? Good. I thought maybe you were deaf. He sounds like a truck going uphill in low gear, doesn't he? And if that is an asthma, ma, I'll be, be quiet, Eddie. Don't interrupt me again. If that is an asthma, Coach Black, that I'm Queen Elizabeth. Mrs. Casbrack, Eddie often seems very well and happy in his physical education classes. He loves to play games. And he runs quite fast in my conversation with Dr. Baines, the word psychosomatic came up. I wonder if you've considered the possibility that, that my son is crazy? Is that what you're trying to say? Are you trying to say that my son is crazy? No, but he's delicate, Mrs. Casbrack. My son is very delicate. Mrs. Casbrack, Dr. Baines confirmed that he can find nothing at all physically wrong. Eddie finished. The memory of that humiliating encounter, his mother screaming at Coach Black in the Derry Elementary School gymnasium, while he gasped and cringed at her side and the other kids huddled around one of the baskets and watched, had recurred to him tonight for the first time in years. Nor was that the only memory which Mike Hanlon's call was going to bring back, he knew. He could feel many others as bad or even worse crowding and jostling like sail-mad shoppers bottlenecked in a department store doorway. But soon the bottleneck would break, and they would be along. He was quite sure of that. And what would they find on sale? His sanity? Could be. Half price, smoke and water damage, everything must go. Nothing physically wrong, he repeated took a deep, shuddery breath and stuffed the aspirator into his pocket. Eddie, Myra said, please tell me what all of this is about. Tear tracks shone on her chubby cheeks. Her hands twisted restlessly together like a pair of pink and hairless animals at play. Once, shortly before actually proposing marriage, he'd taken a picture of Myra, which she had given him and had put it next to one of his mother, who had died of congestive heart failure at the age of 64. At the time of her death, Eddie's mother had topped the scales at over 400 pounds, 406 to be exact. She'd become something nearly monstrous by then. Her body had seemed nothing more than boobs and butt and belly, all overtopped by her pasty, perpetually dismayed face. But the picture of her, which he put next to Myra's picture, had been taken in 1944, two years before he had been born. He were a very sickly baby, the ghost mom now whispered in his ear. Many times we despaired of your life. In 1944, his mother had been a relatively svelte 180 pounds. He'd made that comparison, he supposed, in a last-ditch effort to stop himself from committing psychological incest. He looked from mother to my... Four. Eddie Casbrack takes his medicine. If you would know all there is to know about an American man or woman, of the middle class as the millennium nears its end, you would need only to look in his or her medicine cabinet, or so it has been said. But dear Lord, get a look into this one as Eddie Casbrack slides it open, mercifully sliding aside his white face and wide staring eyes. On the top shelf there's anison, excedrin, excedrin, p.m., contact, jellyacil, tylenol, in a large blue jar of fix, looking like a bit of brooding deep twilight onto glass. There is a bottle of fiverin, a bottle of seriotan, that's nature's spelled backwards, the ads on Lawrence Welk used to say when Eddie Casbrack was but a wee slip of a lad, and two bottles of Philip's Milk of Magnesia, the regular, which tastes like liquid chalk, and the new mint flavor, which tastes like mint-flavored liquid chalk. Here is a large bottle of Rolade standing chummily close to a large bottle of Tums. The Tums are standing next to a large bottle of orange-flavored Digel tablets. The three of them look like a trio of strange piggy banks stuffed with pills instead of dimes. Second shelf and dig the vites. You get your E, you see, you see with rose hips. 
you got B simple and B complex and B12. There's L lysine, which is supposed to do something about those embarrassing skin problems, and lecithin, which is supposed to do something about that embarrassing cholesterol buildup in and around the big pump. There's iron, calcium, and cod liver oil. There's one a day multiples, myodec multiples, centra multiples, and sitting up on top of the cabinet itself is a gigantic bottle of geritol, just for good measure. Moving right along to Eddie's third shelf, we find the utility infielders of the patent medicine world. X-Lax, Carter's Little Pills. Those two keep Eddie Kasprak moving the mail. Here nearby is Kaopectate, Pepto-Bismol and Preparation H in case the mail moves too fast or too painfully. Also some tucks in a screw-top jar just to keep everything tidy after the mail has gone through. Uh, be it just an advertising circular or two addressed to occupant or a big old special delivery package. Here is Formula 44 for coughs, NyQuil and Justan for colds and a big bottle of castor oil. There's a tin of sucrets in case Eddie's throat gets sore. And there's a quartet of mouthwashes, chloroseptic, sepacol, sepastat in the spray bottle, and of course good old Listerine, often imitated but never duplicated. Visine and murine for the eyes, cordaid and neosporin ointment for the skin, the second line of defense if the L lysine doesn't live up to expectations, a tube of Oxy-5 and a plastic bottle of Oxy-Wash, because Eddie would definitely rather have a few less scents than a few more zits, and some tetracycline pills. And off to one side, clustered like bitter conspirators, are three bottles of cold tar shampoo. The bottom shelf is almost deserted, but the stuff which is here means serious business. You could cruise on this stuff, okay? On this stuff you could fly higher than Ben Hanscom's jet and crash harder than Thurman Munson's. There's Valium, Precodam, Elevil, and Darvon Complex. There is also another secrets box on this low shelf, but there are no secrets in it. If you open that one, you would find six quaaludes. Eddie Kasprak believed in the Boy Scout motto. He was swinging a blue tote bag as he came into the bathroom. He set it on the sink, unzipped it, and then, with trembling hands, he began to spill bottles and jars and tubes and squeeze bottles and spray bottles into it. Under other circumstances, he would have taken them out handful by careful handful, but there was no time for such niceties now. The choice, as Eddie saw it, was as simple as it was brutal. Get moving and keep moving, or stand in one place long enough to start thinking about what all of this meant and simply die of fright. Eddie! Myra called up from downstairs. Eddie! What are you doing? Eddie dropped the secrets box containing the lewds into the bag. The medicine cabinet was now entirely empty, except for Myra's Midol and a small, almost used up tube of Blistex. He paused for a moment and then grabbed the Blistex. He started to zip the bag closed, debated, and then threw in the Midol as well. She could always buy more. Addy! From halfway up the stairs now. Eddie zipped the bag the rest of the way closed and then left the bathroom, swinging it by his side. He was a short man with a timid, ravity sort of face. Much of his hair was gone. What was left grew in listless, piebald patches. The weight of the bag pulled him noticeably to one side. An extremely large woman was climbing slowly to the second floor. Eddie could hear the stairs creak protestingly under her. What are you doing? Eddie did not need a shrink to tell him that he had, in a sense, married his mother. Myra Kasprak was huge. She'd only been big when Eddie married her five years ago, but he sometimes thought his subconscious had seen the potential for hugeness in her. God knew his own mother had been a whopper, and she looked somehow more huge than ever as she reached the second floor landing. She was wearing a white nightgown which swelled, comber-like, at bosom and hip. Her face, devoid of makeup, was white and shiny. She looked badly frightened. I have to go away for a while, Eddie said. What do you mean you have to go away? What was that telephone call? Nothing, he said, fleeing abruptly down the hallway to their walk-in closet. He put the tote bag down, opened the closet's fold-back door, and raked aside the half-dozen identical black suits which hung there, as conspicuous as a thundercloud among the other more brightly colored clothes. He always wore one of the black suits when he was working. He bent into the closet, smelling mothballs and wool, and pulled out one of the suitcases from the back. He opened it, 
and began throwing clothes in. Her shadow fell over him. What's this about, Eddie? Where are you going? You tell me. I can't tell you. She stood there watching him, trying to decide what to say next or what to do. The thought of simply bundling him into the closet and then standing with her back against the door until this madness had passed crossed her mind, but she was unable to bring herself to do it, although she certainly could have. She was three inches taller than Eddie and outweighed him by a hundred pounds. She couldn't think of what to do or say, because this was so utterly unlike him. She could not have been any more dismayed and frightened if she had walked into the television room and found their new big-screen TV floating in the air. She can't go, she heard herself saying. You promised you'd get me Al Pacino's autograph. It was an absurdity, God knows it was. But at this point, even an absurdity was better than nothing. You'll still get it, Eddie said. You'll have to drive him yourself. Ugh, he was a new terror to join those already circling in her poor dazzled head. She uttered a small scream. I can't, I never. You'll have to, he said. He was examining his shoes now. There's no one else. Neither of my uniforms fit me more. They're too tight, Latets. Have Dolores let one of them out, he said implacably. He threw two pairs of shoes back, found an empty shoebox, and popped the third pair into it. Good black shoes, plenty of use left in them still, but looking just a bit too worn to wear in the job. When he drove rich people around New York for a living, many of them famous rich people, everything had to look just right. These shoes no longer looked just right. But he supposed they would do for where he was going, and for whatever he might have to do when he got there. Maybe Richie Tozier would... But then the blackness threatened, and he felt his throat beginning to close up. Eddie realized with real panic that he had packed the whole damned drugstore and had left the most important thing of all, his aspirator, downstairs on top of the stereo cabinet. He banged the suitcase closed and latched it. He looked around at Myra, who was standing there in the hallway with her hand pressed against the short, thick column of her neck, as if she were the one with the asthma. She was staring at him, her face full of perplexity and terror. And he might have felt sorry for her, if his heart had not already been so filled with terror for himself. What's happened, Eddie? Who was that on the telephone? Are you in trouble? You are, aren't you? What kind of trouble are you in? He walked toward her zipper bag in one hand and suitcase in the other, standing more or less straight now that he was more evenly weighted. She moved in front of him, blocking off the stairway, and at first he thought she would not give way. Then, when his face was about to crash into the soft roadblock of her breasts, she did give way, fearfully. As he walked past, never slowing, she burst into miserable tears. <sighs> I can't drive out with see though, she bawled. I'll smash into a stop sign as soft way I know I will. <laughs> Eddie, I'm scared. He looked at the Seth Thomas clock on the table by the stairs, twenty past nine. The can sounding Delta clerk had told him he had already missed the last flight north to Maine. That one had left LaGuardia at eight twenty five. He had called Amtrak and discovered there was a late train to Boston departing Penn Station at 11.30. It would drop him off at South Station where he could take a cab to the offices of Cape Cod Limousine on Arlington Street. Cape Cod and Eddie's company, Royal Crest, had worked out a useful and friendly reciprocal arrangement over the years. A quick call to Butch Carrington in Boston had taken care of his transportation north. Butch said he would have a Cadillac limo gassed and ready for him. So he would go in style. And with no pain in the ass, clients sitting in the back seat, sticking the air up with a big cigar and asking if Eddie knew where he could score a broad or a few grams of coke or both. Go on in style, all right, he thought. Only way you could go in more style would be if you were going in a hearse. But don't worry, Eddie. That's probably how you'll come back. If there's enough of you left to pick up, that is. Eddie? 9.20 Plenty of time to talk to her, plenty of time to be kind. Ah, but it would have been so much better if this had been her whist night. If he could have just slipped out, leaving a note under one of the magnets on the refrigerator door. The refrigerator door was where he left all his notes for Myra, because there she never missed them. Leaving that way, like a fugitive, would not have been good. 
But this was even worse. This is like having to leave home all over again. And that had been so hard he'd had to do it three times. Sometimes home is where the horror is, Eddie thought randomly. I believe that. Old Bobby Frost said home's the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Unfortunately, it's also the place where, once you're in there, they don't ever want to let you out. He stood at the head of the stairs, forward motion temporarily spent, filled with fear, breath wheezing noisily in and out of the pinhole his throat had become, and regarded his weeping wife. Come on downstairs with me and I'll tell you what I can, he said. Eddie put his two bags, clothes in one, medicine in the other, by the door in the front hall. He remembered something else then, or rather the ghost of his mother, who'd been dead many years but who still spoke frequently in his mind, remembered for him. You know when your feet get wet you always get a cold, Eddie. You're not like other people. You have a very weak system. You have to be careful. That's why you must always wear your rubbers when it rains. It rained a lot in Derry. Eddie opened the front hall closet, got his rubbers off the hook where they hung neatly in a plastic bag, and put them in his clothes suitcase. That's a good boy, Eddie. He and Myra had been watching TV when the shit hit the fan. Eddie went into the television room and pushed the button which lowered the screen of the mural vision TV. Its screen was so big that it made Freeman McNeil look like a visitor from Brobdingnag on Sunday afternoons. He picked up the telephone and called a taxi. The dispatcher told him it would probably be 15 minutes. Eddie said that was no problem. He hung up and grabbed his aspirator off the top of their expensive Sony compact disc player. I spent 1500 bucks on a steady-the-art sound system so that Myra would miss a single golden note on her Barry Manilow records and her Supreme's greatest hits, he thought, and then felt a flush of guilt. That wasn't fair, and he damn well knew it. Myra would have been just as happy with her old scratchy records as she was with the new 45 RPM-sized laser discs, just as she would have been happy to keep on living in the little four-room house in Queens until they were both old and grey, and, if the truth were told, there was a little snow on Eddie Kasprak's mountain already. He had bought the luxury sound system for the same reasons that he had bought this low field stone house on Long Island, where the two of them often rattle around like the last two peas in a can, because he'd been able to, and because they were ways of appeasing the soft, frightened, often bewildered, always implacable voice of his mother. They were ways of saying, I made it, Ma. Look at all this, I made it. Now will you please, for Christ's sake, shut up a while? Eddie stuffed the aspirator into his mouth and, like a man miming suicide, pulled the trigger. A cloud of awful licorice taste roiled and boiled its way down his throat, and Eddie breathed deeply. He could feel breathing passages which had almost closed start to open up again. The tightness in his chest started to ease, and suddenly he heard voices in his mind, ghost voices. Didn't you get the note I sent you? By God it, Mrs. Kasprek, but well, in case you can't read Coach Black, let me tell you in person. Are you ready? Mrs. Kasprek, good, here it comes, from my lips to your ears. Ready? My Eddie cannot take physical education. I repeat, he cannot take phys ed. Eddie is very delicate, and if he runs or jumps, Mrs. Kasprek, I have the results of Eddie's last physical on file in my office. That's a state requirement. It says that Eddie is a little small for his age, but otherwise, he's absolutely normal. So I called your family physician just to be sure, and he confirmed, Are you saying I'm a liar, Coach Black? Is that it? Well, here he is. Here's Eddie, standing right beside me. Can you hear the way he's breathing? Can you? Ma, please. I'm all right. Eddie, you know better than that. I taught you better than that. Don't interrupt your elders. I hear him, Mrs. Kasprak, but do you? Good. I thought maybe you were deaf. He sounds like a truck going uphill in low gear, doesn't he? And if that is an asthma, ma. I'll be, be quiet, Eddie, don't interrupt me again. If that is an asthma, Coach Black, then I'm Queen Elizabeth. Mrs. Kasprak, Eddie often seems very well and happy in his physical education classes. He loves to play games, and he runs quite fast. In my conversation with Dr. Baines, the word psychosomatic came up, 
I wonder if you've considered the possibility that that my son is crazy? Is that what you're trying to say? Are you trying to say that my son is crazy? No, but he's delicate, Mrs. Casbrack. My son is very delicate. Mrs. Casbrack, Dr. Baines confirmed that he can find nothing at all physically wrong. Eddie finished. The memory of that humiliating encounter, his mother screaming at Coach Black in the Derry Elementary School gymnasium, while he gasped and cringed at her side and the other kids huddled around one of the baskets and watched, had recurred to him tonight for the first time in years. Nor was that the only memory which Mike Hanlon's call was going to bring back, he knew. He could feel many others as bad or even worse, crowding and jostling like sail-mad shoppers bottlenecked in a department store doorway. But soon the bottleneck would break, and they would be along. He was quite sure of that. And what would they find on sale? His sanity? Could be. Half price, smoke and water damage, everything must go. Nothing physically wrong, he repeated, took a deep shuddery breath and stuffed the aspirator into his pocket. Eddie, Myra said, please tell me what all of this is about. Tear tracks shone on her chubby cheeks. Her hands twisted restlessly together like a pair of pink and hairless animals at play. Once, shortly before actually proposing marriage, he had taken a picture of Myra, which she had given him and had put it next to one of his mother, who had died of congestive heart failure at the age of sixty-four. At the time of her death, Eddie's mother had topped the scales at over four hundred pounds, four hundred and six, to be exact. She had become something nearly monstrous by then. Her body had seemed nothing more than boobs and butt and belly, all overtopped by her pasty, perpetually dismayed face. But the picture of her, which she put next to Myra's picture, had been taken in 1944, two years before he had been born. He were a very sickly baby, the ghost mom now whispered in his ear. Many times we despaired of your life. In 1944, his mother had been a relatively svelte 180 pounds. He had made that comparison, he supposed, in a last-ditch effort to stop himself from committing psychological incest. He looked from mother to Myra and back again to mother. They could have been sisters. The resemblance was that close. Eddie looked at the two nearly identical pictures and promised himself he would not do this crazy thing. He knew that the boys at work were already making jokes about Jack Spratt and his wife, but they didn't know half of it the jokes and snide remarks he could take. But did he really want to be a clown in such a Freudian circus as this? No, he did not. He would break it off with Myra, he would let her down gently because she was really very sweet, and had had even less experience with men than he'd had with women. And then, after she'd finally sailed over the horizon of his life, he could maybe take those tennis lessons he'd been thinking of for such a long time, Eddie often seems very well and happy in his physical education classes. Or there were the pool memberships they were selling at the UN Plaza Hotel. Eddie loves to play games. Not to mention that health club which had opened up on 3rd Avenue across from the garage. Eddie runs quite fast. He runs quite fast when you're not here. Runs quite fast when there's nobody around to remind him of how delicate he is. And I see in his face, Mrs. Casbrack, that he knows even now at the age of nine, he knows that the biggest favor in the world he could do himself would be to run fast in any direction. You're not going to let him go, Mrs. Casbrack. Let him run. But in the end, he'd married Myra anywhere. In the end, the old ways and the old habits had simply been too strong. Home was the place where, when you have to go there, they have to chain you up. Oh, he might have beaten his mother's ghost. It would have been hard, but he was quite sure he could have done that much. If that had been all which needed doing, it was Myra herself who had ended up tipping the scales away from independence. Myra had condemned him with solicitude, had nailed him with concern, had chained him with sweetness. Myra, like his mother, had reached the final, fatal insight into his character. Eddie was all the more delicate because he sometimes suspected he was not delicate at all. 
Eddie needed to be protected from his own dim intimations of possible bravery. On rainy days, Myra always took his rubbers out of the plastic bag in the closet and put them by the coat rack next to the door. Beside his plate of unbuttered wheat toast each morning was a dish of what might have been taken at a casual glance from multicolored pre-sweetened children's cereal, but which a closer look would have revealed to be a whole spectrum of vitamins, most of which Eddie had in his medicine bag right now. Myra, like mother, understood, and there had really been no chance for him. As a young unmarried man, he had left his mother three times and returned home to her three times. Then, four years after his mother had died in the front hall of her queen's apartment, blocking the front door so completely with her bulk that the med queue guys, called by the people downstairs when they heard the monstrous thud of Mrs. Kasprak going down for the final count, had had to break in through the locked door between the apartment's kitchen and service stairwell. He had returned home for a fourth and final time. At least he had believed then it was for the final time. Home again, home again, jiggity-jog. Home again, home again with Myra the hog. A hog she was, but she was a sweet hog, and he loved her, and there had really been no chance for him at all. She had drawn him to her with the fatal hypnotizing snake's eye of understanding. Home again forever, he had thought then. But maybe I was wrong, he thought. Maybe this isn't home, nor ever was. Maybe home is where I have to go tonight. Home is the place where when you go there, you have to finally face the thing in the dark. He shuddered helplessly as if he had gone outside without his rubbers and caught a terrible chill. Eddie, please! She was beginning to weep again. Tears were her final defense, just as they had always been his mother's, the soft weapon which paralyzes, which turns kindness and tenderness into fatal chinks in one's armor. Not that he'd ever worn much armor anyway. Suits of armor did not seem to fit him very well. Tears had been more than a defense for his mother. They had been a weapon. Myra had rarely used her own tears so cynically, but cynically or not he realized she was trying to use them that way now, and she was succeeding. He couldn't let her. It'd be too easy to think of how lonely it was going to be sitting in a seat on that train as it barreled north toward Boston, through the darkness, his suitcase overhead and his tote bag full of nostrums between his feet, the fear sitting on his chest, like a rancid vix pack, too easy to let Myra take him upstairs and make love to him with aspirins and an alcohol rub, and put him to bed, where they might or might not make a franker sort of love. But he had promised. <sighs> promised. Myra, listen to me, he said, making his voice purposely dry, purposely matter-of-fact. She looked at him with her wet, naked, terrified eyes. He thought he would try now to explain as best he could. He would tell her about how Mike Hanlon had called and told him that it had started again, and yes, he thought most of the others were coming. But what came out of his mouth was much saner stuff. Go down to the office first thing in the morning. Talk to Phil. Tell him I had to take off and that you'll drive Pacino. Eddie, I just can't, she wailed. He's a big star. If I get lost, he'll shout at me. I know he will. He'll shout. They all do when the driver gets lost. And, and I'll cry. There could be an accident. There probably will be an accident, Eddie. Eddie, you have to stay home. For God's sake, stop it. She recoiled from his voice. Hurt. Although Eddie gripped his aspirator, he would not use it. She would see that as a weakness. One she could use against him. Dear God, if you are there, please believe me when I say I don't want to hurt Myra. I don't want to cut her, don't even want to bruise her, but I promised. We all promised. We swore in blood. Please help me, God, because I have to do this. I hate it when you shout at me, Hetty, she whispered. Myra, I hate it when I have to, he said, and she winced. There you go, Eddie. You hurt her again. Why don't you just punch her around the room a few times, there would probably be... C Four. 
Eddie Kasprak takes his medicine. If you would know all there is to know about an American man or woman, of the middle class as the millennium nears its end, you would need only to look in his or her medicine cabinet, or so it has been said. But dear Lord, get a look into this one as Eddie Kasbrack slides it open, mercifully sliding aside his white face and wide staring eyes. On the top shelf there's anisin, excedrin, excedrin, PM, contact, gelucil, Tylenol in a large blue jar of Vix, looking like a bit of brooding deep twilight onto glass. There is a bottle of Viverin, a bottle of Seriotan, that's nature's spell backwards, the ads on Lawrence Welk used to say when Eddie Kasbrack was but a wee slip of a lad, and two bottles of Philip's Milk of Magnesia, the regular which tastes like liquid chalk, and the new mint flavor which tastes like mint-flavored liquid chalk. Here is a large bottle of Rolade standing chummily close to a large bottle of Tums. The Tums are standing next to a large bottle of orange-flavored Digel tablets, the three of them look like a trio of strange piggy banks stuffed with pills instead of dimes. Second shelf and dig the vites. You got your E, your C, your C with rose hips. You got B simple and B complex and B12. There's L lysine, which is supposed to do something about those embarrassing skin problems, and lecithin, which is supposed to do something about that embarrassing cholesterol buildup in and around the big pump. There's iron, calcium, and cod liver oil. There's one-a-day multiples, myodec multiples, centrum multiples, and sitting up on top of the cabinet itself is a gigantic bottle of Geritol, just for good measure. Moving right along to Eddie's third shelf, we find the utility infielders of the patent medicine world, X-Lax, Carter's Little Pills. Those two keep Eddie Kasprak moving the mail. Here nearby is Kaopec Date, Pepto-Bismol, and Preparation H, in case the mail moves too fast or too painfully. Also some tucks in a screw-top jar just to keep everything tidy after the mail has gone through, uh, be it just an advertising circular or two addressed to occupant or a big old special delivery package. Here is Formula 44 for coughs, NyQuil and Gistan for colds and a big bottle of castor oil. There's a tin of sucrets in case Eddie's throat gets sore, and there's a quartet of mouthwashes, chloroseptic, sepacol, sepastat in the spray bottle, and of course good old Listerine often imitated but never duplicated. Visine and murine for the eyes, cordade and neosporin ointment for the skin, the second line of defense if the L-lysine doesn't live up to expectations, a tube of Oxy-5 and a plastic bottle of Oxy-wash, because Eddie would definitely rather have a few less scents than a few more zits, and some tetracycline pills. And off to one side, clustered like bitter conspirators, are three bottles of cold tar shampoo, the bottom shelf is almost deserted, but the stuff which is here means serious business. You could cruise on this stuff, okay? On this stuff you could fly higher than Ben Hanscom's jet and crash harder than Thurman Munson's. There's Valium, Precadam, Elleville, and Darvon Complex. There is also another secrets box on this low shelf, but there are no secrets in it. If you open that one, you would find six quaaludes. Eddie Kasprak believed in the Boy Scout motto. He was swinging a blue tote bag as he came into the bathroom. He set it on the sink, unzipped it, and then, with trembling hands, he began to spill bottles and jars and tubes and squeeze bottles and spray bottles into it. Under other circumstances, he would have taken them out handful by careful handful. There was no time for such niceties now. The choice, as Eddie saw it, was as simple as it was brutal. Get moving and keep moving, or stand in one place long enough to start thinking about what all of this meant and simply die of fright, Eddie, Myra called up from downstairs. Eddie, what are you doing? Eddie dropped the secrets box containing the lewds into the bag. The medicine cabinet was now entirely empty, except for Myra's Midol and a small, almost used up tube of Blistex. He paused for a moment and then grabbed the Blistex. He started to zip the bag closed, debated, and then threw in the Midol as well. She could always buy more. Eddie! Five. Beverly Rogan takes a whoopin'. Tom was nearly asleep when the phone rang. He struggled halfway up, leaning toward it, and then felt one of Beverly's breasts press against his shoulder as she reached over him to get it. 
He flopped back on his pillow wondering dully who was calling on their unlisted home phone number at this hour of the night. He heard Beverly say hello, and then he drifted off again. He'd put away nearly three six-packs during the baseball game, and he was shagged. Then Beverly's voice, sharp and curious, What? drilled into his ear like an ice pick, and he opened his eyes again. He tried to sit up, and the phone cord dug into his thick neck. Get that fucking thing off me, Beverly, he said, and she got up quickly and walked around the bed, holding the phone cord up with tented fingers. Her hair was a deep red, and it flowed over her nightgown in natural waves, almost to her waist. Horror's hair. Her eyes did not stutter to his face to read the emotional weather there, and Tom Rogan didn't like that. He sat up. His head was starting to ache. Shit. It had probably already been aching, but when you were asleep, you didn't know it. He went into the bathroom, urinated for what felt like three hours, and then decided that as long as he was up, he ought to get another beer and try to take the curse off the impending hangover. Passing back through the bedroom on his way to the stairs, a man in white boxer shorts that flapped like sails below his considerable belly, his arms like slabs, he looked more like a dock walloper than the president and general manager of Beverly Fashions, Inc. He looked over his shoulder and yelled crossly, If it's that bull dyke Leslie, tell her to go eat out some model and let us sleep. Beverly glanced up briefly, shook her head to indicate it wasn't Leslie, and then looked back at the farm. Tom felt the muscles at the back of his neck tighten up. It felt like a dismissal, dismissed by my lady, my fucking lady. This is starting to look like it might turn into a situation. It might be that Beverly needed a short refresher course, and who was in charge around here, it was possible sometimes she did. She was a slow learner. He went downstairs and padded along the hall to the kitchen, absently picking the seat of his shorts out of the crack of his ass, and opened the refrigerator. His reaching hand closed on nothing more alcoholic than a blue Tupperware dish of leftover noodles Romanoff. All the beer was gone. Even the can he kept way in the back, much as he kept a $20 bill folded up behind his driver's license for emergencies, was gone. The game had gone 14 innings and all for nothing. The White Sox lost. But your candy ass is this year. His eyes drifted to the bottles of hard stuff on the glassed-in shelf over the kitchen bar, and for a moment he saw himself pouring a splash of beam over a single ice cube. Then he walked back toward the stairs, knowing... Not was asking for even more trouble than his head was currently in. He glanced at the face of the antique pendulum clock at the foot of the stairs and saw it was past midnight. This intelligence did nothing to improve his temper, which was never very good even at the best of times. He climbed the stairs with slow deliberation, aware, too aware, of how hard his heart was working. Kaboom, kathud. Kaboom, kathud, kaboom, kathud. It made him nervous when he could feel his heart beating in his ears and wrists as well as in his chest. Sometimes when that happened he would imagine it not as a squeezing and loosening organ but as a big dial on the left side of his chest with the needle edging ominously into the red zone. He did not like that shit. He did not need that shit. What he needed was a good night's sleep but the numb cunt he was married to was still on the phone. I understand that, Mike. Yes. Yes, I am. I know, but... A longer pause. Bill Denbro? she exclaimed, and that ice pick drilled into his ear again. He stood outside the bedroom door until he got his breath back. That was cathud, cathud, cathud again. The booming had stopped. He briefly imagined the needle edging out of the red and then willed the picture away. He was a man, for Christ's sakes, and a damn good one, not a furnace with a bad thermostat. He was in great shape. He was iron. And if she needed to relearn that, he'd be happy to teach her. He started in, then thought better of it and stood where he was a moment longer listening to her, not particularly caring about who she was talking to or what she said, only listening to the rising, falling tones of her voice, and what he felt was the old, familiar, dull rage. 
He'd met her in a downtown Chicago singles bar four years ago. Conversation had been easy enough because they both worked in the Standard Brands building and knew a few of the same people. Tom worked for King and Landry Public Relations on 42. Beverly Marsh, so she had been then, was an assistant designer at Delia Fashions on 12. Delia, which would later enjoy a modest vogue in the Midwest, catered to young people. Delia's skirts and blouses and shawls and slacks were sold largely to what Delia Castellan called youth stores and what Tom called head shops. Tom Rogan knew two things about Beverly Marsh almost at once. She was desirable and she was vulnerable. In less than a month, he knew a third as well. She was talented, very talented. In her drawings of casual dresses and blouses, he saw a money machine of almost scary potential. Not in the head shops, though, he thought, but did not say, at least not then. No more bad lighting, no more knockdown prices, no more shitty displays somewhere in the back of the store between the dope paraphernalia and the rock group T-shirts. Leave that shit for the small timers. He had known a great deal about her before she knew he had any real interest in her, and that was just the way Tom wanted it. He'd been looking for someone like Beverly Marsh all his life, and he moved in with the speed of a lion making a run at a slow antelope. Not that her vulnerability showed on the surface. He looked and saw a gorgeous woman, slim but abundantly stacked. Hips weren't so great, maybe, but she had a great ass and the best set of tits he had ever seen. Tom Rogan was a tit man, always had been, and tall girls almost always had disappointing tits. They wore thin shirts and their nipples drove you crazy. But when you got those thin shirts off, you discovered that nipples were really all they had. The tits themselves looked like the pull knobs on a bureau drawer. More than a handful's wasted, his college roommate had been fond of saying, but as far as Tom was concerned, his college roommate had been so full of shitty squeak going into a turn. Ah, she'd been some kind of fine looking all right, with that dynamite body and that gorgeous fall of red wavy hair. But she was weak, weak, somehow. It was as if she was sending out radio signals which only he could receive. You could point to certain things how much she smoked, but he had almost cured her of that. The restless way her eyes moved, never quite meeting the eyes of whoever was talking to her, only touching them from time to time and then leaping nimbly away. Her habit of lightly rubbing her elbows when she was nervous, the look of her fingernails, which were kept neat but brutally short. Tom noticed this latter the first time he met her. She picked up a glass of white wine. He saw her nails and thought, she keeps them short like that because she bites them. Lions may not think, at least not the way people think, but they see. And when antelopes start away from a waterhole, alerted by the dusty rug scent of approaching death, the cats can observe which one falls to the rear of the pack, maybe because it has a lame leg, maybe because it's just naturally slower, or maybe because its sense of danger is less developed. And it might even be possible that some antelopes and some women want to be brought down. Suddenly he heard a sound that jerked him rudely out of these memories, the snap of her cigarette lighter. The dull rage came again his stomach filled with a heat which was not entirely unpleasant. Smoking? Ah, she was smoking. They had had a few of Tom Rogan's special seminars on the subject, and here she was, doing it again. She was a slow learner, all right, but a good teacher is at his best with slow learners. Yes, she said now. Uh-huh. All right. Yes. She listened, and then uttered a strange, jagged laugh he'd never heard before. Two things, since you ask. Reserve me a room, and say me a prayer. Yes, okay. Uh-huh. Me too. Good night. She was hanging up as he came in. He meant to come in hard, yelling at her to put it out. Put it out now! Right now! But when he saw her, the words died in his throat. 
He'd seen her like this before, but only two or three times. Once before their first big show, once before the first private preview showing for national buyers, and once when they had gone to New York for the International Design Awards. She was moving across the bedroom in long strides, the white lace nightgown molded to her body, the cigarette clamped between her front teeth. Gardy hated the way she looked with a butt in her mouth, sending back a little white ribbon over her left shoulder like smoke from a locomotive stack. But it was her face that really gave him pause, that caused the planned shout to die in his throat. His heart lurched, kebab, and he winced, telling himself that what he felt was not fear but only surprise at finding her this way. She was a woman who really came alive all the way only when the rhythm of her work spiked toward a climax. Each of those remembered occasions had of course been career-related. At those times he had seen a different woman from the one he knew so well, the woman who fucked up his sensitive fear radar with wild bursts of static. The woman who came out in times of stress was strong, but high-strung, fearless, but unpredictable. There was lots of color in her cheeks now a natural blush high on her cheekbones. Her eyes were wide and sparkly, not a trace of sleep left in them. Her hair flowed and streamed and, oh, looky here, friends and neighbors. Oh, you just look you right here. Is she taking a suitcase out of the closet? A suitcase? By God, she is. Reserve me a room, say me a prayer. Well, she wasn't going to need a room in any hotel, not in the foreseeable future, but his little Beverly Rogan was going to be staying right here at home, thank you very much, and taking her meals, standing up for the next three or four days. But she very well might need a prayer or two before he was through with her. She tossed the suitcase on the foot of the bed and then went to her bureau. She opened the top drawer and pulled out two pairs of jeans and a pair of cords, tossed them into the suitcase. Back to the bureau, cigarette streaming smoke over her shoulder. She grabbed a sweater, a couple of t-shirts, one of the old ship and shore blouses she looked so stupid in but refused to give up. Whoever had called her ashore hadn't been a jet setter. This was dull stuff, strictly Jackie Kennedy Hyannisport weekend stuff. Not that he cared about who had called her or where she thought she was going since she wasn't going anywhere. Those were not the things which pecked steadily at his mind, dull and achy from too much beer and not enough sleep. It was that cigarette. Supposedly, she'd throw them all out. But she had held out on him. The proof was clamped between her teeth right now, and because she still had not noticed him standing in the doorway, he allowed himself the pleasure of remembering the two nights which had assured him of his complete control over her. I don't want you to smoke around me anymore, he told her as they headed home from a party in Lake Forest, October that had been. I have to choke that shit down at parties and at the office, but I'm going to have to choke it down when I'm with you. You know what it's like? I'm going to tell you the truth. It's unpleasant, but it's the truth. It's like having to eat someone else's snot. He thought this would bring some faint spark of protest, but she'd only looked at him in her shy, wanting-to-please way. Her voice had been low and meek and obedient. All right, Tom. Pitch it, then. She pitched it. Tom had been in a good humor for the rest of that night. A few weeks later, coming out of a movie, she unthinkingly lit a cigarette in the lobby and puffed it as they walked across the parking lot to the car. It had been a bitter November night, the wind chopping like a maniac at any exposed square inch of flesh it could find. Tom remembered he had been able to smell the lake as he sometimes could on cold nights, a flat smell that was both fishy and somehow empty. He let her smoke the cigarette. He even opened the door for her when they got to the car. He got in behind the wheel, closed his own door, and then said, Bev. She took the cigarette out of her mouth, turned toward him, inquiring, and he unloaded on her pretty good, his hard, open hand striking across her cheek hard enough to make his palm tingle hard enough to rock her head back against the headrest. Her eyes widened with surprise and pain, and something else as well. Her own hand flew to her cheek to investigate the warmth and tingling numbness there. She cried out, Ow! Tom! 
He looked at her, eyes narrowed, mouth smiling casually, completely alive, ready to see what would come next, how she would react. His cock was stiffening in his pants, but he barely noticed that was for later. For now, school was in session. He replayed what had just happened. Her face. What had the third expression been? There for a bare instant, then gone. First the surprise, then the pain, then the... Nostalgia. Look of a memory, of some memory. Did it only been for a moment? He didn't think she even knew it had been there on her face or in her mind. Now. Now. It would all be in the first thing she didn't say. He knew that as well as his own name. It wasn't, you son of a bitch, it wasn't, see you later, macho city. It wasn't, we're through, Tom. She only looked at him with her wounded, brimming hazel eyes and said, Why did you do that? Then she tried to say something else and burst into tears instead. Throw it out. What? What, Tom? Her makeup was running down her face in muddy tracks. He didn't mind that. He kind of liked seeing her that way. It was messy, but there was something sexy about it, too. Slutty, kind of exciting. The cigarette. Throw it out. Realization dawning. And with it, guilt. Ah, uh, uh, I just forgot, she cried. That's all. Throw it out, Bev. Or you're going to get another shot. She rolled the window down and pitched the cigarette. Then she turned back to him, her face pale and scared, and somehow serene. You can't. You aren't supposed to hit me. It's a bad basis for a, a, a lasting relationship. She was trying to find a tone, an adult rhythm of speech, and failing. He had regressed her. He was in this car with a child, voluptuous and sexy as hell, but a child. Cat and aren't are two different things, Keed, he said. He kept his voice calm, but inside he was jittering and jiving. And I'll be the one to decide what constitutes a lasting relationship and what doesn't. If you can live with that, fine. If you can't, you can take a walk. I won't stop you. I might kick you once in the ass as a going-away present. But I won't stop you. It's a free country. What more can I say? Maybe you've already said enough, she whispered. And he hit her again harder than the first time, because no broad was ever than a smart off to Tom Rogan. He would pop the Queen of England if she cracked smart to him. Her cheek banged the padded dashboard. Her hand groped for the door handle and then fell away. She only crouched in the corner like a rabbit, one hand over her mouth, her eyes large and wet and frightened. Tom looked at her for a moment, and then he got out and walked around the back of the car. He opened her door. His breath was smoke in the black, windy November air, and the smell of the lake was very clear. You want to get out, Beth? I saw you reach her for the door handle, so I guess you must want to get out. Okay, that's all right. I asked you to do something and you said you would, then you didn't. So you want to get out? Come on, get out. But the fuck, right? Get out. You want to get out? No, she whispered. What? I can't hear you. No, I don't want to get out, she said a little louder. What, those cigarettes giving you emphysema? If you can't talk, I'll get you a fucking megaphone. This is your last chance, Beverly. You speak up so I can hear you. Do you want to get out of this core, or do you want to come back with me? Want to come back with you, she said, and clasped her hands on her skirt like a little girl. She wouldn't look at him. Tears slipped down her cheeks. All right, he said. Fine. But first you say this for me, Beth. You say, I forgot about smoking in front of you, Tom. Now she looked at him, her eyes wounded, pleading, inarticulate. You can make me do this, her eyes said. But please don't. Don't. I love you. Can it be over? No, it could not. Because that was not the bottom of her wanting, and both of them knew it. Say it. 
I forgot about smoking in front of you, Tom. Good. Now say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, she repeated dully. The cigarette lay smoking on the pavement like a cut piece of fuse. People leaving the theater glanced over at them. The man standing by the open passenger door of a late model fade into the woodwork vega. The woman sitting inside, her hands clasped primly in her lap, her head down, the dome light outlining the soft fall of her hair in gold. He crushed the cigarette out. He smeared it against the blacktop. Now say, I'll never do it again without your permission. I'll never, her voice began to hitch. Never, n n n n say it, Bev. Never n do it again without your permission. So he had slammed the door and gone back around to the driver's seat. He got behind the wheel and drove them back to his downtown apartment. Neither of them said a word. Half the relationship had been set in the parking lot. The second half was set 40 minutes later, in Tom's bed. She didn't want to make love, she said. He saw a different truth in her eyes and the strutty cock of her legs, however. And when he got her blouse off, her nipples had been rock hard. She moaned when he brushed them and cried out softly when he suckled first one and then the other, kneading them restlessly as he did so. She grabbed his hand and thrust it between her legs. I thought she didn't want to, he said, and she had turned her face away. But she did not let go of his hand, and the rocking motion of her hips actually speeded up. He pushed her back on the bed, and now he was gentle, not ripping her underwear, but removing it with a careful consideration that was almost prissy. Sliding into her was like sliding into some exquisite oil. He moved with her, using her, but letting her use him as well. And she came the first time almost at once, crying out and digging her nails into his back. Then they rocked together in slow, long strokes, and somewhere in there he thought she came again. Tom would get close, and then he would think of White Sox batting averages or who was trying to undercut him for the chest they count at work, and he would be okay again. Then she began to speed up her rhythm finally dissolving into an excited bucking. He looked at her face, the raccoon ringlets of mascara, the smeared lipstick, and he felt himself suddenly shooting deliriously toward the edge. She jerked her hips up harder and harder. There had been no beer gut between them in those days, and their bellies clapped hands in a quickening beat. Near the end she screamed and then bit his shoulder with her small, even teeth. How many times did you come? he asked her after they had showered. She turned her face away, and when she spoke her voice was so low he almost couldn't hear her. That isn't something you're supposed to ask. No? Who told you that? Mr. Rogers? He took her face in one hand, thumb pressing deep into one cheek, fingers pressing into the other, palm cupping her chin in between. You talk to Tom, he said. You hear me, Beth? Talk to Papa. Three, she said reluctantly. Good, he said. You can have a cigarette. She looked at him distrustfully. Her red hair spread over the pillows, wearing nothing but a pair of hip-hugger patties. Just looking at her that way got his motor turning over again. He nodded. Go on, he said. It's all right. They'd been married in a civil ceremony three months later. Two of his friends had come. The only friend of hers to attend had been K. McCall, whom Tom called that titsy woman's lib bitch. All of these memories went through Tom's mind in a space of seconds like a speeded-up piece of film as he stood in the doorway watching her. She had gone on to the bottom drawer of what she sometimes called her weekend bureau, and now she was tossing underwear into the suitcase, not the sort of stuff he liked, the slippery satins and smooth silks, this was cotton stuff, little girl stuff. Most of it faded and with little puffs of popped elastic on the waistbands. A cotton nighty that looked like something out of Little House on the Prairie. She poked in the back of this bottom drawer to see what else might be lurking in there. Tom Rogan, meanwhile, moved across the shag rod toward his wardrobe. 
His feet were bare and his passage noiseless as a puff of breeze. It was the cigarette. That was what had really gotten him mad. It had been a long time since she'd forgotten that first lesson. There'd been other lessons to learn since, a great many, and there had been hot days when she had worn long-sleeved blouses or even cardigan sweaters buttoned all the way to the neck, gray days when she had worn sunglasses. But that first lesson had been so sudden and fundamental. He had forgot the telephone call that had wakened him out of his deepening sleep. It was the cigarette. If she was smoking now, then she had forgotten Tom Rogan, temporarily, of course, only temporarily, but even temporarily was too damned long. What might have caused her to forget didn't matter. Such things were not to happen in his house for any reason. There was a wide black strip of leather hanging from a hook inside the closet door. There was no buckle on it. He'd removed that long ago. It was doubled over at one end where a buckle would have gone, and this doubled-over section formed a loop into which Tom Rogan now slipped his hand. Tom, you've been bad, his mother had sometimes said. Well, sometimes was maybe not such a good word. Maybe often would have been a better one. You come here, Tommy. I've got to give you a weapon. His life as a child had been punctuated by whoopings. He'd finally escaped to Wichita State College, but apparently there was no such thing as a complete escape, because he continued to hear her voice in dreams, Come here, Tommy. I've got to give you a whoopin'. Whoopin'. He had been the eldest of four. Three months after the youngest had been born, Ralph Rogan had died. Well, died was maybe not such a good word. Maybe committed suicide would have been a better way to put it, since he had poured a generous quantity of lye into a tumbler of gin and quaffed this devil's brew while sitting on the bathroom hopper. Mrs. Rogan had found work at the Ford plant. Tom, although only eleven, became the man of the family. And if he screwed up, if the baby shot her dieties after the sitter went home and the mess was still in them when Mom got home, if he forgot to cross Megan on the Broad Street corner after her nursery school got out and that nosy Mrs. Gant saw, if he happened to be watching American Bandstand while Joey made a mess in the kitchen, if any of those things or a thousand others happened, then, after the smaller children were in bed, the spanking stack would come out and she would call the invocation, Come here, Tommy, I got to give you a whoopin'. Better to be the whooper than the whooped. If he had learned nothing else on the great tall road of life, he'd learned that. So he flipped the loose end of the belt over once and pulled the loop snug. Then he closed his fist over it. It felt good, it made him feel like a grown-up. The strip of leather hung from his clenched fist like a dead black snake. His headache was gone. She had found that one last thing in the back of the drawer, an old white cotton bra with gunshell cups. The thought that this early morning call might have been from a lover surfaced briefly in his mind and then sank again. I was ridiculous. A woman going away to meet her lover did not pack her faded ship and shore blouses and her cotton Kmart undies with the pups and snarls in the elastic. Also, she wouldn't dare. Beverly, he said softly, and she turned at once, startled, her eyes wide, her long hair swinging. The belt hesitated, dropped a little. He stared at her, feeling that little bloom of uneasiness again. Yes, she had looked this way before the big shows, and then he hadn't gotten in her way, understanding that she was so filled with a mixture of fear and competitive aggressiveness that it was as if her head was full of illuminating gas, a single spark, and she would explode. She had seen the shows not as a chance to split off from Delia fashions to make a living or even a fortune on her own. If that had been all, she would have been fine. But if that were all, she also would not have been so ungodly talented. She had seen those shows as a kind of super exam on which she would be graded by fierce teachers, what she saw on those occasions was some creature without a face. It had no face, but it did have a name. Authority. All of that wide-eyed nerviness was on her face now. But not just there, it was all around her an aura that seemed almost visible, a high-tension charge which made her suddenly both more alluring and more dangerous than she had seemed to him in years. He was afraid, 
because she was here, all here, the essential she, as apart from the she Tom Rogan wanted her to be, the she he had made. Beverly looked shocked and frightened. She also looked almost madly exhilarated, her cheeks glowed with hectic color, yet there were stark white patches below her lower lids which looked almost like a second pair of eyes. Her forehead glowed with a creamy resonance, and the cigarette was still jutting out of her mouth, now at a slight up angle, as if she thought she was goddamn Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The cigarette, just looking at it, caused dull fury to wash over him again in a green wave. Faintly, far back in his mind, he remembered her saying something to him one night out of the dark, speaking in a dull and listless voice. Someday you're going to kill me, Tom. Do you know that? Someday you're just going to go too far and that will be the end, just snap. He had answered, You do it my way, Bev, and that day will never come. Now, before the rage blotted out everything, he wondered if that day hadn't come after all. The cigarette. Never mind the call, the packing, the weird look on her face, they would deal with the cigarette. And then he would fuck her. Then they could discuss the rest. By then it might even seem important, Tom, she said. Tom, I have to, you're smoking, he said. His voice seemed to come from a distance, as if over a pretty good radio. Looks like you forgot, Bade. Where you been hiding them? Look, I'll put it out, she said, and went to the bathroom door. She flipped the cigarette even from here. He could see the teeth marks driven deep into the filter, into the bowl of the john. Fsst. She came back out. Tom, there was an old friend, an old, old friend. I have to shut up. That's what you have to do, he shouted at her. Just shut up. But the fear he wanted to see, the fear of him, was not on her face. There was fear, but it had come out of the telephone, and fear was not supposed to come to Beverly from that direction. It was almost as if she didn't see the belt, didn't see him, and Tom felt a trickle of unease. Was he here? It was a stupid question, but was he? This question was so terrible and so elemental that for a moment he felt in danger of coming completely unwrapped from the root of himself and just floating off like a tumbleweed in a high breeze. Then he caught hold of himself. He was here all right. There was quite enough fucking psychobabble for one night. He was here, he was Tom Rogan. Tom, by God, Rogan, and if this dippy cunt didn't straighten up and fly right the next thirty seconds or so, she was going to look like she got pushed out of a fast-moving boxcar by a mean railroad dick. Got to give you a whoopin', he said. Sorry about that, babe. He had seen that mixture of fear and aggressiveness before, yes. Now for the first time ever it flashed out at him. Put that thing down, she said. I've got to get to O'Hare as fast as I can. Uh, are you here, Tom? Uh, are you? He pushed the thought away. The strip of leather which had once been a belt swung slowly before him like a pendulum. His eyes flickered and then held fast to her face. Listen to me, Tom. There's been some trouble back in my hometown, very bad trouble. I had a friend in those days, I guess. He would have been my boyfriend, except we weren't quite old enough for that. He was only an eleven-year-old kid with a bad stutter back then. He's a novelist now. You even read one of his books, I think. The Black Rapids? She searched his face, but his face gave no sign. There was only the belt penduluming back and forth, back and forth. He stood with his head lowered and his stocky legs slightly apart. Then she ran her hand restlessly through her hair, distractedly, as if she had many important things to think of and hadn't seen the belt at all, and that haunting, awful question were surfaced in his head again. Are you there? Are you sure? That book laid around here for weeks and I never made the connection. Maybe I should have, but we're all older and I haven't even thought about Derry in a long, long time. Anyway, Bill had a brother, George. 
and George was killed before I really knew Bill. He was murdered. And then, the next summer... But Tom had listened to enough craziness from within and from without. He moved in on her fast, cocking his right arm back over his shoulder like a man about to throw a javelin. The belt hissed apart through the air. Beverly saw it coming and tried to duck away, but her right shoulder struck the bathroom doorway, and there was a meaty whap as the belt struck her left forearm, leaving a red wheel. Gonna whoop you, Tom repeated. His voice was sane, even regretful, but his teeth showed in a white and frozen smile. He wanted to see that look in her eyes, that look of fear and terror and shame, that look that said, yes, you're right, I deserved it, that look that said, yes, you're there, all right, I feel your presence. Then love could come back. And that was right and good because he did love her. They could even have a discussion if she wanted it, of exactly who it called and what all this was about. But that was to come later. For now, school was in session, the old one, two, first the whooping, then the fucking. Sorry, babe. Tom, don't do that. He swung the belt side on and saw it lick around her hip. There was a satisfying snap as it finished on her buttock. And, and Jesus, she was grabbing at it. She was grabbing at the belt. For a moment, Tom Rogan was so astounded by this unexpected act of insubordination, and he almost lost his punisher, would have lost it except for the loop, which was tucked securely into his fist. He'd chucked it back. Don't you ever try to grab something away from me, he said hoarsely. You hear me? You ever do that again? and you'll spend a month pissing raspberry juice. Tom, stop it, she said, and her very tone infuriated him. She sounded like a playground monitor talking down to a tantrumy six-year-old. I have to go. This is no joke. People are dead, and I made a promise a long time ago. Tom heard little of this. He bellowed and ran at her with his head down, the belt swinging blindly. He hit her with it. Driving her away from the doorway and along the bedroom wall, he cocked his arm back, hit her, cocked his arm back, hit her, cocked his arm back, hit her. Later that morning he would not be able to raise the arm above eye level until he had swallowed three codeine tablets, but for now he was aware of nothing but the fact that she was defying him. She had not only been smoking, she had tried to grab the belt away from him and all folks. Oh, friends and neighbors, she had asked for it, and he would testify before the throne of God Almighty that she was going to get it. He drove her along the wall, swinging the belt, raining blows on her. Her hands were up to protect her face, but he had a clear shot at the rest of her. The belt made thick bullwhip cracks in the quiet room, but she did not scream as she sometimes did and she did not beg him to stop as she usually did. Worst of all, she did not cry, as she always did. The only sounds were the belt and their breathing, his heavy and hoarse, hers quick and light. She broke for the bed and the vanity table on her side of it. Her shoulders were red from the belt's blows, her hair streamed fire. He lumbered after her slower but big, very big, He'd played squash until he had popped an Achilles tendon two years ago, and since then his weight had gotten out of hand a little bit, or maybe a lot would have been a better way to put it. But the muscle was still there, firm cordage sheathed in the fat. Still, he was a little alarmed at how out of breath he was. She reached the vanity, and he thought she would crouch there or maybe try to crawl under it. Instead, she groped, turned, and suddenly the air was full of flying missiles. She was throwing cosmetics at him. A bottle of Chantilly struck him squarely between the nipples, fell to his feet, shattered. He was suddenly enveloped in the gagging scent of flowers. Quit it, he roared. Quit it, you bitch. Instead of quitting it, her hands flew along the vanity's littered glass top, grabbing whatever they found, throwing it. He groped at his chest where the bottle of Chantilly had struck him, unable to believe she had hit him with something, even as other objects flew around him. The bottle's glass stopper had cut him. It was not much of a cut, little more than a triangular scratch, 
But was there a certain red-haired lady who was going to see the sun come up from a hospital bed? Oh yes, there was a certain lady who, a jar of cream, struck him above the right eyebrow with sudden cracking force. He heard a dull flood seemingly inside his head. White light exploded over the eye's field of vision, and he fell back a step, mouth dropping open. Now a tube of Nivea cream struck his belly with a small slapping sound, and she was... Was she? Was it possible? Yes. She was yelling at him. I'm going to the airport, you son of a bitch. Do you hear me? I have business and I'm going. You want to get out of my way? Because I'm going. Blood ran into his right eye, stinging and hot. He knuckled it away. He stood there for a moment, staring at her, as if he had never seen her before. In a way he never had. Her breasts heaved rapidly, her face all flush and livid pallor, blazed. Her lips were drawn back from her teeth in a snarl. She had, however, denuded the top of the vanity table. The missile silo was empty. He could still read the fear in her eyes, but it was still not fear of him. You put those clothes back, he said, struggling not to pant as he spoke. That would not sound good. That would sound weak. Then you put the suitcase back and get into bed. And if you do those things, maybe I won't beat you up too bad. Maybe you'll be able to go out of the house in two days instead of two weeks. Tom, listen to me, she spoke slowly. Her gaze was very clear. If you come near me again, I'll kill you. Do you understand that, you tub of guts? I'll kill you. And suddenly, maybe it was because of the utter loathing on her face, the contempt, maybe because she had called him a tub of guts, or maybe only because of the rebellious way her breasts rose and fell. The fear was suffocating him. It was not a bud or a bloom, but a whole goddamn garden, the fear, the horrible fear that he was not here. Tom Rogan rushed at his wife, not bellowing this time. He came as silently as a torpedo cutting through the water. His intent now was probably not merely to beat and subjugate, but to do to her what she had so rashly said she would do to him. He thought she would run, probably for the bathroom, maybe for the stairs. Instead, she stood her ground. Her hip whacked the wall as she threw her weight against the vanity table, pushing it up and toward him, ripping two fingernails down to the quick, when the sweat on her palms caused her hands to slip. For a moment the table tottered on an angle, and then she shoved herself forward again, the vanity waltzed on one leg, mirror catching the light and reflecting a brief, swimmy aquarium shadow across the ceiling, and then it tilted forward and outward. Its leading edge slammed into Tom's upper thighs and knocked him over. There was a musical jingle as bottles tipped over and shattered inside. He saw the mirror strike the floor in his left and threw an arm up to shield his eyes, losing the belt. Glass coughed across the floor, silver on the back. He felt some of it sting him, drawing blood. Now she was crying, her breath coming in high, screamy sobs. Time after time she had seen herself leaving him, leaving Tom's tyranny, as she had left that of her father, stealing away in the night bags piled in the trunk of her cutlass. She was not a stupid woman, certainly not stupid enough even now, standing on the rim of this incredible shambles to believe that she had not loved Tom and did not in some way love him still, but that did not preclude her fear of him, her hate of him, and her contempt of herself for choosing him for dim reasons buried in the times that should be over. Her heart was not breaking. It seemed rather to be broiling in her chest, melting. She was afraid the heat from her heart might soon destroy her sanity in fire. But above all this, yammering steadily in the back of her mind, she could hear Mike Hanlon's dry, steady voice. It's come back, Beverly. It's come back. And you promised. The vanity heaved up and down once, twice, a third time. It looked as if it were breathing. 
moving with careful agility, her mouth turned down at the corners and jerking as if in prelude to some sort of convulsion. She skirted the vanity toe-stepping through the broken glass and grabbed the belt just as Tom heaved to the vanity off to one side. Then she backed up, sliding her hand into the loop. She shook her hair out of her eyes and watched to see what he would do. Tom got up. Some of the mirror glass had cut one of his cheeks. A diagonal cut traced a line as fine as thread across his brow. He squinted at her as he rose slowly to his feet, and she saw drops of blood on his boxer shorts. Ah, you just give me that belt, he said. Instead, she took two turns of it around her hand and looked at him defiantly. Ah, quit it, Beth. Right now, if you come for me, I'm going to strap the shit out of you. The words were coming out of her mouth, but she couldn't believe it was her saying them. And just who was this caveman in the bloody undershorts anyway? Her husband? Her father? The lover she'd taken in college who had broken her nose one night apparently on a whim? Oh, God help me, she thought. God help me now. And still her mouth went on. I can do it too. You're fat and slow, Tom. I'm going. And I think maybe I'll stay gone. I think maybe it's over. Who's the sky, Denbro? Forget it. I was, she realized almost too late that the question had been a distraction. He was coming for her before the last word was out of his mouth. She wickered the belt through the air in an auric and the sound it made when it smashed across his mouth was the sound of a stubborn cork coming out of a bottle. He squealed and clapped his hands to his mouth. His eyes huge, hurt and shocked. Blood began to pour between his fingers and over the backs of his hands. You broke my mouth, you bet! He screamed, muffled. Oh, God! You broke my mouth! He came at her again, hands reaching, his mouth a wet red smear. His lips appeared to have burst in two places. The crown had been knocked from one of its front teeth. As she watched, he spit it to one side. Part of her was backing away from this scene, sick and moaning, wanting to shut her eyes, but that other Beverly felt the exultation of a death row convict freed in a freak earthquake. That Beverly liked all of this just fine. I wish you'd swallowed it. That one thought. Wish you'd choked on it. It was this latter Beverly who swung the belt for the last time, the belt he had used on her buttocks, her legs, her breasts, the belt he had used on her times, without number, over the last four years. How many strokes you got depended on how badly you'd screwed up. Tom comes home and dinner is cold, too with the belt. Bev's working late at the studio and forgets to call home, three with the belt. Oh hey, look at this, Beverly got another parking ticket, one with the belt across the breasts. He was good. He rarely bruised. It didn't even hurt that much, except for the humiliation that hurt. And what hurt worse was knowing that part of her craved the hurt, craved the humiliation. Last time pays for all, she thought, and swung. She brought the belt in low, brought it in sidearm, and it whacked across his balls with a brisk yet heavy sound, the sound of a woman striking a rug with a carpet beater. There was all it took. All the fight promptly went out of Tom Rogan. He uttered a thin, strengthless shriek and fell on his knees as if to pray. His hands were between his legs. His head was thrown back. Cords stood out on his neck. His mouth was a tragedy grimace of pain. His left knee came down squarely on a heavy pointed hook of shattered perfume bottle and he rolled silently over on one side like a whale. One hand left his balls to grab his squirting knee. The blood, she thought, dear Lord, he's bleeding everywhere. He'll live, this new Beverly, the Beverly who seemed to have surfaced at Mike Hanlon's phone call, replied coldly. Guys like him always live. You just get the hell out of here before he decides he wants to tango some more, or before he decides to go down cellar and get his Winchester. She backed away and felt pain stab her foot as she stepped on a chunk of glass from the broken vanity mirror. She bent down to grab the handle of a suitcase. She never took her eyes off him. She backed out the door and she backed down the hall. She was holding the suitcase in front of her, 
in both hands, and it banged her shins as she backed. Her cut foot printed bloody heel prints. When she reached the stairs, she turned round and went down quickly, not letting herself think. She suspected she had no coherent thoughts left inside anyway, at least for the time being. She felt a light pawing against her leg and screamed. She looked down, and so it was the end of the belt. It was still wrapped around her hand. In this dim light it looked more like a dead snake than ever. She threw it over the banister, her face a wince of disgust, and saw it land in an S on the rug of the downstairs hallway. At the foot of the stairs she grasped the hem of her white lace nightgown cross-handed and pulled it over her head. It was bloody, and she would not wear it one second longer no matter what. She tossed it aside and it billowed onto the rubber plant by the doorway to the living room like a lacy parachute. She bent, naked, to the suitcase. Her nipples were cold, hard as bullets. Beverly, you get your ass upstairs? She gasped, choked, then bent back to the suitcase. If she was strong enough to scream that loud, her time was a good deal shorter than she had thought. She opened the case and poured out panties, a blouse, and old pair of Levi's. She jerked these on, standing by the door, her eyes never leaving the stairs. But Tom did not appear at the top of them. He bawled her name twice more, and each time she flinched away from that sound, her eyes hunted, her lips pulling back from her teeth in an unconscious snarl. She jabbed the buttons of the blouse through the holes as fast as she could. The two top buttons were gone. It was ironic how little of her own sewing ever got done. And she supposed she looked quite a bit like a part-time hooker, looking for one last quickie before calling it a night. But it would have to do. I'll kill you, you bitch. You old fucking bitch. She slammed the suitcase closed and latched it. The arm of a blouse poked out like a tongue. She looked around once, quickly suspecting that she would never see this house again. She discovered only relief in the idea and so opened the door and let herself out. She was three blocks away, walking with no clear sense of where she was going when she realized her feet were still bare. The one she had cut, the left, throbbed dully. She had to get something on her feet and was nearly two o'clock in the morning. Her wallet and credit cards were at home. She felt in the pockets of the jeans and came up with nothing but a few puffs of lint. She didn't have a dime, not so much as a red penny. She looked around at the residential neighborhood she was in, nice homes, manicured lawns and plantings, dark windows. And suddenly, she began to laugh. Beverly Rogan sat on a low stone wall, her suitcase between her dirty feet, and laughed. The stars were out, and how bright they were. She tilted her head back and laughed at them, that wild exhilaration washing through her again like a tidal wave that lifted and carried and cleansed, a force so powerful that any conscious thought was lost. Only her blood thought, and its one powerful voice spoke to her in some inarticulate way of desire, although what it was it desired, she neither knew nor cared. It was enough to feel that warmth filling her up with its insistence, desire, she thought, and inside her, that tidal wave of exhilaration seemed to gather speed, rushing her onward toward some inevitable crash. She laughed at the stars, frightened but free, her terror as sharp as pain and as sweet as a ripe October apple. And when a light came on in an upstairs bedroom of the house the stone wall belonged to, she grabbed the handle of her suitcase and fled off into the night, still laughing. 6. Bill Denbro Takes Time Out Leave, Audrey repeated. She looked at him puzzled, a bit afraid, and then tucked her bare feet up under her. The floor was cold, the whole cottage was cold, come to that. The south of England had been experiencing an exceptionally dank spring, and more than once, on his regular morning and evening walks, Bill Denbro had found himself thinking of Maine, thinking, in a surprised, vague way, of Derry. The cottage was supposed to have central heating. The ad had said so, and there certainly was a furnace down there in the tidy little basement, tucked away in what had once been a coal bin. 
But he and Audra had discovered early on in the shoot that the British idea of central heating was not at all the same as the American one. It seemed the Brits believed you had central heating as long as you didn't have to piss away a scrim of ice in the toilet bowl when you got up in the morning. It was morning now, just quarter of eight. Bill had hung the phone up five minutes ago. Bill, you can't just leave, you know that. I have to, he said. There was a hutch on the far side of the room. He went to it, took a bottle of Glenfiddich from the top shelf and poured himself a drink. Some of it slopped over the side of the glass. Fuck, he muttered. Who was that on the telephone? What are you scared of, Bill? I'm not scared, Oh, Your hands always shake like that? You always have your first drink before breakfast? He came back to his chair, robe flapping around his ankles, and sat down. He tried to smile, but it was a poor effort, and he gave it up. On the telly, the BBC announcer was wrapping up this morning's batch of bad news before going on to last evening's football scores. When they had arrived in the small suburban village of Fleet a month before the shoot was scheduled to begin, they had both marveled over the technical quality of British television. On a good, high-color set, it really did look as though you could climb right inside. More lines or something, Bill had said. I don't know what it is, but it's great, Audra had replied. That was before they discovered that much of the programming consisted of American shows such as Dallas and endless British sports events ranging from the arcane and boring champion darts throwing in which all the participants looked like hypersensitive sumo wrestlers to the simply boring British football was bad, cricket was even worse. I've been thinking about home a lot lately, Bill said and sipped his drink. Home, she said and looked so honestly puzzled that he laughed. A poor Audra. Married almost eleven years to the guy, and you don't know duly squad about him. What do you know about that? <laughs> he laughed again, and swallowed the rest of his drink. His laughter had a quality she cared for as little as seeing him with a glass of scotch in his hand at this hour of the morning. The laugh sounded like something that really wanted to be a howl of pain. I wonder if any of the others... I've got husbands and wives who are just finding out how little they know. I suppose they must. Billy, I know that I love you, she said. For eleven years that's been enough, I know. He smiled at her. The smile was sweet, tired, and scared. Please, please tell me what this is about. She looked at him with her lovely gray eyes, sitting there in a tatty, leased house chair, with her feet curled beneath the hem of her nightgown, a woman he had loved, married, and still loved. He tried to see through her eyes to see what she knew. He tried to see it as a story. He could, but he knew it would never sell. Here is a poor boy from the state of Maine who goes to the university on a scholarship. All his life, he's wanted to be a writer, but when he enrolls in the writing courses, he finds himself lost without a compass in a strange and frightening land. There's one guy who wants to be Updike. There's another who wants to be a New England version of Faulkner. Only he wants to write novels about the grim lives of the poor in blank verse. There's a girl who admires Joyce Carol Oates but feels that because Oates was nurtured in a sexist society, she is radioactive in a literary sense. Oates is unable to be clean, this girl says. She will be cleaner. There's the short, fat grad student who can't or won't speak above a mutter. This guy's written a play in which there are nine characters. Each of them says only a single word. Little by little, the playgoers realize that when you put the single words together, you come out with, War is the tool of the sexist death merchants. This fellow's play receives an A from the man who teaches EH 141, Creative Writing Honors Seminar. This instructor has published four books of poetry and his master's thesis, all with the university press. He smokes pot, wears a peace medallion. The Fat Mudderer's play is produced by a guerrilla theater group during the strike to end the war which shuts down the campus in May of 1970. The instructor plays one of the characters. Bill Denbro, meanwhile, has written one locked room mystery tale, three science fiction stories, and several horror tales, which owe a great deal to Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, and Richard Matheson. In later years, he will say those stories resembled a mid-1800s funeral hack equipped with a supercharger and painted day-glow red. 
One of the SF tales earns him a B. This is better, the instructor writes on the title page. In the alien Counter-Strike, we see the vicious circle in which violence begets violence. I particularly liked the needle-nosed spacecraft as a symbol of socio-sexual incursion. While this remains a slightly confused undertone throughout, it is interesting. All the others do no better than a C. Finally, he stands up in class one day, after the discussion of a sallow young woman's vignette about a cow's examination of a discarded engine block in a deserted field, this may or may not be after a nuclear war, has gone on for 70 minutes or so. The sallow girl, who smokes one Winston after another and picks occasionally at the pimples, which nestle in the hollows of her temples, insists that the vignette is a socio-political statement in the matter of the early Orwell. Most of the class and the instructor agree, but still the discussion drones on. When Bill stands up, the class looks at him. He is tall and has a certain presence. Speaking carefully, not stuttering, he's not stuttered in better than five years, he says, I don't understand this at all. I don't understand any of this. Why does a story have to be socio-anything? Politics, culture, history... Aren't those natural ingredients in any story if it's told well? I mean, he looks around, sees hostile eyes, and realizes dimly that they see this as some sort of attack. Maybe it even is. They're thinking, he realizes, that maybe there is a sexist death merchant in their midst. I mean, can't you guys just let a story be a story? No one replies. Silence spins out. He stands there looking from one cool set of eyes to the next. The sallow girl chuffs out smoke and snubs her cigarette in an ashtray she has brought along in her backpack. Finally, the instructor says softly, as if to a child having an inexplicable tantrum, Do you believe William Faulkner was just telling stories? Do you believe Shakespeare was just interested in making a buck? Come now, Bill, tell us what you think. I think that's pretty close to the truth, Bill says after a long moment in which he honestly considers the question, and in their eyes he reads a kind of damnation. I suggest, the instructor says, toying with his pen and smiling at Bill with half-leaded eyes, that you have a great deal to learn. The applause starts somewhere in the back of the room. Bill leaves but returns the next week determined to stick with it. In the time between, he has written a story called The Dark, a tale about a small boy who discovers a monster in the cellar of his house. The little boy faces it, battles it, finally kills it. He feels a kind of holy exaltation as he goes about the business of writing this story. He even feels that he is not so much telling the story as he is allowing the story to flow through him. At one point, he puts his pen down, and takes his hot and aching hand out into ten-degree December cold, where it nearly smokes from the temperature change. He walks around, green cut-off boots squeaking in the snow like tiny shutter hinges which need oil, and his head seems to bulge with the story. It is a little scary, the way it needs to get out. He feels that if it cannot escape by way of his racing hand that it will pop his eyes out of its urgency to escape and be concrete, Gonna knock the shit out of it, he confides to the blowing winter dark, and laughs a little, a shaky laugh. He is aware that he has finally discovered how to do just that. After ten years of trying, he has suddenly found the starter button on the vast, dead bulldozer taking up so much space inside his head. It has started up. It is revving, revving. It is nothing pretty, this big machine. It was not made for taking pretty girls to proms. It is not a status symbol. It means business. It can knock things down. If he isn't careful, it will knock him down. He rushes inside and finishes the dark at white heat, writing until four o'clock in the morning and finally falling asleep over his ring binder. If someone had suggested to him that he was really writing about his brother, George, he would have been surprised. He's not thought about George in years, or so he honestly believes. The story comes back from the instructor with an F slashed into the title page. Two words are scrawled beneath in capital letters. Pulp, screams one. Crap, screams the other. 
Bill takes the 15-page sheaf of manuscript over to the wood stove and opens the door. He is within a bare inch of tossing it in when the absurdity of what he is doing strikes him. He sits down in his rocking chair, looks at a grateful dead poster and starts to laugh. Pulp, fine, let it be pulp. The woods are full of it. Let them fucking trees fall, Bill exclaims and laughs until tears spurt from his eyes and roll down his face. He retypes the title page, the one with the instructor's judgment on it, and sends it off to a men's magazine named White Tie, although from what Bill can see, it really should be titled Naked Girls Who Look Like Drug Users. Yet his battered writer's market says they buy horror stories. And the two issues he has bought down at the local mum pock store have indeed contained four horror stories sandwiched between the naked girls and the ads for dirty movies and potency pills. One of them, by a man named Dennis Etchison, is actually quite good. He sends the dark off with no real hopes. He's submitted a good many stories to magazines before with nothing to show for it but rejection slits, and is flabbergasted and delighted when the fiction editor of White Tie buys it for $200 payment on publication. The assistant editor adds a short note, which calls it the best damned horror story since Ray Bradbury's The Jar. He adds, too bad only about 70 people coast to coast will read it, but Bill Dembro does not care. $200. He goes to his advisor with a drop card for EH-141. His advisor initials it. Bill Denbro staples the drop card to the assistant fiction editor's congratulatory note and tacks both to the bulletin board on the creative writing instructor's door. In the corner of the bulletin board, he sees an anti-war cartoon. And suddenly, as if moving of its own accord, his fingers pluck his pen from his breast pocket and across the cartoon he writes this. If fiction and politics ever really do become interchangeable, I'm going to kill myself because I won't know what else to do. You see, politics always change. Stories never do. He pauses, and then, feeling a bit small but unable to help himself, he adds, I suggest you have a lot to learn. His drop card comes back to him in the campus mail three days later. The instructor has initialed it. On the space marked grade at the time of drop, the instructor has not given him an incomplete or the low C to which his run of grades at that time would have entitled him. Instead, another F is slashed angrily across the grade line. Below it, the instructor has written, Do you think money proves anything about anything, Denbro? Well, actually, yes, Bill Denbro says to his empty apartment and once more begins to laugh crazily. In his senior year of college, he dares to write a novel because he has no idea what he's getting into. He escapes the experience, scratched and frightened, but alive, and with a manuscript nearly 500 pages long. He sends it out to the Viking press, knowing that it will be the first of many stops for his book, which is about ghosts. But he likes Viking's shit logo, and that makes it as good a place to start as any. As it turns out, the first stop is also the last stop, Viking, purchases the book. And for Bill Dembro, the fairy tale begins. The man who was once known as Stuttering Bill has become a success at the age of 23. Three years later and 3,000 miles from northern New England, he attains a queer kind of celebrity by marrying a woman who is a movie star and five years his senior at Hollywood's Church in the Pines. The gossip columnists give it seven months. The only bet, they say, is whether the end will come in a divorce or an annulment. Friends and enemies on both sides of the match feel about the same. The age difference apart, the disparities are startling. He is tall, already balding, already inclining a bit toward fat. He speaks slowly in company and at times seems nearly inarticulate. Audra, on the other hand, is auburn-haired, statuesque and gorgeous. She is less like an earthly woman than a creature from some semi-divine super-race. He's been hired to do the screenplay of his second novel, The Black Rapids, mostly because the right to do at least the first draft of the screenplay was an immutable condition of sale, in spite of his agent's moans that he was insane, and his draft has actually turned out pretty well. He's been invited out to Universal City for further rewrites and production meetings. 
His agent is a small woman named Susan Brown. She is exactly five feet tall. She is violently energetic and even more violently emphatic. Don't do it, Billy, she tells him. Kiss it off. They've got a lot of money tied up in it, and they'll get someone good to do the screenplay, maybe even Goldman. Who? William Goldman, the only good writer who ever went out there and did both. What are you talking about, Suze? He stayed there and he stayed good, she said. The odds on both are like the odds on beating lung cancer. It can be done, but who wants to try? You'll burn out on sex and booze, uh, some of the nifty new drugs. Susan's crazily fascinating brown eyes sparkled vehemently up at him. And if it turns out to be some meatball who gets the assignment instead of someone like Goldman, so what? The book's on the shelf there. They can't change a word. Susan, listen to me. Billy, take the money and run. You're young and strong. That's what they like. You go out there and they will first separate you from your self-respect and then from your ability to write a straight line from point A to point B. Last but not least, they will take your testes. You write like a grown-up, but you're just a kid with a very high forehead. I have to go. Did someone just fart in here? She returns. Must have because something just stinks. But I do. I have to. Ah, Jesus. I have to get away from New England. He's afraid to say what comes next. It's like mouthing a curse, but he owes it to her. I have to get away from Maine. Why? For God's sake. I don't know. I just do. Are you telling me something real, Billy, or just talking like a writer? It's real. They're in bed together during this conversation. Her breasts are small like peaches, sweet like peaches. He loves her a lot, although not the way they both know would be a really good way to love. She sits up with a pool of sheet in her lap and lights a cigarette. She's crying, but he doubts if she knows he knows. It's just this shine in her eyes. It would be tactful not to mention it, so he doesn't. He doesn't love her in that really good way, but he cares a mountain for her. Go on, then, she says in a dry, business-like voice as she turns back to him. Give me a call when you're ready. And if you still have the strength... I'll come and pick up the pieces, if there are any left. The film version of The Black Rapids is called Pit of the Black Demon, and Audra Phillips is cast as the lead. The title is horrible, but the movie turns out to be quite good, and the only part of him he loses in Hollywood is his heart. Bill, Audra said again, bringing him out of these memories, he saw she had snapped off the TV. He glanced out the window and saw fog nuzzling against the panes. I'll explain as much as I can, he said. You deserve that, but first, do two things for me. All right. Fix yourself another cup of tea and tell me what you know about me, or what you think you know. She looked at him, puzzled, and then went to the high boy. I know you from Maine, she said, making herself tea from the breakfast pot. She was not British, but just a touch of clipped British had crept into her voice, a holdover from the part she played in Attic Room, the movie they had come over here to do. It was Bill's first original screenplay. He'd been offered the directorial shot as well. They God he had declined that. His leaving now would have completed the job of bitching things up. He knew what they would all say, the whole crew. Billy Denbrill finally shows his true colors, just another fucking writer, crazier than a shithouse rat. God knew he felt crazy right about now. I know you had a brother, and that you loved him very much, and that he died, Audra went on. I know that you grew up in a town called Derry, moved to Bangor about two years after your brother died, and moved to Portland when you were fourteen. I know your dad died of lung cancer when you were seventeen, and you read a bestseller while you were still in college, paying your way with a scholarship and a part-time job in a textile mill. It must have seemed very strange to you. The change in income, in prospect. She returned to his side of the room, and he saw it in her face then. The realization of the hidden spaces between them. I know that you wrote The Black Rapids a year later and came out to Hollywood, and... The week before shooting started on the movie, you met a very mixed-up woman named Audra Phillips who knew a little bit about what you must have been through, the crazy decompression, because she had been plain old Audrey Philpott five years before, and this woman was drowning. Audra, 
don't. Her eyes were steady, holding his. Oh, why not? Let us tell the truth and shame the devil. I was drowning. I discovered paupers two years before I met you, and then a year later I discovered coke, and that was even better. A pauper in the morning, coke in the afternoon, wine at night, a valium at bedtime. <laughs> Orders vitamins. Too many important interviews, too many good parts. I was so much like a character in a Jacqueline Suzanne novel, it was hilarious. Do you know how I think about that time now, Bill? No. She sipped her tea, her eyes never leaving his, and grinned. It was like running on the walkway at L.A. International. You get it? Not exactly, no. It's a moving belt, she said, about a quarter of a mile long. I know the walkway, he said, but I don't see what you're... You just stand there, and it carries you all the way to the baggage claim area. But if you want, you don't have to just stand there. You could walk on it or run, and it seems like you're just doing your normal walk or your normal jog or your normal run or your normal all-out sprint, whatever, because your body forgets that what you're really doing is topping the speed the walkway's already making. That's why they have the signs that say slow down moving rampway near the end. When I met you, I felt as if I'd run right off the end of that thing onto a floor that didn't move anymore. There I was, my body nine miles ahead of my feet. You can't keep your balance. Sooner or later, you fall right on your face, except I didn't. Because you caught me. She put her tea aside and lit a cigarette, her eyes never leaving him. He could only see that her hands were shaking in the minute jitter of the lighter flame, which darted first to the right of the cigarette end and then to the left before finding it. She drew deep, blew out a fast jet of smoke. What do I know about you? I know you seem to have it all under control, I know that. You never seem to be in a hurry to get to the next drink, or the next meeting, or the next party, you seemed confident that all those things would be there if you wanted them. You talked slow. Part of it was the main drawl, I guess, but most of it was just you. You were the first man I ever met out there who dared to talk slow. I had to slow down to listen. I looked at you, Bill, and I saw someone who never ran on the walkway because he knew it would get him there. You seemed utterly untouched by the hype and hysteria. You didn't lease a roll so you could drive down Rodeo Drive on Saturday afternoon with your own vanity plates on some glitzy rental company's car. You didn't have a press agent to plant items in Variety or The Hollywood Reporter. You'd never done the Carson show. Writers can't unless they also do card tricks or band spoons, he said, smiling. It's like a national law. He thought she would smile, but she didn't. I know you were there when I needed you. When I came flying off the end of the walkway like old Jay Simpson in that old Hertz ad. Maybe you saved me from eating the wrong pill on top of too much booze. Or maybe I would have made it out the other side of my own and it's all a big dramatization on my part. But it doesn't feel like that. Not inside where I am. She snuffed the cigarette, only two puffs gone. I know you've been there ever since. And I've been there for you. We're good in bed. That used to seem like a big deal to me. But we're also good out of it, and now that seems like a bigger deal. I feel as if I could grow old with you and still be brave. I know you drink too much beer and you don't get enough exercise. I know that some nights you dream badly. He was startled. Nastily startled. Almost frightened. Ah, uh, I never dream. She smiled. So you tell the interviewers when they ask where you get your ideas, but it's not true unless it's just indigestion when you start groaning in the night, and I don't believe that, Billy. Do I you talk? he asked cautiously. He could remember no dreams, no dreams at all, good or bad. Audra nodded. Sometimes, but I can never make out what it is you say, and on a couple of occasions, you have wept. He looked at her blankly. There's a bad taste in his mouth that trailed back along his tongue and down his throat like the taste of melted aspirin. So now you know how fear tastes, he thought. Time you found out, considering all you've written on the subject. He supposed it was a taste he would get used to. If he lived long enough. 
Memories were suddenly trying to crowd in. It was as if a black sack in his mind were bulging, threatening to spew noxious dreams, images up from his subconscious and into the mental field of vision commanded by his rational waking mind. And if that happened all at once, it would drive him mad. He tried to push them back and succeeded, but not before he heard a voice. It was as if someone buried alive had cried out from the ground. It was Eddie Kasprak's voice. You saved my life, Bill. Those big boys, they drive me bug shit. Sometimes I think they really want to kill me. Your arms, Wadra said. Bill looked down at them. The flesh there had humped into goose flesh. Not little bumps, but huge white knobs like insect eggs. They both stared, saying nothing as if looking at an interesting museum exhibit. The goosebumps slowly melted away. In the silence that followed, Audra said, And I know one other thing. Someone called you this morning from the States and said you have to leave me. He got up, looked briefly at the liquor bottles, then went into the kitchen and came back with a glass of orange juice. He said, You know I had a brother and you know he died. But you don't know he was murdered? Audra took in a quick snatch of breath. Murdered? Oh, Bill, why didn't you ever tell you? He laughed, that barking sound again. I don't know. What happened? It... We were uh, living in Derry then. There had been a flood, but it was mostly over, and George was bored. I was sick in bed with the flu. He wanted me to make him a boat out of a sheet of newspaper. I knew how from day camp the year before, he said, he was going to sail it down the gutters on Witcham Street and Jackson Street because they were still full of water, so I made him the boat and he thanked me and he went out and that was the last time I ever saw my brother George alive. If I hadn't had the flu, maybe I could have saved him. He paused right palm rubbing at his left cheek, as if testing for beard stubble, his eyes, magnified by the lenses of his glasses, looked thoughtful. But he was not looking at her. It happened right there on Witcham Street, not too far from the intersection with Jackson. Whoever killed him pulled his left arm off, the way a second grader would pull a wing off a fly. Medical examiners said he either died of shock or blood loss, far as I could ever see, it didn't make a dime's worth the difference which it was. Christ, Bill. I imagine you wonder why I never told you the truth is. I wonder myself. Here we've been married eleven years, and until today you never knew what happened to Georgie. I know about your whole family, even your aunts and uncles. I know your grandfather died in his garage and I was city friggin' round with his chainsaw while he was dry. I know those things because married people... No matter how busy they are, I get to know almost everything after a while. And if they get really bored and stop listening, they pick it up anyway by osmosis. Or do you think I'm wrong? No, she said faintly, you're not wrong, Bill. And we've always been able to talk to each other, haven't we? I mean, neither of us got so bored it ever had to be osmosis, right? Well, she said, until today I always thought so. Come on, Audra. You know everything that's happened to me over the last eleven years of my life, every deal, every idea, every cold, every friend, every guy that ever did me wrong or tried to. You know I slept with Susan Brown, you know that sometimes I get maudlin when I drink and play the records too loud, especially the Grateful Dead, she said, and he laughed. This time she smiled back. You know the most important stuff, too. The things I hoped for. Yes, I think so, but this... She paused, shook her head, thought for a moment. How much does this call have to do with your brother, Bill? Let me get to it in my own way. Don't try to rush me into the center of it, or you'll have me committed. It's so big and so... so quaintly awful that I'm trying to sort of... creep up on it. You see, it never occurred to me to tell you about Georgie. She looked at him, frowned, shook her head faintly. I don't understand. What I'm trying to tell you, Audra, is that I haven't even thought of George in twenty years or more. But you told me you had a brother named, I repeated a fact, 
he said. That was all. His name was a word that cast no shadow at all in my mind. But I think maybe it cast a shadow over your dreams, Audra said. Her voice is very quiet. The groaning, the crying, she nodded. I suppose you could be right, he said. In fact, you're almost surely right, but dreams you don't remember don't really count, do they? Are you really telling me you never thought of him at all? Yes, I am. She shook her head, frankly disbelieving. Not even the horrible way he died. Not until today, Audra. She looked at him and shook her head again. You asked me before we were married if I had any brothers or sisters, and I said I had a brother who died when I was a kid. You knew my parents were gone, and you've got so much family that it took up your entire field of attention, but that's not all. What do you mean? It isn't just George that's been in that black hole. I haven't thought of Derry itself in twenty years. Not the people I chummed with, Eddie Casbrack and Richie the Mouth, Stan Uris, Bev Marsh. He ran his hands through his hair and laughed shakily, and slack, having a case of amnesia so bad, you don't know you've got it. And when Mike Hanlon called, who's Mike Hanlon? Another kid that we chummed with, that I chummed with after Georgie died. Of course he's no kid anymore, none of us are. There was Mike on the phone, transatlantic cable. He said, hello, have I reached the Denver residence? And I said, yes. And he said, Bill, is that you? And I said, yes. And he said, this is Mike Hanlon. It meant nothing to me, Audra. He might as well have been selling encyclopedias or Burl Ives records. Then he said, from Derry. And when he said that, it was like a door opened inside me and some horrible light shined out and I remembered who he was. I remembered Georgie. I remembered all the others. All this happened. Bill snapped his fingers like that. And I knew he was going to ask me to come. Come back to Derry. Yeah. He took his glasses off, rubbed his eyes, looked at her. Never in her life had she seen a man who looked so frightened. Back to Derry. Because we promised, he said. And we did. We did, all of us, us kids. We stood in the creek that ran through the barrens. And we held hands in a circle. And we had cut our palms with a piece of glass. So it was like a bunch of kids playing blood brothers, only it was real. He held his palms out to her. And in the center of each, she could see a close-set ladder of white lines that could have been scar tissue. She had held his hand, both his hands, countless times, but she had never noticed these scars across his palms before. They were faint, yes, but she would have believed. And the party, that party, not the one where they had met, although the second one formed a perfect bookend to that first one because it had been the rap party at the end of the pit of the Black Demon shoot. It had been loud and drunk every inch the Topanga Canyon do. Perhaps a little less bitchy than some of the other L.A. parties she'd been to, because the shoot had gone better than they had any right to expect, and they all knew it. For Audra Phillips, it had gone even better because she'd fallen in love with William Dembro. What was the name of the self-proclaimed palmist? She couldn't remember now. Only that she had been one of the makeup man's two assistants. She remembered the girl whipping off her blouse at some point in the party, revealing a very filmy bra beneath and tying it over her head like a gypsy scarf. High on part and wine, she had read palms for the rest of the evening, or at least until she had passed out. Audra could not remember now if the girl's readings had been good or bad, witty or stupid. She'd been pretty high herself that night. What she did remember was that at one point the girl had grabbed Bill's palm and her own and had declared them perfectly matched. They were life twins, she said. She could remember watching, more than a little jealous, as the girl traced the lines on his palm with her exquisitely lacquered fingernail. Oh, how stupid that was, in the weird L.A. film subculture where men patted women's fannies as routinely as New York men pecked their cheeks. But there had been something intimate and lingering, about that tracery. There'd been no little white scars on Bill's palms then. She'd been watching the charade with a jealous lover's eye, 
and she was sure of the memory, sure of the fact. She said so to Bill now. He nodded. You're right. They weren't there then. And although I can absolutely swear to it, I don't think they were there last night, down at the plow and barrow. Ralph and I were hand-rustling for beers again, and I think I would have noticed. He grinned at her. The grin was dry, humorless, and scared. I think they came back when Mike Hanlon called. That's what I think. Bill, that isn't possible. But she reached for her cigarettes. Bill was looking at his hands. Stan did it, he said. Cut our palms with a sliver of Coke bottle. I can remember it so clearly now. He looked up at Audra, and behind his glasses his eyes were hurt and puzzled. I remember how that piece of glass flashed in the sun. It was one of the new clear ones. Before that, Coke bottles used to be green. You remember that? She shook her head, but he didn't see her. He was still studying his palms. I can remember Stan doing his own hands last, pretending he was going to slash his wrists instead of just cut his palms a little. I guess it was just some goof, but I almost made a move on him to stop him. Because for a second or two there, he looked serious. Bill, don't, she said in a low voice. This time she had to steady the lighter in her right hand by grasping its wrist in her left, like a policeman holding a gun on a shooting range. Scars can't come back. They either are or aren't. You saw them before her, huh? is that what you're telling me? They're very faint, Audra said more sharply than she had intended. We were all bleeding, he said. We were standing in the water not far from where Eddie Kasprak and Ben Hanscom and I built the dam that time. You don't mean the architect, do you? Is there one by that name? God, Bill, he built the new BBC communication setter. They're still arguing whether it's a dream or an abortion. Well, I don't know if it's the same guy or not. It doesn't seem likely, but I guess it could be. The Ben I knew was great at building stuff. We all stood there, and I was holding Bev Marsh's left hand in my right and Richie Tozier's right hand in my left. We stood out there in the water like something out of a southern baptism after a tent meeting, and I remember I could see the Derry standpipe on the horizon. It looked as white as you imagine the robes of the archangels must be. And we promised, we swore, that if it wasn't over, that if it ever started to happen again, we'd go back. And we'd do it again and stop it. Forever. Stop what? She cried, suddenly furious with them. Stop what? The fuck are you talking about? I wish you wouldn't a a a ask. Bill began, and then stopped. She saw an expression of bemused horror spread over his face like a stain. Give me a cigarette. She passed in the pack. He lit one. She'd never seen him smoke a cigarette. I used to stutter, too. You stuttered? Yes, back then. He said I was the only man in L.A. you ever knew who dared to speak slowly. The truth is, I didn't dare talk fast. It wasn't reflection. It wasn't deliberation. It wasn't wisdom. All reformed stutterers speak very slowly. It's one of the tricks you learn, like thinking of your middle name just before you introduce yourself. Because stutterers have more trouble with nouns than with any other words. And the one word in all the world that gives them the most trouble is their own first name. Stuttered, she smiled a small smile, as if he had told a joke, and she had missed the point. Until Georgie died, I stuttered moderately, Bill said, and already he had begun to hear words double in his mind as if they were infinitesimally separated in time. The words came out smoothly in his ordinary, slow and cadenced way, but in his mind he heard words like Georgie and moderately overlap, becoming G -G Georgie and m moderately. I mean, I had some really bad moments, usually when I was called on in class, and especially if I really knew the answer and wanted to give it, but mostly I got by. After George died, it got a lot worse. 
Then around the age of 14 or 15, things started to get better again. I went to Chevris High in Portland, and there was a speech therapist there, Mrs. Thomas, who was really great. She taught me some good tricks, like thinking of my middle name just before I say, Hi, I'm Bill Dembro, out loud. I was taking French one, and she taught me to switch to French if I get badly stuck on a word. So if you're standing there feeling like the world's grandest asshole saying this over and over like a broken record, you switched over to French and saliva would come flowing off your tongue. Worked every time. And as soon as you said it in French, you could come back to English and say this book with no problem at all. To get stuck on an S word like ship or skate or slum, you could lisp it, thip, skate, flum, no stutter. All of that helped, but mostly it was just forgetting Derry and everything that happened there, because that's when the forgetting happened. When we were living in Portland and I was going to Chevres, I didn't forget everything at once, but looking back now, I'd have to say it happened over a remarkably short period of time. Maybe no more than four months, my stutter and my memories faded out together. Someone washed the blackboard and all the old equations went away. He drank what was left of his juice. When I studied on Ask a few seconds ago, that was the first time in maybe 21 years. He looked at her. First the scars, then the star. Hudder. Do you hear it? You're doing that on purpose, she said, badly frightened. No, I guess there's no way to convince a person of that, but it's true. Stuttering's funny, Audra, spooky. On one level, you're not even where it's happening, but it's also something you can hear in your mind. It's like part of your head is working an instant ahead of the rest. Or one of those reverb systems kids used to put in their jalopies back in the 50s. When the sound in the rear speaker would come just a split second after the sound in the front speaker. He got up and walked restlessly around the room. He looked tired, and she thought with some unease of how hard he'd worked over the last thirteen years or so, as if it might be possible to justify the moderateness of his talent by working furiously almost non-stop. She found herself having a very uneasy thought and tried to push it away, but it wouldn't go. Suppose Bill's call had really been from Ralph Foster, inviting him down to the plow and barrow for an hour of arm wrestling or backgammon, or maybe from Freddie Firestone, the producer of Attic Room, on some problem or other. Perhaps even a wrong ring, as the very British doctor's wife down the lane put it. What did such thoughts lead to? Why? To the idea that all this Derry Mike Hanlon business was nothing but a hallucination. A hallucination brought on by an incipient nervous breakdown. But the scars, Audra, how do you explain the scars? He's right. They weren't there, and now they are. That's the truth, and you know it. Tell me the rest, she said. Who killed your brother, George? What did you and these other children do? What did you promise? He went to her, knelt before her like an old-fashioned suitor about to propose marriage, and took her hands. I think I could tell you, he said softly. I think that if I really wanted to, I could. Most of it I don't remember even now, but once I started talking, it would come. I can sense those memories waiting to be born. They're like clouds filled with rain, only this rain would be very dirty. The plants that grew after rain like that would be monsters. Maybe I can face that with the others. Do they know? Mike said he called them all. He thinks they'll all come except maybe for Stan, he said. Stan sounded strange. It all sounds strange to me. You're frightening me very badly, Bill. I'm sorry, he said, and kissed her. It was like getting a kiss from an utter stranger. She found herself hating this man, Mike Hanlon. I thought I ought to explain as much as I could. I thought that would be better than just creeping off into the night. I suppose some of them may do just that, but... I have to go. And I think Stan will be there, no matter how strange he sounded, or maybe that's just because I can't imagine not going myself. Because of your brother? Bill shook his head slowly. I could tell you that, but it would be a lie. I loved him, 
I know how strange that must sound after telling you I haven't thought of him in twenty years or so, but I loved the hell out of that kid. He smiled a little. He was a spasmoid, but I loved him, you know? Audra, who had a younger sister, nodded. I know. But it isn't George. I can't explain what it is. I... He looked out the window at the morning fog. I feel like a bird must feel when fall comes and it knows. Somehow it just knows it has to fly home. It's instinct paid. And I guess I believe instinct's the iron skeleton under all our ideas of free will. Unless you're willing to take the pipe or eat the gun or take a long walk off a short dock, you can't say no to some things. You can't refuse to pick up your option because there is no option. You can't stop it from happening any more than you could stand at home plate with a bat in your hand and let a fastball hit you. I have to go. That promise. It's in my mind like a f f fish hook. She stood up and walked herself carefully to him. She felt very fragile, as if she might break. She put a hand on his shoulder and turned him to her. Take me with you then. The expression of horror that dawned on his face then, not horror of her, but for her, was so naked that she stepped back, really afraid for the first time. No, he said. Don't think of that, Audra. Don't you ever think of that. You're not going within three thousand miles of Derry. I think Derry's going to be a very bad place to be during the next couple of weeks. You're going to stay here and carry on and make all the excuses for me you have to. Now promise me that. Should I promise? She asked, her eyes never leaving his. Should I, Bill? Ah, Audra, should I? You made a promise, and look what it's got you into. And me as well, since I'm your wife and I love you. His big hands tightened painfully on her shoulders. Promise me. Promise. Proop, poop, proop, proop. Proop. And she could not stand that, that broken word caught in his mouth like a gaffed and wriggling fish. I promise, okay? I promise. She burst into tears. Are you happy now? Jesus. You're crazy. The whole thing is crazy. But I promise. He put an arm around her and led her to the couch. Brought her a brandy. She sipped at it, getting herself under control a little at a time. When do you go then? Today, he said. Concord. I could just make it if I drive to Heathrow instead of taking the train. Freddy wanted me on set after lunch. You go on ahead at nine. And you don't know anything, you see? She nodded reluctantly. I'll be in New York before anything shows up funny. And in Derry before sundown with the right c connections and when do I see you again? she asked softly. He put an arm around her and held her tightly, but he never answered her question.